Welcome to the culmination, the end of year event of the Great Books Challenge for Parents through Old Western Culture. It ends with an epic read aloud. So the challenge this year focused on the epics, which includes both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Last year we read the, uh, the Iliad, and this year 24 books, all 24 books of Homer's Odyssey will be read by multiple educators, members of the Roman Roads Press staff, and friends. Thank you to those who read and enjoy uh, this live reading. Now, I'd like to say a few words about the nature of this live reading. This is not an audible reading. This is not an audiobook professional reading. It's meant to be in the tradition of what you might have had throughout the centuries, actual live reading with the various stumbles, with the various, um, there might even be a cough or two. We did cut out during the recordings um, any major coughing uh, spats or something like that, but you will, see, this is not a perfect uh, rendition. This is a very human rendition, the kind of rendition you'd have if you read these books regularly, as it has happened for centuries, in your own families. And I encourage you to do that. Um, one evening, read one book of the Iliad. It takes about 45 minutes. Uh, or the Odyssey, or Paradise Lost, or Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, uh, bring these, these books into your home. And that's really why we're doing this. We want to give a taste of what it's like to uh, have this literature be read as it was intended, it was intended uh, for an oral culture to be told by, uh, to be read aloud for listeners. And so uh, while this is a very long recording, obviously we're going to be uh, um, streaming this in two parts, books 1 through 12 and then 13 through 24 tomorrow. Um, and this is, um, I don't expect most people to be able to listen through the entire thing. However, if you can, um, drop in for a bit, listen to a bit, get a feel for what it's like to listen to epic poetry, not a professional recording, but an amateur. Amateur meaning for the love of it. This was done as a labor of love. Uh, a few stats about the challenge itself. Um, going from memory here, but I believe it's 1145 people entered the challenge. And as of last night, when we closed the challenge, 118 of you submitted the form saying that you had finished the challenge. Congratulations to, to you, 118 who completed it. And if you are one of those who didn't quite complete it, don't be discouraged um, for a couple reasons. One, uh, like many resolutions, this is, uh, it, this is often not something you do the first time around. It, this it was an epic challenge, uh, reading two epic, uh, great epics. Um, and secondly, there is another chance. Next year's challenge, you may choose to either redo the epics challenge or our focus next year will be on Dante's Divine Comedy with some special guests and features for that. So stay tuned. So without further ado, enjoy uh, books 1 through 12 and then tomorrow, books 13 through 24 of Homer's Odyssey. I'm Wes Callahan. I'm the main lecturer on the Old Western Culture video series of The Great Books. I'll be reading book one of the Odyssey today. This is a new rendering that I've done based on the 1879 Butcher and Lang translation, which was famous in its own day for its accuracy. Uh, but uh, the style was a very sort of King James version, kind of Lamort D'Arthur, Sir Thomas Mallory style. It uh, doesn't work so well for modern audiences, so of course uh, many newer translations in the 20th and now the 21st century uh, are more accessible for many people. But I like these old translations. So I did a rendering uh, of the Iliad based on the 1883 Lang, Leaf, and Meyer translation, and that's published by Roman Roads Press, and you should uh, talk to them about getting a copy if you haven't already done it. And so now uh, this is uh, my rendering of the Odyssey based on the 1879 Butcher and Lang translation. Uh, Lang is the common element in both those collaborations. Uh, he was quite the stylist and a poet in his own right. And this is one reason I like these old translations. Uh, many of the more, more recent translators uh, uh, in the 20th and 21st century are quite good, but I like these 19th century British translators because they were poets in their own right as well as being scholars. And Andrew Lang especially uh, was a, a, a great poet, and, and many of his, uh, of his books on poetry and on myths and fairy tales 
uh, are wonderful, delightful. And his ability with style, with English style, as well as his scholarship and his ability to deal with the ancient Greek shows up in these old translations. And that's why I've been updating these old ones. <clears throat> so uh, now I'll be reading book one of the Odyssey, and this is my new rendering based on the old uh, translation. Tell me, muse, of the man of many turnings who wandered far and wide after he had sacked the sacred citadel of Troy. Many were the men whose cities he saw and whose minds he learned, and the many the woes he suffered in his heart upon the deep sea, striving for his own life and the return of his companions. Even so, he could not save his companions, though he desired it greatly, for they perished through the blindness of their own hearts, the fools who devoured the oxen of Helios, son of Hyperion, and the god took away from them their day of returning. Of all these things, goddess, daughter of Zeus, from wherever you have heard them, tell them now to us. Now all the rest, as many as had fled from sheer destruction, were at home and had escaped both war and the sea. But Odysseus only, longing for his wife and his homeward way, was held by the lady nymph Calypso, the lovely goddess, in her hollow caves, longing to have him for her lord. But now, when the year had come in the round of the seasons in which the gods had ordained that he should return home to Ithaca, not even then was he free of his troubles or back with his loved ones." But all the gods had pity on him, except Poseidon, who raged continually against godlike Odysseus, until he came to his own country. But Poseidon had now departed for the distant Ethiopians, who were divided in two, the remotest of men, some living where Hyperion sinks, and some where he rises. There he waited to receive the great sacrifice of bulls and rams. There he rejoiced, sitting at the feast. But the other gods were gathered in the halls of Olympian Zeus. Then among them the father of gods and men began to speak, for he thought in his heart of noble Aegisthus, whom the son of Agamemnon, far-famed Orestes, slew. Thinking about him, he spoke out among the immortals. Look now how vainly mortal men blame the gods, for they say evil comes from us, but it is they who bring upon themselves, through the blindness of their own hearts, sorrows beyond what is ordained. Even lately, Aegisthus, beyond what was ordained, took to himself the wife of the son of Atreus and killed her lord on his return, and he did it with sheer doom before his eyes, for we had warned him by sending Hermes the sharp-sighted, the slayer of Argos, that he should neither kill the man nor court his wife, for the son of Atreus would be revenged by the hand of Orestes as soon as he came of age and longed for his own country." So spoke Hermes, yet he did not persuade the heart of Aegisthus for all his good intention, and now he has paid the price for all. And the goddess, grey-eyed Athena, answered him, saying, Our father, son of Kronos, throned in the highest, that man certainly suffered a death that he earned. Let all who do such deeds perish the same way. But my heart is torn for wise Odysseus, that unfortunate one, who far from his friends suffers affliction for so long on a wave-washed island, the navel of the sea, a wooded island, and in it a goddess has her dwelling, the daughter of malevolent Atlas, who knows the depths of every sea and upholds the tall pillars which keep earth and sky apart. It is his daughter who holds the unfortunate man in sorrow, and always with soft and soothing tales she charms him to forgetfulness of Ithaca. But Odysseus, longing to see, but the smoke rising upward from his own land, has a desire to die. As for you, your heart does not care at all, Olympian. Did not Odysseus, by the ships of the Argives, freely offer sacrifices to you in the wide Trojan land? Why then are you so angry with him, O Zeus? And Zeus, the cloud-gatherer, answered her and said, My child, what word has escaped the door of your lips? How could I forget divine Odysseus, who in understanding is beyond mortals, and more than all men has sacrificed to the deathless gods who keep the wide heaven? No, it is Poseidon, the encircle of the earth, who has been angry continually with undying anger because of the cyclops whose eye he blinded, godlike Polyphemus, whose power is greatest over all the cyclopes. His mother was the nymph Soeth Thoasa, daughter of Phorkes, lord of the barren sea, and in its hollow caves she lay with Poseidon. From that day on, Poseidon, the earth shaker, does not indeed destroy Odysseus, but drives him wandering far from his own country. But now let us all take good counsel here about his return, so that he may be got home. So Poseidon will let go of his anger, for in no way will he be able to strive alone against all the deathless gods." 
Then the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, answered him and said, Our father, son of Kronos, throned in the highest, if indeed this plan is now pleasing to the blessed gods, that wise Odysseus should return to his own home, then let us quickly send Hermes the messenger, the slayer of Argos, to the island of Ogyja. There, with all speed, let him declare to the lady of the braided tresses our sure counsel, the return of patient Odysseus, so that he may come to his home. But as for me, I will go to Ithaca, that I may rouse his son all the more, planting strength in his heart, to call an assembly of the long-haired Achaeans, and speak out to all the suitors who continually slaughter the sheep of his thronging, uh, thronging flocks, and his cattle with trailing feet and shambling gait. And I will guide him to Sparta and to Sandy Pelos to seek news of his beloved father's return, if perhaps he may hear of it, and so that he might gain a good reputation among men. She spoke and bound beneath her feet the lovely immortal golden sandals, and that, carry, and that carried her over both the wet sea and the endless land, swift as the breath of the wind. And she seized her mighty spear, clad with sharp bronze, weighty and huge and strong, with which she subdues the ranks of heroes, those with whom she, the daughter of the mighty father, is angry. Then from the heights of Olympus she came flashing down, and she stood in the land of Ithaca at the entry of the gate of Odysseus, on the threshold of the courtyard, holding in her hand the spear of bronze in the appearance of a stranger, Mentes, the captain of the Taphians. And there she found the lordly suitors. They were taking their pleasure at drafts in front of the doors, sitting on hides of oxen, which they themselves had slaughtered. And some of the attendants and the servants were mixing wine and water for them in bowls, and some were washing the tables with porous sponges and setting them, and others were carving meat in great quantities. And godlike Telemachus was far the first to observe her, for he was sitting with a heavy heart among the suitors, imagining his noble father, if perhaps he might come from somewhere and scatter the suitors throughout the palace and gain honor and establish rule among his own possessions. Thinking about this, as he sat among the suitors, he saw Athena, and he went straight to the outer porch, for he thought in his heart that it was shameful that a stranger should stand long at the gates. And stopping near her, he clasped her right hand, and took from her the spear of bronze, and lifted his voice, and spoke winged words to her. Greetings, stranger, you will be kindly treated with us, and afterwards, once you have eaten, eaten you may tell us what you need. With that he led the way, and Pallas Athena followed. And when they were inside the spacious house, he set her spear which he carried against a tall pillar in the polished spear stand where many other spears stood also, those of Odysseus of the stout heart. And he led the goddess and seated her on a beautifully carved chair and spread a linen cloth under it, and beneath that was a footstool for the feet. For himself, he placed an, placed an inlaid, inlaid seat close by, away from the crowd of the suitors, lest the stranger should be disturbed by the noise and should be put off from the meal, having come among arrogant men, but also so that he might ask him about his father, who has gone from home. Then a handmaid carried water for washing hands in a noble golden pitcher and poured it out over a silver basin to wash with and pulled next to them a polished table. And a dignified maid brought wheat bread and set it nearby and laid on the board many delicacies, freely giving whatever she had close at hand. And a carver lifted and placed beside them platters of various kinds of meat, and near them he set golden bowls and an attendant walked back and forth pouring wine for them. Then the haughty suitors came in, and they sat down in rows on chairs and on high seats, and attendants poured water on their hands, and maidservants piled wheat bread by them in baskets, and servants filled up the bowls with drink, and they stretched out their hands to the good food spread before them. When the suitors had satisfied the desire for food and drink, they thought of other things, the song and dance, for these are the crown of the feast. And an attendant placed a beautiful lyre in the hands of Phemius, who was barred for the suitors against his will. As he touched the lyre, he lifted up his voice in sweet songs. But Telemachus spoke to gray-eyed Athena, holding his head close to her so that those others could not hear. Dear stranger, will you indeed be angry at what I will say? Those men truly care for such things as these, the lyre and song, thoughtlessly, as those who consume the livelihood of another without repayment, of that man whose white bones it may be lie rotting in the, ra in the rain on the mainland, or the waves tumble them in the salt sea. If only these men were to see him returned to Ithaca, they would all pray more for greater speed of foot than for gain of gold and fine clothing. But now he has perished, a terrible fate, and there is no comfort for us. No, not even though any earthly man should say that he will come again. Gone is the day of his returning. 
But tell me this, and tell me everything clearly. Who are you of the sons of men, and where are you from? Where is your city, and where are those who begot you? On what kind of ship did you come, and how did sailors bring you to Ithaca, and who did they claim to be? For in no way do I think that you came here by land. And tell me this truthfully, that I may know for certain whether you are a newcomer, or whether you are a familiar guest of the house, since many strangers used to come to our house because my father had traveled much among men. Then the goddess, Greyad Athena, answered him, I will plainly tell you everything. I call myself Mentes, son of wise Anchialos, and I rule the Taphians, lovers of the oar. And now I have come to shore, as you see, with ship and crew, sailing over the wine-dark sea, to men of strange speech, even to Temisa, in search of copper, and my cargo is shining iron. And my ship is lying there toward the upland, away from the city, in the harbor of Raithron, beneath wooded Naon. And we declare ourselves to be friends of one another, and from friendly houses from a long time past. If thou desire assurance, go ask the old man, the hero Laertes, who they say does not come to the city any more, but far away toward the upland suffers grief, with an ancient woman for his handmaid, who places food and drink near him whenever weariness takes hold of his limbs, as he hobbles along the knoll of his vineyard plot. And now I have come, for indeed I was told that he, your father, was among his people, but the gods obstruct his journey. For noble Odysseus has not yet perished on the earth, but I think still lives and is kept on the wide deep in a wave-washed island, and perhaps rough wild men keep him harshly against his will. But now indeed I will utter my word of prophecy as the immortals bring it into my heart, and I think it will be accomplished, though I am no prophet, nor am I skilled in the omens of birds. After this time he will not be far from his beloved country for long, not even if bonds of iron bind him. He will plan a way to return, for he is a man of many devices. But tell me this plainly, whether indeed, as tall as you are, you are sprung from Odysseus. Truly your head and bright eyes are wonderfully like his, for many times we have talked together before he set sail for Troy, where the others too, the bravest of the Argives, went in their hollow ships." From that day onward I have not seen Odysseus, nor has he seen me. Then wise Telemachus answered her and said, I will plainly tell you everything. My mother indeed says that I am his. As for me, I do not know, for no man ever knew his own descent himself. If only I had been the son of some blessed man whom old age overtook among his own possessions. But they say that I am the son of that man who is the most unfortunate of mortals, since you question me about that. Then the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, spoke to him and said, Surely the gods have not ordained a nameless lineage for you in days to come, since Penelope bore such a noble man as you. But tell me this plainly, what feast, or rather what dissipation is this? What do you have to do with it? Is it a clan drinking or a wedding feast? For this is not a banquet where each man brings his share. In this way, swollen with insolence, they seem to me to revel wantonly throughout the house, and any man might well be angry to see so many deeds of shame if any wise man came among them. Then wise Telemachus answered her and said, Sir, since you question me about these things and inquire about them, our house was once rich and honorable, while that man was still among his people. But now the gods have willed it otherwise, with evil intent, for they have made him pass utterly out of sight like no one ever before. Indeed, I would not grieve so much even for his death had he fallen among his companions in the land of the Trojans, or in the arms of his friends when he had wound up the war. Then the whole Achaean host would have built him a barrow, and he would have won great glory even for his son in after days. But now the spirits of the storm have swept him away into obscurity. He is gone, lost to sight, lost to knowledge, but for me he has left grief and lamentation. Nor is it for him alone that I mourn and weep, since the gods have caused other terrible sorrows for me. For all the noblest princes in the isles, in Dulichium and Same and wooded Zacynthus and all who lorded over rocky Ithaca, all these court my mother and waste my house. But as for her, she neither refuses the hated marriage nor has the heart to end the matter. So they devour and waste my house, and before long they will make havoc of me too. Then in great displeasure, Pallas Athena spoke to him. What a shame! Surely you are greatly in need of far-off Odysseus to stretch forth his hands upon the shameless suitors. If only he could come now and stand at the entrance of the gate with helmet and shield and two spears, as mighty a man as when I first saw him in our house drinking and rejoicing, at that time when he came up out of Ephora from Elus, son of Murmurus. 
for Odysseus had gone there on his swish, swift ship to seek a deadly drug, that he might have it to smear on his bronze-shod arrows. But Elus would in no way give it to him, for he was in awe of the gods who live forever. But my father gave it to him, for he loved him greatly. If only Odysseus might in that same strength deal with these suitors, they would all have a swift fate and a bitter wedding. However, these things surely lie on the knees of the gods, whether he shall return or not, and take vengeance in his halls. But I urge you to consider how you might drive out the suitors from the hall. Come now, listen, and heed my words. Tomorrow call the Achaean lords to the assembly, and announce your words to all, and take the gods as witness. Bid the suitors to disperse, each one to his own place, and as for your mother, if her heart is inclined to marriage, let her go back to the hall of that mighty man her father, and her people will furnish a wedding feast, and arrange for the many courtship gifts that should go with the dearly beloved daughter. And to you I will give a word of wise counsel, if you will listen. Outfit a ship, the best you have, with twenty oarsmen, and travel to inquire about your father who is so far off, if perhaps any one will tell you anything, or may, you may hear the voice of Zeus, which above all brings news to men. Go first to Pelos, and inquire of noble Nestor, and from there to Sparta, to Menelaus of the fair hair, for he came home last of all the well-armored Achaeans. If you hear news of the life and the return of your father, then indeed you can endure the troubles for another year. But if you hear that he is dead and gone, then return to your own dear country and pile his burial mound, and over it serve the burial rites as many as is fitting, and give your mother to a husband. But when you have done all this, then consider in your mind and heart how you might slay the suitors in your halls, whether secretly or openly, for you should not continue thinking as a child since you are no longer of the age for it. Have you not heard what glory noble Orestes got for himself among all men because he killed the slayer of his father, treacherous Aegisthus, who killed his famous father? And you too must be courageous, my friend, for I see that you are noble and tall, so that even men not yet born will praise you. But now I will go down to the swift ship and to my men, who I think are very impatient, waiting for me. Take heed and listen to my words. Then wise Telemachus answered her, saying, Sir, indeed you speak these things from a friendly heart as a father to his son, and I will never forget them. But now I beg you to stay here, even though you are eager to be gone, so that after you have bathed and enjoyed yourself, you may go your way to your ship, joyful in spirit, with a costly and very noble gift, to be a remembrance of my giving, such as dear friends give to friends. Then the goddess, gray-eyed Athena, answered him, Do not keep me any longer, for I am eager to be on my way. But give to me whatever gift your heart urges you when I come back again for me to carry home. Bring out from your stores a most noble gift, and you will receive its worth in return. So gray-eyed Athena spoke and departed, and like an eagle of the sea she flew away. But in his spirit she planted strength and courage and brought to his mind his father even more than before. And he saw and was amazed, for he realized that it was a god, and soon he went back among the suitors, a godlike man. Now the famous bard was singing to the suitors, and they sat listening in silence, and his song was of the pitiful return of the Achaeans that Pallas Athena laid on them as they came back from Troy. And from her upper chamber the daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, heard the glorious music, and she went down the high stairs from her chamber, not alone, for two of her handmaids kept her company. Now when the fair lady had come to the suitors, she stood by the pillar of the well-built roof, holding up her shining veil before her face, and a faithful maiden stood on either side of her. Then she began weeping and spoke to the divine bard. Phemius, since you know many other songs for mortals, deeds of men and gods, which bards rehearse, sing of these as you sit by them, and let them drink their wine in silence. But stop this pitiful tune that continually wastes my heart within my breast, since to me beyond all women has come a sorrow without comfort. So dear a head do I long for in constant memory, that man whose fame is praised everywhere from Hellas to the middle of Argos. Then wise Telemachus answered her and said, Mother, why do you refuse to let the glorious bard gladden us as his spirit moves him? It is not bards who are at fault, but rather Zeus, I think, who is at fault, for he gives to all men who live by bread what he will. As for the bard, do not blame him if he sings about the unfortunate travels of the Danaeans, for men always prize that song the most which rings newest in their ears. But let your heart and mind bear up to listen. For Odysseus is not the only one who lost the day of his homecoming in Troy, but many others also perished. 
Nevertheless, go to your chamber and attend to your tasks, the loom and spindle, and urge your handmaids to work at their tasks. Speech will be for men, for all, but for me most of all, for I am the Lord of the house. Then in amazement she went back to her chamber, and she laid up the wise saying of her son in her heart. She ascended to her upper chamber with the women who were her handmaids, and then wailed for Odysseus, her dear lord, till gray-eyed Athena cast sweet sleep upon her eyelids. Now the suitors clamored throughout the shadowy halls, and each one uttered a prayer to be her bedfellow. But wise Telemachus spoke out, uh, spoke out among them. Suitors of my mother, men outrageous beyond measure, let us feast now and make merry and let there be no brawling. It is a good thing to listen to a bard such as this one, like the gods in his voice. But in the morning let us all go to the assembly and sit down so that I may announce my words clearly, that you leave these halls and busy yourselves with other feasts, consuming your own wealth, going in turn from house to house. But if you think this a likelier and a better thing, that one man's goods should perish without repayment, then waste it as you please, and I will call upon the everlasting gods, if perhaps Zeus may grant that revenge be made. Then you would perish within these halls without making atonement. So he spoke, and all who heard him bit their lips and marveled at Telemachus, because he spoke boldly. Then Antinous, son of Apathes, answered him, Telemachus, indeed, the gods themselves had taught you to be so proud and bold in your speech. May the son of Kronos never make you king and see encircled Ithaca, though it is your inheritance by right. Then wise Telemachus answered him and said, Antinous, will you indeed be angry at the word that I will speak? Yes, at the hand of Zeus I would be eager to take this thing upon me. Do you say that this is the worst thing that can happen to a man? No, it is not a bad thing to be a king. The house of such a man quickly grows rich, and he himself is held in greater honor. However, there are many other kings of the Achaeans and sea-circled Ithaca, both young and old. One of them will surely obtain this kingship, since noble Odysseus is dead. But as for me, I will be lord of our own house and servants, which noble Odysseus won from me with his spear. Then Eurymachus, son of Polybus, answered him, saying, Telemachus, surely it lies on the knees of the gods what man is to be king over the Achaeans and sea-circled Ithaca. But may you keep your own possessions and be lord in your own house. May no one ever come to force violently from you your wealth against your will while Ithaca still stands. But I would ask you, friend, about the stranger. Where is he from, and of what land does he claim to be? Where are his people in his native fields? Does he bring some news of your father on his journey, or does he come to conduct some business of his own? So suddenly he started to leave, and then he was gone, and he did not linger so we could know him, and yet he seemed to be no ordinary man to look upon. Then wise Telemachus answered him and said, Eurymachus, surely the day of my father's returning has passed. Therefore I do not put faith in news any more, no matter where they come from, nor do I care for prophecies about which my mother has inquired from the mouth of a soothsayer when she has invited him to the hall. But as for that man, he is a friend of my house from Taphos, and he says he is Mentes, son of wise Anchialos, and he is lord over the Taphians, lovers of the oar. So spoke Telemachus, but in his heart he had recognized the immortal goddess. Now the suitors returned to the dance and the delightful song, and made merry, and waited till evening should come. And as they made merry, evening came upon them. Then each one went to his own house to lie down to rest. But Telemachus where his chamber was built high up in the noble court, in a place with a high view, went to his own bed, pondering many thoughts in his mind, and with him went trusty Eurycleia, and carried burning torches for him. She was the daughter of Opes, son of Pasenor, and Laertes bought her once upon a time with his wealth, while she was still in her youth, and paid twenty oxen for her. And he honored her as much as he honored his beloved wife in the halls, but he never lay with her, for he avoided the anger of his lady." She went with Telemachus and carried the burning torches for him, and of all the women of the household she loved him most, and she had nursed him when he was little. Then he opened the, the doors of the well-built chamber and sat on the bed and took off his soft, soft jacket and put it in the wise old woman's hands. So she folded the jacket and smoothed it and hung it on a pin by the jointed bedstead and went away from the room and pulled the door closed with the silver handle and pulled the bar shut with the leather, leather strap. There, all night long, wrapped in a wool fleece, he meditated in his heart about the journey that Athena had revealed to him. 
Hi, I'm Cooper Salmon of, of Roman Roads Press. I do video and marketing. You might remember me from the Degresio podcast and previous read alouds. I'm going to be reading book two, and I'm reading from the Robert Fitzgerald translation. Book two, A Hero's Son Awakes. When primal dawn spread on the eastern sky, her fingers of pink light, Odysseus' true son stood up, drew on his tunic and his mantle, slung on a, so slung on a sword belt and a new-edged sword, tied his smooth feet into good rawhide sandals, and left his room, a god's brilliance upon him. He found the criers with clarion voices and told them to muster the unshorn Achaeans in full assembly. The call sang out, and the men came streaming in, and when they filled the assembly ground he entered, spear in hand, with two quick hounds at heel. Athena lavished on him a sunlit grace that held the eye of the multitude. Old men made way for him as he took his father's chair. Now Lord Aegyptios bent down, and sage with years opened the assembly. This man's son had served under the great Odysseus, gone in the decked ships with him to the wild horse country of Troy, a spearman, Antiphos by name. The ravenous Cyclops in the cave destroyed him, last in his feast of men. Three other sons the old man had, and one, uh, Uryonomos, went with the suitors. Two farmed for their father, but even so the old man behind, remembering the absent one, and a tear welled up as he spoke. Hear me, Ithacans, hear what I have to say. No meeting has been held here since our king Odysseus left port in the decked ships. Who finds occasion for assembly now? One of the young men, one of the older lot. Had he, has he had words with our, fight, our fighters are returning, news to report if he got wind of it? Or is it something else, touching the realm? The man has vigor, I should say, more power to him. Whatever he desires, may Zeus fulfill it. The old man's words delighted the son of Odysseus, who kept his chair no longer, but stood up, eager to speak, in the midst of all the men. The crier, Prisenor, master of debate, brought him the staff and placed it in his hand. Then the boy touched the old man's shoulder and said, No need to wonder any more, sir, who called this session. The distress is mine. As to our troops returning, I have no news, news to report if I got wind of it. Nor have I public business to propose only my need and the trouble of my house, the troubles. My distinguished father is lost who ruled among you once, mild as a father, and there is now this greater evil still. My home and all I have are being ruined. Mother wanted no suitors, but like a pack they came, sons of the best men here among them, lads with no stomach for an introduction to Icarios, her father across the sea. He would require a wedding gift and give her to someone who found favor in her eyes. No, these men spend their days around our house, killing our beeves and sheep and fatted goats, caressing, soaking up our good wine, our good dark wine, not caring what they do. They squander everything. We have no strong Odysseus to defend us, and as to putting up a fight ourselves, we'd only show our incompetence in arms. Expel them, yes, if I only had the power, but the whole thing's out of hand, insufferable. My house is being plundered. Is this courtesy? Where is your indignation? Where is your shame? Think of the talk in the islands all around us, and the fear the wrath of the gods, or they may turn and fear the wrath of the gods, or they may turn and send you some devilry. Friends, by Olympian Zeus and holy justice that holds men in assembly and sets them free, make an end of this. Let me lament in peace my private loss. Or did my father Odysseus ever do injury to the armed Achaeans? Is this your way of taking it out on me, giving free rein to these young men? I might as well, might better, see my treasure and livestock taken over by you all than if you fed on them. If you fed on them, I'd have some remedy, and when we met in public in the town, I'd press my claim. You might make restitution. This way you hurt me. This way you hurt me when my hands are tied. And in a hot anger now, he threw the staff to the ground, his eyes grown bright with tears. A wave of sympathy ran through the crowd, all hushed, and no one there had the audacity to answer harshly, except Anatos, who said, What high and mighty talk, Telemachus! No holding you! You want to shame us and humiliate us, but you should know the suitors are not to blame. It is your own dear, incomparably cunning mother. For three years now, and it will soon be four, she is breaking the hearts of all the Achaeans, holding out hope to all and sending promises to each man privately, but thinking otherwise. Here is an instance of her trickery. 
She had her great loom standing in the hall, and the fine warp of some vast fabric on it. We were attending her, and she said to us, Young men, my suitors, now my lord is dead. Let me finish my weaving before I marry, or else my thread will have been spun in vain. It is a shroud I weave for Lord Laertes, when cold death comes to lay him on his briar. The country wives would hold me in dishonor if he, with all his fortune, lay unshrouded. We have men's hearts. We have men's hearts. She touched them. We agreed. So every day she wove on the great loom, but every night by torchlight she unwove it. And so for three years she deceived the Achaeans. But when the seasons brought the fourth around, one of her maids, who knew the secret, told us. We found her unraveling the splendid shroud. She had to finish it then, although she hated it. Now here is the suitor's answer. You and all the Achaeans mark it well. Dismiss your mother from the house, or make her marry the man her father names, and she prefers. Does she intend to keep us dangling forever? She may rely too long on Athena's gifts, talent and handicraft and a clever mind, so cunning. History cannot show the like among the ringleted ladies of Achaea, Mykene with her coronet, Alcmene, Toro. Wits like Penelope's never were before, but this time, well, she made poor use of them. For here are suitors eating up your own, yeah, eating up your property as long as she holds out, a plan some god put in her mind. She makes a name for herself, but you can feel the loss it means for you. Our own affairs can wait. We'll never go anywhere else until she takes an Achaean to her liking. But clear-headed Telemachus replied, Antinous, can I banish against her will the mother who bore me and took care of me? My father is either dead or far away, but dearly I should pay for this at Icarus, at Icarus's hand if I ever send her back. The powers of darkness would requite it, too. My mother's parting curse, curse would call hell's furies to punish me, alone with the scorn of men. No, I can never give, this, I can never give the word for this. But if your hearts are capable of shame... Leave my great hall, take your dinner elsewhere, consume your own stores, turn and turn about, use one another's houses. If you choose to slaughter one man's livestock and pay nothing, this is rapine. But by, And by the eternal gods, I beg Zeus, you shall get what you deserve, a slaughter here, and nothing paid for it. Now Zeus, who views the wide world, sent a sign to him, launching a pair of eagles from a mountain crest in gliding flight down the soft-blowing wind, wingtip to wingtip, quivering taut. Companions, till high above the assembly of many voices they wheeled, their dense wings beating, and in havoc dropping on the heads of the crowd a deathly omen, wielding their talons, tearing cheeks and throats, then veering away on the right hand through the city. Astonished, gaping after the birds, the men felt, felt their hearts flooded, foreboding things to come. And now they heard the old lord Halerthes, Halerthes, son of Mastor, keenest among the old at reading bird flight into accurate speech. In his anxiety for them, he rose and said, Hear me, Ithacans, hear what I have to say, and may I hope to, and may I hope to open the suitor's eyes to the black wave towering over them. Odysseus will not be absent from his family long. He is already near, carrying in him a bloody doom for all these men, and sorrow for many more in our high sea-mark, Ithaca. Let us think how to stop it. Let the suitors drop their suit. They had better without delay. I am old enough to know a sign when I see one, and I say all has come to pass for Odysseus, as I foretold when the Argives massed on Troy, and he, the great tactician, joined the rest." My forecast was that, after nineteen years, many blows weathered, all his shipmates lost, himself unrecognized by anyone, he would come home. I see all this fulfilled. But Polybus' son, Eurymachus, retorted, Old man, go tell the omens for your children at home, and try to keep them out of trouble. I am more fit to interpret this than you are. Bird life a plenty is found in the sunny air, not all of its significant... As for Odysseus, he perished far from home. You should have perished with him. Then we'd be spared all this nonsense in assembly, as good as telling Telemachus to rage on. Do you think you can gamble on a gift from him? Here is what I foretell, and it's quite certain. If you, with what you know of ancient lore, encourage bitterness in this young man, it means, for him, only the more frustration. He can do nothing whatever with two eagles. As for you, old man, we'll fix a penalty that you will groan to pay.
Before the whole assembly, I advised Telemachus to send his mother, his mother to her father's house, let them arrange her wedding there, and fix a portion suitable for a valued daughter. Until he does this, courtship is our business. Vexing though it may be, we fear no one, certainly not Telemachus, with his talk, and we care nothing for your divining uncle, useless talk. You win, you win more hatred by it. We'll share his meat, no thanks or fee to him, as long as she delays and maddens us. It is a long, long time we have been waiting in rivalry for this beauty. We could have gone elsewhere and found ourselves very decent wives. Clear-headed Telemachus replied to this, Eurymachos and noble suitors all, I am finished with appeals and arguments. The gods know, and the Achaeans know, these things. But give me a fast ship and a crew of twenty who will see me through a voyage, out and back. I'll go to Sandy Pylos, then to Sparta, for news of father, since he sailed from Troy. Some traveler's tale, perhaps, or rumored fame issued from Zeus himself into the world. If he's alive and beating his way home, I might hold out for another weary year. But if they tell me he's dead and gone, then I can come back to my own dear country and raise a mound for him and burn his gear, and with all the funeral honors that befits him, and give my mother to another husband. The boy sat down in silence. Next to stand was Mentor, comrade in arms of the prince Odysseus, an old man now. Odysseus left him authority over his house and slaves to guard them well. In his concern, he spoke to the assembly. <clears throat> hear me, Ithacans, hear what I have to say. Let no man holding a scepter as king be thoughtful, mild, kindly, or virtuous. Let him be cruel and practice evil ways. It is so clear that no one here remembers how, how like a gentle father Odysseus ruled you. I find it less revolting that the suitors carry their malice into violent acts. At least they stake their lives when they go pillaging the house of Odysseus. Their lives upon it, he will not come again. What sickens me is to see the whole community sitting still, and never a voice or hand raised against them. A mere handful, com compared with you. Leocritus, Eunor's son, replied to him, Mentor, what mischief are you raking up? Will this crowd risk the sword's edge over a dinner? Suppose Odysseus himself indeed came in and found the suitors at his table. He might, he might be hot to drive them out. What then? Never would he enjoy his wife again, the wife who loves him well. He'd only bring down abject death on himself against the, those odds. Madness to talk of fighting in either case. Now, let all present go about their business. Halerthesis and Mentor will speed the traveler. They can help him. They were his father's friends. I rather think he would he will be sitting here a long time yet, waiting for news on Ithaca that's, than seafaring he spoke of is beyond him. On this note, they were quick to end their parley. The assembly broke up, everyone went home, the suitors home to Odysseus' house again. But Telemachus walked down along the shore and washed his hands in the foam of the gray sea, then said this prayer, O God of yesterday, guest in our house, who told me to take ship on the hazy sea for news of my lost father, listen to me, be near me. The Achaeans only wait or hope to hinder me, the damned insolent suitors most of all. Athena was nearby and came to him, putting on Mentor's figure and his tone, the warm voice of a lucid flight of words. You'll never be faint-hearted or a fool, Telemachus, if you have your father's spirit. He finished what he cared to say and what he took in hand he brought, he brought to pass. The sea roots will yield their distances to his true son, Penelope's true son. I doubt another's luck would hold so far. The son is rare who measures with his father, and one in a thousand is a better man. But you will have the sap and wit and prudence, for, you get that from Odysseus, to give you a fair chance of winning through. So never mind the suitors and their ways. There is no judgment in them. Neither did they know anything of death and the black terror close, close upon them. Doom's day on them all. You need not linger over going to sea. I sailed beside your father on the old days. I'll find a ship for you and help you sail her. So go on home, and if any, and is as if to join the suitors, but get provisions ready in containers, wine in two-handled jugs, and barley meal, the staying power of oarsmen, in skin bags, watertight. I'll go the rounds and call a crew of volunteers together. Hundreds of ships are beached on sea-girt Ithaca. Let me but choose the soundest, old or new. We'll rig her and take her out on the broad sea. This was the divine speech Telemachus heard, from Athena, Zeus's daughter. He stayed no longer, 
but took his heartache home and found the robust suitors there at work, skinning goats and roasting pigs in the courtyard. Atinoos came straight over, laughing at him, and took him by the hand with a bold greeting. High-handed Telemachus, control your temper! Come on and get over it, get over it. No more grim thoughts, but feast and but feast and drink with me the way you used to. The Achaeans will attend to all you ask for, ship, crew, and crossing to the holy land of Pylos for the news about your father. Telemachus replied with no confusion. Atinoos, I cannot see myself again taking quiet dinner in this company. Isn't, isn't it enough that you could strip my house under my very nose when I was young? Now that I know, being grown, what others say, I understand it all, and my heart is full. I'll bring black doom upon you if I can, either in Pylos if I go, or in this country. And I will go, go all the way, if only as someone's passenger. I have no ship, no oarsman, and it suits you that I have none. Calmly, he drew his hand from Atinos's hand. At this, the suitors, while they dressed their meat, began to exchange loud, mocking talk about him. One young, top-lofty gallant set the tone. Well, think of that. Telemachus has a mind to murder us. He's going to lead Avengers out of Pylos or Sparta, maybe. Oh, he's wild to do it. Or also try to fat the land of Ephria. He can get poison there and bring it home, doctor the wine jar, and dispatch us all. <laughs> Another took the cue. Well, now, who knows? He might get lost at sea, just like Odysseus, knocking around on a ship far from his friends. And what a lot of trouble that would give us, making the right division of his things. We'll keep his house as a dowry for his mother, his mother and the man who marries her. That was the drift of it. Telemachus went on through the old to the storeroom of his father, a great vault where gold and bronze lay piled along with chests of clothes and fragrant oil. And there were jars of earthenware and rose, holding an old wine, mellow, unmixed, and rare. Cool stood the jars against the wall, kept for whatever day Odysseus, worn by hardships, might come home. The double folding doors were tightly locked and guarded night and day by the serving woman, Eurycleia, uh, granddaughter of Prysenor, in all her duty vigilant and shrewd. Telemachus called her to the storeroom, saying, Nurse, get a few two-handled traveling jugs filled up with wine, the second best, not that you keep for your unlucky lord and king, hoping he may have slipped away from death and may yet come again, royal Odysseus. Twelve M4 I will do, seal them up tight and pour out barley into leather bags, twenty bushels of barley meal ground fine. Now keep this to yourself, collect these things, and after dark when mother has retired and gone upstairs to bed, I'll come for them. I sail to Sandy Pylos, then to Sparta, to see what news there is of father's voyage." His loving nurse, Eurycleia, gave a cry, and tears sprang to her, her eyes as she wailed softly. Dear child, whatever put this into your head? Why do you want to go so far in the world, and only and you are only darling? Lord Odysseus died in some strange land, far from his homeland. Think how, when you have turned your back, these men will plot to kill you and share all your things. Stay with your own, dear, do. Why should you suffer hardship and homelessness on the wild sea? But seeing all clear, Telemachus replied, Take heart, nurse. There's a god behind this plan, and you must swear to keep it from my mother until the eleventh day, or twelfth, or till she misses me, or hears that I am gone. She must not tear her lovely skin lamenting. So the old woman vowed by all the gods, and vowed again to carry out his wishes. Then she filled up the amphorae with wine and sifted barley meal into leather bags. Telemachus rejoined the suitors. Meanwhile, the goddess with gray eyes had other business. Disguised as Telemachus, she roamed the town, taking each likely man aside and telling him, Meet us at nightfall at the ship. Indeed, she asked Naomon, Fron um, Fronios' wealthy son, to lend her a fast ship, and he complied. Now, when at sundown shadows crossed the lanes, she dragged the cutter to the sea and launched it, fitted out with rough with tough sea-going gear, and tied it up, away at the harbor's edge. The crewmen gathered, sent there by the goddess. Then it occurred to the gray-eyed goddess Athena to pass inside the house of the hero Odysseus, showering a sweet drowsiness on the suitors, whom she had presently wandered, whom she had presently wandering in their wine. And soon, as they could hold their cups no longer, they straggled off to find their beds in town, eyes heavy-lidded, laden down with sleep. Then to Telemachus the gray-eyed goddess appeared, again with mentor's form and voice, 
calling him out of the lofty emptied hall. Telemachus, your crew of fighting men is ready at the oar, and waiting for you. Come on, no point in holding up the sailing. And Pallas Athena turned like the wind, running ahead of him. He followed in her footsteps down to the seaside, where they found the ship and oarsmen with flowing hair at the water's edge. Telemachus, now strong in the magic, cried, Come with me, friends, and get our rations down. They are all packed at home, and my own mother knows nothing. Only one maid was told. He turned and led the way, and they came after, carried and stowed all, all in the well-trimmed ship as the dear son of Odysseus commanded. Telemachus then stepped aboard. Athena took her position aft, and he sat by her. The two stroke oars cast off the stern hawsers and vaulted over the gunwales to their benches. Gray-eyed Athena stirred them with the following wind, sawing from the northwest on the wine-dark sea, and as he felt the wind, Telemachus pushed to all hands to break out mast and sail. They pushed the fur mast high and stepped it firm amidships in the box, made fast the fore stays, then hoisted up the white sail on its halyards until the wind caught, booming in the sail, and a flushing wave sang backward from her bow on either side as the, wind sh as the ship got way upon her, holding her course steady. Now they made all secure in the fast black ship, and, setting out the wine bowls all abrim, they made libation to the gods, the undying, the ever new, most of all to the gray-eyed daughter of Zeus, and the, proud sh and the prow sheared through the night into the dawn. I'm Joffrey Swait. I teach at Kepler Education, and this is Book Three, An Old King Remembers. I've chosen the translation done by Murray and Dimmock because I think pseudo-literal translations are fun. Book three. And now the sun, leaving the beauteous mere, sprang up into the brazen heaven to give light to the immortals and to mortal men on the earth, the giver of grain. And they came to Pylos, the well-built citadel of Nelios. Here the townsfolk on the shore of the sea were offering sacrifice of black bulls to the dark-haired earthshaker. Nine companies there were, and five hundred men sat in each, and in each they held nine bulls ready for sacrifice. Now when they had tasted the inner parts and were burning the thigh pieces to the god, the others put straight into the shore and hauled up and furled the sail of the shapely ship and moored her, and themselves stepped forth. Forth, too, from the ship stepped Telemachus, and Athena led the way. And the goddess, flash-eyed Athena, spake first to him and said, Telemachus, no longer hast thou need to feel shame, no, not a whit. For to this end hast thou sailed over the sea, that thou mightest seek tidings of thy father, where the earth covered him, and what fate he met. But come now, go straightway to Nestor, tamer of horses. Let us learn what counsel he keepeth hid in his breast. And do thou beseech him thyself, that he may tell thee the very truth, a lie he will not utter, for he is wise indeed." Then wise Telemachus answered her, Mentor, how shall I go, and how shall I greet him? I am as yet all unversed and in subtle speech, and moreover a young man has shame to question an elder. Then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, answered him, Telemachus, somewhat thou wilt of thyself devise in thy breast, and somewhat heaven too will prompt thee, for methinks not without the favor of the gods hast thou been born and reared. So spake Pallas Athena, and led the way quickly, but he followed in the footsteps of the goddess, and they came to the gathering and the companies of the men of Pylos. There Nestor sat with his sons, and round about his people, making ready the feast, were roasting some of the meat and putting other pieces on spits. But when they saw the strangers, they all came thronging about them, and clasped their hands in a welcome, and bade them sit down. First Nestor's son Pisistratus came near and took both by the hand, and made them to sit down at the feast on soft fleeces upon the sand of the sea, beside his brother Thrasymedes and his father. Thereupon he gave them portions of the inner meat, and poured wine in a golden cup, and pledging her he spoke to Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, who bears the Aegis. Pray now, daughter of, to the Lord Poseidon, for his is the feast whereon you chanced in coming hither. And when thou hast poured libations and hast prayed as is fitting, then give thy friend also the cup of honey-sweet wine that he may pour, since he too, I ween, prays to the immortals. For all men have need of the gods. Howbeit he is the younger of like age with, my, with myself. Howbeit he is the younger of like age with myself. Wherefore to thee first will I give the golden cup." 
So he spake and placed in her hand the cup of sweet wine. But Pallas Athena rejoiced at the man's wisdom and judgment, and that to her first he gave the golden cup, and straightway she prayed earnestly to the Lord Poseidon. Hear me, Poseidon, thou earth enfolder, and grudge not an answer to our prayer to bring these deeds to fulfillment. To Nestor, first of all, and to his sons vouchsafe renown, and then do thou grant to the rest gracious requital for this glorious hecatomb, even to all the men of Pylos. And grant furthermore that Telemachus and I may return when we have accomplished all that for which we came hither with our swift black ship. Thus she prayed and was herself fulfilling all. Then she gave Telemachus the fair two-handled cup, and in like manner the dear son of Odysseus prayed. Then when they had roasted the outer flesh and drawn it off the spits, they divided the portions and feasted a glorious feast. But when they had put from them the desire of food and drink, the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, spoke first among them. Now verily it is seemlier to ask and inquire of the strangers who they are, since now they have had their joy of food. Strangers, who are ye? Whence do ye sail over the watery ways? Is it on some business, or do ye wander at random over the sea, even as pirates, who wander hazarding their lives and bringing evil to men of other lands? Then wise Telemachus took courage, and made answer, for Athena herself put courage in his heart, that he might ask about his father that was gone, and that good report might be among his men." Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, thou askest whence we came, and I will surely tell thee. We have come from Ithaca, that is below Neon. But this business whereof I speak is mine own, and concerns not the people. I come after the widespread rumor of my father, if haply I may hear of it, even of goodly Odysseus of the steadfast heart, who once, men say, fought by thy side and sacked the city of the Trojans. For of all men else, as many as warred with the Trojans, we learn where each man died a woeful death, but of him the son of Cronos has made even the death to be past learning, for no man can tell surely where he hath died, whether he was overcome by foes on the mainland or on the deep among the waves of Amphithrite. Therefore am I now come to thy knees, if perchance thou wilt be willing to tell me of his woeful death, whether thou sawest it haply with thine own eyes, or didst hear from some other the story of his wanderings, for beyond all men did his mother bear him to sorrow. And do thou no wise out of ruth or pity for me speak soothing words, but tell me truly how thou didst come to behold them. I beseech thee, if ever my father, noble Odysseus, promised aught to thee of word or deed, and fulfilled it in the land of the Trojans, where you Achaeans suffered woes, be mindful of it now, I pray thee, and tell me the very truth. Then the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, answered him, My friend, since thou hast recalled to my mind the sorrow which we endured in that land, we sons of the Achaeans, unrestrained and daring, all that we endured on shipboard as we roamed after booty over the misty deep whithersoever Achilles led, and all our fightings around the great city of King Priam, lo, there all our best were slain. There lies warlike Aias, there Achilles, there Patroclus, the peer of the gods in council, and there my own dear son, strong alike and peerless, Antilochus, preeminent in speed of foot and as a warrior ay and many other ills we suffered beside these who of mortal men could tell them all nay if for five years space or six years space thou wert to abide here and ask of all the woes which the goodly achaeans endured there thou wouldst grow weary ere the end and get thee back to thy native land for nine years space were we busied plotting their ruin with all manner of wiles and hardly did the son of Cronos bring it to pass there no man ventured to vie with him in counsel since goodly Odysseus far excelled in all manner of wiles thy father if indeed thou art his son amazement holds me as i look on thee for verily thy speech is like his nor would one think that a younger man would speak so like him now all the time that we were there goodly odysseus and i never spoke at variance either in the assembly or in the council but being of one mind advised the argives with wisdom and shrewd counsel how all the might be for the best now all the time that we were there goodly odysseus and i never spoke at variance either in the assembly or in the council but being of one mind advised the argives with wisdom and shrewd counsel how all might be for the best but when we had sacked the lofty city of priam and had gone away in our ships and a god had scattered the achaeans then even then zeus planned in his heart a woeful return for the argives for in no wise prudent or just were all Wherefore many of them met an evil fate through the fell wrath of the flashing-eyed goddess, the daughter of the mighty sire, for she caused strife between the two sons of Atreus. 
Now these two called to an assembly of all the Achaeans, recklessly and in no due order at set of sun, and they came heavy with wine, the sons of the Achaeans, and they spoke their word, and told wherefore they had gathered the host together. Then in truth Menelaus bade all the Achaeans think of their return over the broad back of the sea. But in no wise did he please Agamemnon, for he was fain to hold back the host and to offer holy hecatombs, that he might appease the dread wrath of Athena. Fool! Nor knew he this, that with her was to be no hearkening, for the mind of the gods that are forever is not quickly turned. So these two stood bandying harsh words, but the well-grieved Achaeans sprang up with a wondrous din, and twofold plans found favor with them. That night we rested, each side pondering hard thoughts against the other, for Zeus was bringing upon us an evil doom. But in the morning some of us launched our ships upon the bright sea, and put on board our goods and the low-girdled women. Half, indeed, of the host held back and remained there with Agamemnon, son of Atreus, shepherd of the host. But half of us embarked and rowed away, and swiftly the ship sailed, for a god made smooth the cavernous sea. But when we came to Tenedos, we offered sacrifice to the gods, being eager to reach our homes, howbeit Zeus did not yet purpose our return, stubborn god, who roused evil strife again the second time. Then some turned back their curved ships, and departed even the lord odysseus the wise and crafty-minded with his company once more showing favor to agamemnon son of atreus but i with the full company of ships that followed me fled on for i knew that the god was devising evil and the warlike son of tydeus fled and urged on his men and late upon our track came fair-haired menelaus and overtook us in lesbos as we were debating the long voyage whether we should sail to seaward of rugged chaos toward the isle Prisia. And the warlike son of Tydeus fled and urged on his men, and laid upon our track came fair-haired Menelaus, and overtook us in Lesbos, as we were debating the long voyage, whether we should sail to seaward of rugged Chios, toward the isle Syria, keeping Chios itself on our left, or to landward of Chios past windy Mimas. So we asked the god to show us a sign, and he showed it us, and bade us cleave through the midst of the sea to Euboea, that we might meet the soonest escape from misery. And a shrill wind sprang up to blow, and the ship ran swiftly over the teeming ways, and a night put into Geristeus. There on the altar of Poseidon we laid many thighs of bulls, thankful to have traversed the great sea. It was the fourth day when in Argos the company of Diomedes, son of Tydeus, tamer of horses, stayed their shapely ships. But I held on toward Pylos, and the wind was not once quenched from the time when the god first sent it forth to blow. Thus I came, dear child, without tidings, nor know I aught of these others, who of the Achaeans were saved and who were lost. But what tidings I have heard as I abide in our halls thou shalt hear, as is right, nor will I hide it from thee. Safely, they say, came the Myrmidons that raged with the spear, whom the famous son of great-hearted Achilles led, and safely Philoctetes, the glorious son of Poyas, all his company, too, did Idomeneus bring to Crete, all who escaped the war, and the sea robbed him of none. But of the son of Atreus you have yourselves heard, far off though you are, how he came and how Agistheus devised for him a woeful doom. Yet verily he paid the reckoning therefore in terrible wise. So good a thing is it that a son be left behind a man in his death, since that son took vengeance on his father's slayer, the guileful Agistus, for that he slew his glorious father. Thou too, friend, for I see thou art a comely man and tall. Be thou valiant, that many a one among men yet to be born may praise thee. Then wise Telemachus answered him, Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, yea, verily that son took vengeance, and the Achaeans shall spread his fame abroad, that men who are yet to be may hear thereof. O oh, that the gods would clothe me with such strength that I might take vengeance on the wooers for their grievous sin, who in wantonness devise mischief against me. But lo, the gods have spun for me no such happiness, for me or for my father, and now I must in any case endure. Then the horseman Nestor of Gerenia answered him, Friend, since thou callest this to my mind and didst speak of it, they say that many wooers for the hand of thy mother devise evils in thy halls, in thy despot. Tell me, art thou willingly thus oppressed, or do the people throughout the land hate thee, following the voice of a god? Who knows but Odysseus may some day come and take vengeance on them for their violent deeds. He alone it may be, or even all the host of the Achaeans. Ah, would that flashing-eyed Athena might choose to love thee, even as she cared then exceedingly for glorious Odysseus in the land of the Trojans, where we Achaeans suffered woes. For never yet have I seen the god so manifestly showing love as Pallas Athena did to him, standing manifest by his side. If she would be pleased to love thee in such wise and would care for thee at heart, then would many a one of them utterly forget marriage. 
Then wise Telemachus answered him, Old man, in no wise do I deem that this word will be brought to pass. Too great is what thou sayest. Amazement holds me. No hope have I that this will come to pass. No, not that the gods should so will it. Then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, spoke to him and said, Telemachus, what a word has escaped the barrier of thy teeth. Easily might a god who willed it bring a man safe home, even from afar. But for myself I had rather endure many grievous toils ere I reached home and saw the day of my returning, than after my return be slain at my hearth, as Agamemnon was slain by the guile of Aegisthus and of his own wife. But of a truth, death that is common to all. The gods themselves cannot ward from a man they love when the fell fate of grievous death shall strike him down. Then wise Telemachus answered her, Mentor, no longer let us tell of these things despite our grief. For him no return can ever more be brought to pass. Nay, ere this the immortals have devised for him death and black fate. But now I would make enquiry and ask Nestor regarding another matter, since beyond all others he knows judgments and wisdom. For thrice, men say, has he been king for a generation of men, and like unto an immortal he seems to me to look upon. Nestor, son of Neleus, do thou tell me truly, how was the son of Atreus, wide ruling Agamemnon, slain? Where was Menelaus? What death did Gaufal Aegisthus plan for the king, since he slew a man mightier far than himself? Was Menelaus not in Achaean in Argos, but wandering elsewhere among men, so that Aegisthus took heart and did the murderous deed? Then the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, answered him, Then verily, my child, will I tell thee all the truth. Lo, of thine own self thou dost guess how this matter would have fallen out if the son of Atreus, fair-haired Menelaus, on his return from Troy had found Aegisthus in his halls alive. Then for him not even in death would they have piled the up-piled earth, but the dogs and birds would have torn him as he lay on the plain far from the city, nor would any of the Achaean women have bewailed him, for monstrous was the deed he devised. We on our part abode there in Troy, fulfilling our many toils, but he at ease in a nook of horse pasturing Argos ever sought to beguile with words the wife of Agamemnon. Now at the first she put from her the unseemly deed, the beautiful Clytemnestra, for she had an understanding heart. And with her was furthermore a minstrel, whom the son of Atreus straightly charged when he set forth for the land of Troy to guard his wife. But when at length the doom of the gods bound her that she should be overcome, then verily Aegisthus took the minstrel to a desert isle, and left him to be prey and spoil of birds. And her, willing as he was willing, he led to his own house. And many thigh pieces he burned upon the holy altars of the gods, and many offerings he hung up, woven stuffs and gold, since he had accomplished a mighty deed beyond all his heart had hoped. Now we were sailing together on our way from Troy, the son of Atreus and I, in all friendship. But when we came to holy Sunium, the Cape of Athens, there Phoebus Apollo assailed with his gentle shafts and slew the helmsman of Menelaus, as he held in his hands the steering oar of the speeding ship, even Frontus, son of Onator, who excelled the tribes of men in piloting a ship when the storm winds blow strong. So Menelaus tarried there, though eager for his journey, that he might bury his comrade and over him pay funeral rites. But when he in his turn, as he passed over the wine-dark sea in the hollow ships, reached in swift course the steep height of Malia, then verily Zeus, whose voice is borne afar, planned for him a hateful path and poured upon him the blasts of shrill winds, and the waves were swollen to huge size like unto mountains. Then parting his ships in twain, he brought some to Crete, where the Sidonians dwelt about the streams of Iardanus. Now there is a smooth cliff, sheer toward the sea, on the border of Gortin in the misty deep, where the southwest wind drives the great wave against the headland on the left toward Phaestus, and a little rock holds back a great wave. Thither came some of his ships, and the men with much ado escaped destruction, albeit the ships the waves dashed to pieces against the reef. But the five other dark-proud ships, the wind as it bore them, and the wave brought to Egypt. So he was wandering there with his ships among men of strange speech, gathering much livelihood and gold. But meanwhile, Aegisthus devised this woeful work at home. Seven years he reigned over Mycenae, rich in gold, after slaying the son of Atreus, and the people were subdued under him. But in the eighth came as his bane the goodly Orestes back from Athens, and slew his father's murderer, the guileful Aegisthus, for that he had slain his glorious father. Now when he had slain him, he made a funeral feast for the Argives over his hateful mother and the craven Aegisthus. And on the selfsame day there came to him Menelaus, good at the war cry, bringing much treasure, even all the burden that his ships could bear. So do not thou, my friend, wander long far from home, leaving thy wealth behind thee and men in thy house so insolent, lest they divide and devour all thy wealth, and thou shalt have gone on a fruitless journey. But to Menelaus I bid and command thee to go, for he has but lately come from a strange land, from a folk whence no one would hope in his heart to return. 
whom the storms had once driven astray into a sea so great, whence the very birds do not fare in the space of a year, so great is it and terrible. But now go thy way with thy ship and thy comrades, or if thou wilt go by land, here are chariot and horses at hand for thee, and here at thy service are my sons, who will be thy guides to goodly Lacedaemon, where lives fair-haired Menelaus. And do thou beseech him thyself that he may tell thee the very truth, a lie he will not utter, for he is wise indeed." So he spoke, and the sun set, and darkness came on. Then among them spoke the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena. Old man, of a truth thou hast told this tale aright. But come, cut out the tongues of the victims, and mix the wine. And when we have poured libations to Poseidon and the other immortals, we may bethink us of sleep, for it is the time thereto. Even now has the light gone down beneath the darkness, and it is not fitting to sit along at the feast of the gods, but to go our way." So spoke the daughter of Zeus, and they hearkened to her voice. Heralds poured water over their hands, and youths filled the bowls brim full of drink, and served out to all, pouring first drops for libation into the cups. Then they cast the tongues upon the fire, and rising up, cast libations upon them. But when they had poured libations, and had drunk to their heart's content, then verily Athena and godlike Telemachus were both fain to return to the hollow ship. But Nestor on his part sought to stay them, and he spake to them, saying, this may Zeus forbid, and the other immortal gods, that ye should go from my house to your swift ship, as from one utterly without raiment and poor, who has not cloaks and blankets and plenty in his house, whereon both he and his guests may sleep softly. Nay, in my house there are cloaks and fair blankets. Never surely shall the son, dear son, never surely shall the dear son of this man Odysseus lie down upon the deck of a ship, while I yet live, and children after me are left in my halls to entertain strangers, even whosoever shall come to my house." Then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, answered him, Well, indeed, hast thou spoken in this, old friend, and it were fitting for Telemachus to hearken to thee, since it is far better thus. But while he shall now follow with thee, that he may sleep in thy halls, I, for my part, will go to the black ship, that I may hearten my comrades and tell them all. For alone among them I declare that I am an older man. The others are younger who follow in friendship, all of them of like age with great-hearted Telemachus. There will I lay me down by the hollow black ship this night, but in the morning I will go to the great-hearted Calconians, where a debt is owing to me, and no wise new or small. But do thou send this man on his way with a chariot and with thy son, since he has come to thy house, and give him horses, the fleetest thou hast in running, and the best in strength. So spoke the goddess, flashing-eyed Athena, and she departed in the likeness of a sea-eagle, and amazement fell upon all at the sight, and the old man marveled when his eyes beheld it. And he grasped the hand of Telemachus, and spoke, and addressed him. Friend, in no wise do I think that thou wilt prove a base man or a craven, if verily when thou art so young the gods follow thee to be thy guides. For truly this is none other of those that have their dwellings on Olympus but the daughter of Zeus, Tritogonea, the maid most glorious, she that honored also thy noble father among the Argives. Nay, O queen, be gracious, and grant to me fair renown, to me and to my sons and to my revered wife, and to thee in return will I sacrifice a sleek heifer, broad of brow, unbroken, which no man hath yet led beneath the yoke. Her will I sacrifice, and I will overlay her horns with gold. So he spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athena heard him. Then the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, led them, his sons and the husbands of his daughters, to his beautiful palace. And when they reached the glorious palace of the king, they sat down in rows on the chairs and high seats, and on their coming the old man mixed for them a bowl of sweet wine, which now in the eleventh year the housewife opened, when she had loosed the string that held the lid. Thereof the old man bade mix a bowl, and earnestly he prayed as he poured libations to Athena, the daughter of Zeus, who bears the aegis. But when they had poured libations and had drunk to their heart's content, they went, each to his home, to take their rest. But the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, bade Telemachus, the dear son of divine Odysseus, to sleep there on a corded bedstead under the echoing portico, and by him Pesistratus of the good ashen spear, a leader of men, who among his sons was still unwed in the palace. But he himself slept in the inmost chamber of the lofty house, and beside him lay the lady, his wife, who had strewn the couch. Soon as early dawn appeared, the rose he fingered, up from his bed rose the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, and went forth and sat down on the polished stones which were before his lofty doors, white and glistening as with oil. On these of old was wont to sit Nellius, the peer of the gods in council, but he ere this had been stricken by fate and had gone to the house of Hades, and now there sat upon them in his turn Nestor of Gerenia, the warder of the Achaeans, holding a scepter in his hands.' 
About him his sons gathered in a throng as they came forth from their chambers, Echephron and Stratius and Perseus and Aretas and godlike Thrasymedes, and to these thereafter came as the sixth the Lord Pisistratus, and they led them godlike Telemachus and made him sit beside them, and the horseman Nestor of Gerenia was first to speak among them. Quickly, my dear children, fulfill my desire, that first of all the gods I may propitiate Athena, who came to me in manifest presence to the rich feast of the god. Come now, let one go to the plain for a heifer, that she may come speedily, and that the neat herd may drive her. And let one go to the black ship of great-hearted Telemachus, and bring all his comrades, and let him leave two men only. And let one again bid the goldsmith Laerces come hither, that he may overlay the heifer's horns with gold. And do ye others abide here together, and bid the handmaids within to make ready a feast throughout our glorious halls, to fetch seats and logs to set on either side of the altar, and to bring clear water. So he spoke, and they all set busily to work. The heifer came from the plain, and from the swift, shapely ship came the comrades of great-hearted Telemachus. The smith came, bearing in his hands his tools of bronze, the implements of his craft, anvil and hammer, and well-made tongs, wherewith he wrought the gold. And Athena came to accept the sacrifice. Then the old man Nestor, the driver of chariots, gave gold, and the smith prepared it, and overlaid therewith the horns of the heifer, that the goddess might rejoice when she beheld the offering. And Stratius and goodly Echephron led the heifer by the horns, and Aretas came from the chamber, bringing them water for the hands and a basin embossed with flowers, and in the other hand he held barley grains in a basket, and Thrasymedes, steadfast in fight, stood by, holding in his hands a sharp axe to fell the heifer, and Perseus held the bowl for the blood. Then the old man Nestor, driver of chariots, began the opening rite of hand-washing and sprinkling with barley grains, and earnestly he prayed to Athena, cutting off his first offering the hair from the head and casting it into the fire. Now when they had prayed and had strewn the barley grain, straightway the son of Nestor, Thrasymedes, high of heart, came near and dealt the blow, and the axe cut through the sinews of the neck and loosened the strength of the heifer. Then the women raised the sacred cry, the daughters and sons' wives and the revered wife of Nestor, Eurydice, the eldest of the daughters of Clemenus. And the men raised the heifer's head from the broad sweet earth and held it, and Pisistratus, leader of men, cut the throat. And when the black blood had flowed from her and the life had left the bones, at once they cut up the body and straightway cut out the thigh pieces all in due order and covered them with a double layer of fat and laid raw flesh among them. Then the old man burned them on billets of wood and poured over them flaming wine, and beside him the young men held in their hands the five-pronged forks. But when the thigh pieces were wholly burned, they had tasted the inner parts, they cut up the rest and spitted and roasted it, holding the pointed spits in their hands." Meanwhile, the fair Polychaste, the youngest daughter of Nestor, son of Nelius, bathed Telemachus, and when she had bathed him and anointed him richly with oil, and had cast about him a fair cloak and a tunic, forth from the bath he came in form like unto the immortals, and he went and sat down by Nestor, the shepherd of the people. Now when they had roasted the outer flesh and had drawn it off the spits, they sat down and feasted, and worthy men waited on them, pouring wine into golden cups. But when they had put from them the desire of food and drink, the horseman, Nestor of Gerenia, was first to speak, saying, My sons, up, yoke for Telemachus horses with beautiful mane beneath the car, that he may get forward on his journey. So he spoke, and they readily hearkened and obeyed, and quickly they yoked beneath the car the swift horses, and the housewife placed in the car bread and wine and dainties, such as kings, fostered of Zeus, are wont to eat. Then Telemachus mounted the beautiful car, and Pisistrata, son of Nestor, a leader of men, mounted beside him and took the reins in his hands. He touched the horses with a whip to start them, and nothing loath the pair sped on to the plain, and left the steep citadel of Pylos. So all day long they shook the yoke which they bore about their necks. Now the sun set, and all the ways grew dark, and they came to Pherae, to the house of Diocles, son of Ortolochus, whom Alpheus begot. There they spent the night, and before them he set the entertainment due to strangers. As soon as early dawn appeared, the rosy-fingered, they yoked the horses and mounted the inlaid car, and drove forth from the gateway in the echoing portico. Then Pisistratus touched the horses with the whip to start them, and nothing loath the pair sped onward. So they came to the wheat-bearing plain, and thereafter pressed on toward their journey's end. So well did their swift horses bear them on, and the sun set, and all the ways grew dark. Hello, this is Cooper Salmon of Roman Woods Press. I do marketing and video, and have been part of several other of the uh, great books reading challenges and the read alouds and uh, i'm excited to share with y'all uh book four 
of the Odyssey. I'm going to be reading from the Alexander Pope translation, partially because that was the, the copy that I had on hand, partially because um, I get to enjoy, this is a, an early 1900s printing, and I get to enjoy the uh, Flaxman illustrations as I turn the pages. The, uh, we've, we've used and repurposed the Flaxman illustration for several things uh, at Roman Rhodes Press, and um, you know, they're, they're just fun. They're, they're nice, they're clean, they're simple. I love them. So go, go give those a quick Google search when you have the time. The Odyssey, Book 4. The Conference with Menelaus. And now proud Sparta with their wheels resounds, Sparta whose walls a range of hills surrounds. At the fair dome the, the rapid labor ends, where sate Atreides midst his bridal friends, with double vows invokes Hymen's power to bless his sons and daughter's nuptial hour. That day to great Achilles' son resigned, Hermione, the fairest of her kind, was sent to crown the long protracted joy espoused before the final doom of Troy. With steeds and gilded cars, a gorgeous train, attend the nymphs to Thya's distant reign. Meanwhile at home to Megapenthe's bed, a virgin choir, Alector's daughter, led. Brave Peganthes, from a stolen armor, to great Atreides' age his handmaid bore. To Helen's bed the gods alone assign Hermione to extend the regal line, on whom a radiant pomp of graces wait, resembling Venus in attractive state. While this gay, friendly troop the kings surround, with, festal, with festival and mirth the roofs resound, a bard amid the joyous circle sings, High airs attempered to the vocal strings. Whilst warbling to the varied strain, advance two sprightly youths to form the bounding dance. Twas then that, issuing through the palace gate, the splendid car rolled down and rolled slow in regal state. On the bright eminence, young Nestor shone, and fast beside him, great Ulysses' son. Grave Etonius saw the pomp appear, and speeding thus addressed the royal ear. Two youths approach, whose semblant features prove their blood devolved from the source of Jove. Is due reception dined, or must they bend their doubtful course to seek a distant friend? Insensate, with the king, with a sigh, the king replies, Too long misjudging have I thought thee wise. But sure relentless folly steals thy breast. Obdurate to reject the stranger guest. To those dear hospitable rites a foe, which in my wanderings oft, oft relieved my woe, fed by the bounty of another's board, till pitying Jove my native realm restored. Straight be the coursers from the car released, conduct the youths to great the genial feast. The seneschal, rebuked, in haste withdrew, with equal haste a menial train pursue. Part led the coursers from the car enlarged, each to a crib with choicest grain surcharged. Part in a portico profusely graced, with mag rich magnificence, the chariot placed, the chariot placed. Then to the dome the friendly pair invite, who eye the dazzling roofs with vast delight, resplendent as the blaze of summer noon, or the pale radiance of a midnight moon. From room to room they are eager, their eager view they bend, thence to the bath, a beauteous pile descend, where a bright damsel train attends the guest with li with liquid odors and embroidered vests. Refreshed, they wait them to the bower of state, where, circled with his peers, Atreides sate. Throned next the king, a fair attendant brings the purest produce of the crystal springs. High on a massy vase of silver mold, the burnished laver flames with solid gold. In solid gold the purple vintage flows, and on the board a second banquet rose. When thus the king with hospitable port, Accept this welcome to the Spartan court. The waste of nature let the, fair, let the feast repair, Then your high lineage and your names declare. Say from what sceptred ancestry ye claim, Recorded eminent in deathless fame, For vulgar parents cannot stamp their race With signatures of such majestic grace. Ceasing, benevolent, he straight assigns the royal portion to the choicest chines. To each accepting friend, with grateful haste, they share the honors of the rich repast. Sufficed, soft whispering thus to Nestor's son, his head reclined, young Ithacus began. Ithacus began. 
Viewest thou unmoved, O ever honored most, these prodigies of art and wondrous coast, cost. Above, beneath, around the palace shines the sunless treasure of exhausted minds. The spoils of elephants the roofs inlay, and studded amber darts a golden ray. Such, and not nobler in the realms above, my wonder dictates is the dome of Jove. The monarch took the word, and grave replied, Presumptuous are the vaunts, and vain the pride of man who dares in pomp with, with Jove contest, unchanged, immoral, and supremely, uh, unchanged, immortal, and supremely blessed. With all my affluence, when my woes are weighed, envy will own the purchase dearly paid. For eight slow circling years by tempests tossed, from Cyprus to the far Phoenician coast, side in the capital, I stretched my toil through regions fattened with the flows of Nile, next Ethiopia's utmost bound explore, and the parched border of the Arabian shore, then warp my vo voyage on the southern gales, over the warm Libyan wave to spread my sails, that happy clime where each revolving year the teeming ewes a triple offspring bear, and two fair crescents of translucent horn the brows of all their young increase adorn. The shepherd swains with surest abundance blessed on the fat flock and rural dainties feast, nor want of herbage makes the dairy fail, but every season fills the foaming pail. Whilst the heaping unwashed wealth I distant roam, the best of brothers at his natal home by the dire fury of a traitorous wife ends the sad evening of a stormy life. Whence with incessant grief my soul annoyed, these riches are possessed, but not enjoyed. My wars, the copious theme of every tongue, to you, your father, have recorded long, how a favoring heaven repaid my glorious toils with a sacked, with a sacked palace and barbaric spoils. Oh, had the gods so large a boon denied, and life the just equivalent supplied to those brave warriors who, with glory fired, far from their country, to my cause expired. Still, in short intervals of pleasing woe, regardful of the friendly dues I owe, I to the glorious dead forever dear, indulge the tribu tribute of a grateful tear. But, oh, Ulysses, deeper than the rest, that sad idea wounds my anxious breast. My heart bleeds fresh with agonizing pain, the bowl and tasteful viands tempt in vain. Nor sleep's soft power can close my streaming eyes, when, ima when imaged to my soul his sorrows rise. No peril in my cause he ceased to prove, his labors equaled only by my love and both alike to bitter fortune born, for him to suffer, and for me to mourn. Whether he wanders on some friendly coast, or glides in Stygian gloom, a pensive ghost, no fame reveals, but, doubtful of his doom, his good old sire, with sorrow to the tomb, declines his trembling steps, untimely care withers the blooming vigor of his heir, and the chaste partner of his bed and throne wastes all her widowed, widow, widowed hours in tender moan, while thus pathetic to the prince he spoke, from the brave youth the streaming passion broke. Studious, studious to veil the grief in vain repressed, his face he shrouded with his purple vest. The conscious monarch pierced the coy disguise, and, filled, and viewed his filial love with vast surprise, dubious to press the tender theme, or wait to hear the youth inquire his father's fate. In this suspense bright Helen graced the room, before her breathed a gale of rich perfume, so moves, adorned with attractive grace, the silver-shafted goddess of the chase. The seat of majesty Adrasti bears, with art illustrious for the pomp of kings, to, sp to spread the pall beneath the regal chair. Of softest wool is bright Alcippe's care, a silver canister divinely wrought, in her soft hands the beauteous Philo brought. To Sparta's queen of old the radiant vase Alcandra gave, a pledge of royal grace. For Polybus her lord, whose sovereign sway the wealthy tribes of Pharian Thebes obey, when to that court Atrides came, caressed with vast munificence the imperial guest, two lavers from the richest ore refined, with silver tripods the kind host assigned, and bounteous from the royal treasure told ten equal talents of refulgent gold. Alcandra, consort of his high command, a gold distaff gave to Helen's hand. And that rich vase, with living sculpture wrought, Which heaped with wool the beauteous Philo brought. The silken fleece, empurpled for the, for the loom, 
rivaled the hyacinth in vernal bloom. The sovereign seat then Jove-born Helen pressed, and pleasing thus her sceptred lord addressed. Who grace our palace now, that friendly pair? Speak they their lineage, or their names declare? Uncertain of the truth, yet uncontrolled, hear me, hear me, the bodings of my breast unfold. With wonder wrapped on yonder cheek I trace, the feature of the Ulyssian race. Diffused o'er each resembling line appear, in just similitude, the grace and air. Of young Telemachus, the lovely boy, who blessed Ulysses with a father's joy, what time the Greeks combined their social arms to avenge the stain of my ill-fated charms. Just as thy thought, the king assenting cries, methinks Ulysses strikes my wondering eyes. Full shines the father in the filial frame, his port, his features, and his shape the same. Such quick regards his sparkling eyes bestow, such wavy ringlets over his shoulders flow. And when he heard the long, disastrous store of cares which in my cause Ulysses bore, dismayed, heart-wounded with paternal woes, above restraint the tide of sorrow rose, cautious to let the gushing grief appear, his purple varmints, his purple garment veiled the falling tear. See there confessed, Pisistratus replies, the genuine worth of Ithacus the wise. Of that heroic sire the youth is sprung, but modest awe hath chained his timorous tongue. Thy voice, O king, with pleased attention heard, is like the dictates of a god revered. With him, at Nestor's high command, I came, whose age I honor with a parent's name. By adverse destiny constrained to sue for counsel and redress, he sues to you. Whatever ill the friendless orphan bears, bereaved of parents in his, in his infant years, still must the wronged Telemachus sustain, if, hopeful of your aid, he hopes in vain. Affianced in your friendly power alone, the youth would vindicate the vacant throne. Is Sparta blessed in these desiring eyes, views my friend's son? The king exalted cries. Son of my friend, with glorious toil approved, whose sword was sacred to the man he loved. Mirror of constant faith revered and mourned. When Troy was ruined, had the chief returned. No Greek an equal space had e'er possessed of dear affection in my grateful breast. I, to confirm the mutual joys we shared for his abode, a capital prepared. Argos, the seat of sovereign rule I chose. Fa fair in the plan, the future palace rose, where my Ulysses and his race might reign, and portion to his tribes the wide domain. To them my vassals had re-signed a soil, with teeming plenty to reward their toil. There with communal zeal we both had strove in acts of dear benevolence and love. Brothers in peace, not rivals in command, and death alone dissolved the friendly band. Some envious power the blissful scene destroys. Vanished are all the visionary joys. The soul of friendship to my hope is lost, fated to wander from his natal coast. He ceased. A gust of grief began to rise. Fast streams of a tide from beauteous Helen's eyes. Fast for the sire the filial sorrows flow, the weeping monarch swells the mighty woe. Thy cheeks, Pisistratus, their tears bedew, while pictured to thy mind appeared in view thy martial brother on the Phrygian plain, extended pale by swarthy Memnon slain. But silence soon the son of Nestor broke, and melting with fraternal pity, spoke. Frequent, O king, was Nestor wont to raise a charm attention for thy copious praise, to crowd thy various gifts, the sage assigned the glory of a firm, capacious mind. With that superior, superior attribute control this unavailing impotence of soul. Let not your roof with echoing grief resound, for now the feast to the friendly bowl is crowned. But when, from dewy shade emerging bright, aurora streaks the sky with orient light, let each deplore his dead. The rites of woe are all, alas, the living can bestow, or the congenial dust enjoined to shear the, great, the graceful curl and drop the tender tear. Then mingling in the mournful pomp with you, I'll pay my brother's ghost a, war, a warrior's due, and mourn the brave Antilochus, a and the and mourn the brave Antilochus, a name not unrecorded in the rolls of fame, with strength and speed superior formed to fight to face the foe or intercept his flight. Too early snatched by fate, by fate ere known to me, I boast a witness of his worth in thee. 
Young and mature, the monarch thus rejoins, in thee renewed the soul of Nestor shines, formed by the care of that consummate sage, in early bloom an oracle of age. Whene'er his influence Jove vouchsafes to shower, to bless the natal and the nuptial hour, from the great sire transmissive to the race, the boon devolving gives distinguished grace. Such happy Nestor, was thy glorious doom, around thee full of years thy offspring bloom, expert of arms and prudent in debate, the gifts of heaven to guard thy hoary state. But now let each becalm his troubled breast, wash and partake serene the friendly feast, to move thy suit Telemachus delay, till heaven's revolving lamp restores the day. He said, as Phalion swift the laver brings, Alternate all partakes the grateful springs. Then from the rites of purity repair, And with keen gust the, sav the savory viands share. Meantime with genial joy to warm the soul, Bright Helen mixed a mirth-inspiring bowl, Tempered with drugs of sovereign use To assuage the boiling bosom of tumult tumultuous rage, To clear the crowdy front of wrinkled care, And dry the too tearful sluices of despair. Charmed with that virtuous draught, the, the exalted mind, all sense of woe delivers to the wind. Through all the blazing pile his parents lay, though on the blazing pile his parents lay, or a loved brother's grown, or a loved brother groaned his life away, or darling son, oppressed by ruffian force, fell breathless at his feet, a mangled corse, from morn to eve, impassive and serene, a man, the man entranced, would view the dreadful scene. These drugs, so friendly to the joys of life, bright Helen learned from Thony's imperial wife, who swayed the scepter where prolific Nile with various simples clothed the, the fattened soil, with wholesome herbage mixed the dear direful bane, of vegetable venom taints the plain, from peon sprung, their patron god imparts to all the Farian race his healing arts. The beverage now prepared to inspire the feast, the circle thus the beauteous queen addressed. Throned in, in omnipotence, supremest Job tempers the fates of human race above. By the firm sanction of his sovereign will, alternate are decreed our good and ill. To feastful mirth be this white hour assigned, and sweet discourse the banquet of the mind. Myself assisting in the social joy will tell Ulysses' bold exploit in Troy. Sole witness of the deed I now declare, speak you who saw his wonders in the war. Seemed o'er with wounds which he his own saber gave, in the vile habit of a, of a village slave, the foe deceived, he passed the tented plain in Troy to mingle with the hostile train. In this attire, secure from searching eyes, till haply piercing through the dark disguise, the chief I challenged. He whose practiced wit knew all the serpent's mazes of deceit. Eludes my search, but when his form I viewed fresh from the bath, with fragrant oils renewed, his limbs in military purple dressed, each brightening grace the genuine Greek confessed. A previous pledge of, of, of sacred faith obtained, till he the lines and Argive fleet regained. To keep his stay concealed, the chief declared the plans of war against the town prepared. Exploring then the secrets of the state, he learned what might best might urge the Dardan fate, and, safe returning to the Grecian host, sent many a shade to Pluto's dreary coast. Loud grief resounded through the, through the towers of Troy, but my pleased bosom glowed with secret joy, for then, with dire remorse and conscious shame, I viewed the effects of that disastrous flame, which kindled by the imperious queen of love constrained me from my native realm to rove, and oft in bitterness of soul deplored my absent daughter and my dearer lord admired among the first of human race for every gift of mind and manly grace. Well right, replied the king, your speech displays the matchless merit of the chief you praise. Heroes in various climes myself have found for martial deeds and depth of thought renowned. But Ithacus, unrivaled in his claim, may boast a title to the loudest fame. In battle calm he guides the rapid storm, wise to resolve and patient to perform. What wondrous conduct in the chief appeared, when the vast fabric of the steed we reared. Some demon, some demon, anxious for the Trojan doom, urged you with great Diophibus come, to explore the fraud, 
with guile opposed to guile. Slow, paced, th slow pacing thrice around the insidious pile, each noted leader's name you thrice invoke, your accents varying as their spouses spoke. The pleasing sounds each latent, latent warrior warmed, but most tidies, and my heart and my heart alarmed to quit the steed we both impatient press, threatening to answer from the dark recess. Unmoved the mind of Ithacus remained, and the vain ardors of our love restrained. But, Antic but Anticlus, unable to control, spoke loud the language of his yearning soul. Ulysses straight with ind indignation fired, for so the common care of Greece required, firm to his lips a forceful hand applied, till on his tongue the fluttering murmurs died. Meanwhile Minerva, from the fraudful horse, back to the court of Priam, bent your course. Inclement fate! Telemachus replies, frail is the boasting, boasted attribute of wise. The leader mingled with the vulgar host is, is in the common mass of, mat, of matter lost. But now let sleep the painful waste repair of sad reflection and corroding care. He ceased, the menial fair that round her weight at, at Helen's beck prepare the room of state. Beneath an ample portico they spread the downy fleece to form the slumbrous bed and o'er soft palls of purple grain unfold, rich tapestry stiff with interwoven gold. Then through the illumined dome to balmy rest, the obsequious herald guides each princely guest, while to his regal bower the king ascends, and beauteous Helen on her lord attends. Soon as the morn in orient purple dressed, unbarred the portal of the roseate, roseate east, the monarch rose, magnificent to view, the imperial mantle o'er his vest he threw, the glittering zone athwart his shoulder cast a starry falcon, low, depending grace. Clasped on his feet the embroidered sandals shine, and forth he moves, majestic and divine. Instant to young Telemachus he pressed, and thus benevolent his speech addressed. Say, royal youth, sincere of soul report, what cause hath led you to the Spartan court? Do public or domestic cares constrain this toilsome voyage or the surgy main? O oh, highly favoured delicate of Jove, replies the prince, inflamed with filial love and anxious hope to hear my parents' doom, a suppliant to your royal court I come. Our sovereign seat elude your serping race, a lawless riot and misrule disgrace, to pampered insolence devoted fall, prime of the flock and choicest of the stall. For wild ambition wings their bold desire, and all to mount the imperial bed aspire. But prostrate I implore, O king, Relate the mournful series of my father's fate, each known disaster of the man disclose, borne by his mother to a world of woes. Recite them, nor in erring pity fear to wound with storied grief the filial ear. If e'er Ulysses to reclaim your right avowed his zeal in council or in fight, if Phrygian camps the friendly toils attest, to the sire's merit give the son's request." Deep from his inmost soul Atrides sighed, and thus, indignant, to the prince replied, Heavens, what a soft and glorious dastard train, an absent hero's nuptial joys profane! So with her young, amid the woodland shades, a timorous hind the lion's court invades, leaves in the fatal lair the, the tender fawns, climb the green cliff, or feed the flowery lawns. Meantime returned with dire remorseless sway, the the monarch savage rends the trembling prey. With equal fury and with equal fame, Ulysses soon shall reassert his claim. O Jove supreme, whom gods and men revere, and thou, to whom tis given to gild the sphere, with power congenial joined, propitious aid the chief adopted by the martial, aid, by, by the martial maid. Such to our wish the warrior soon restore, as when contending on the lesbian shore his prowess philo... Philomelides confessed, and loud acclaiming Greeks the victor blessed, and soon the and soon the invaders of his bed and throne their love presumptuous shall with life atone. With patient ear, O royal youth, attend the storied labors of thy father's friend. Fruitful of deeds, the copious tale is long, but truth severe shall dictate to my tongue. Learn what I heard the sea-born seer relate, whose eye can pierce the dark recess of fate. Long on the Egyptian coast by calms confined, heaven to my fleet refused a prosperous wind. No vows had we preferred, nor victim slain. 
For this the gods, each favoring gale, restrain, jealous to see their high behests obeyed, severe, if men the eternal rights evade. High o'er a gulfy sea, the fairy and isle fronts the deep roar of the disemboing isle, Nile. Her distance from the shore, the course begun, at dawn, and ending with the setting sun, a galley measures, when the stiffer gales rise on the poop and fully, fully stretch the sails. There anchored vessels safe in harbor lie, whilst limpid springs the failing cask supply. And now the twentieth sun, descending, laves his glowing axle on the western waves. Still with expanded sta sails we court in vain, propitious winds to waft us o'er the main. And the pale mariner at once deplores his drooping vigor and exhausted stores. When, lo, a bright cerulean form appears, the fair Eudothea to dispel my fears, Proteus her sire divine. With pity pressed, me soul the daughter of the deep addressed. What time with hunger pined, my absent mates roam the wide isle in search of rural cates, bait the barbed steel, and from the fishy flood appease the afflictive, fierce desire of food. Whither thou art, the azure goddess cries, thy conduct ill deserves the praise of wise. Is death thy choice, or misery thy boast, that here, inglorious on a barren coast, thy brave associates droop a meagre train, with famine pale, and ask thy care in vain? Struck with the, ki with the kind reproach, I straight reply, Whate'er thy title in thy native sky, a goddess sure, for more than mortal grace speaks thee descendant of ethereal race. Deem not that, that here of choice my fleet remains, some heavenly power averse to my stay constrains. O oh, piteous of my fate, vouchsafe to show, for what, sequestered from celestial view, what power becalms this innavigable seas? What guilt provokes him, and what vows appease? I ceased when the affable goddess cried, Observe, and in the truths I speak confide, The oracular seer frequents the Farian coast, From whose high bed my, divine, my birth divine I boast. Proteus, a name tremendous o'er the main, The delegate of Neptune's watery reign, Watch with insidious care his known abode, There fast in chains constrain the various god, Who bound, obedient to superior force, On erring will prescribe your, your destined course. If, studious of your realms, you then demand their state, Since last you left your natal land, Instant the god obsequious will disclose Bright tracts of glory, or a cloud of woes. She ceased, and suppliant thus I made reply, O goddess! On thy aid my hope, my hopes rely. Dictate propitious to my duteous ear what art can captivate the changeful seer. For perilous the assay, unheard the toil, to elude the prescience of a god by guile. Thus to the goddess mild my suit I end. Then she, obedient to my rule, attend. When through the zone of heaven the mounted sun hath journeyed half, and half remains to run, the seer, while Zephyrus curl, the sw while zephyrs curl the, sw the swelling deep, basks on the breezy shore in grateful sleep, his oozy limbs. Emerging from the wave, the foci swift surrounding surround his rocky cave, frequent and full the consecrated train of her whose azure trident awes the main, where wallowing warm the enormous herd exhales an oily steam and taints the noontide, the noontide gales. To that recess, commodious for surprise, when purple light shall next suffuse the skies with me repair, and from thy warrior band three chosen chiefs of dauntless soul command, let their auxiliary force befriend the toil, for strong the god and perfected in guile. Stretched on the shelly shore, he first surveys the flouncing herd ascending from the seas. Their number summed, reposed in sleep profound, the scaly charge their guardian gods surround. So with his battening flocks the careful swain, Abides, pavilioned on the grassy plain, With powers united, obstinately bold, Invade him, couched amid the scaly fold. Instant he wears, elusive of the rape, The mimic force of every savage shape, Or glides with liquid laps a murmuring stream, Or, wrapped in flame, he glows at every limb, Yet still retentive, with redoubled might, Though each vain passive form constrain his flight. But when his native shape resumed, he stands, patient of conquest, and your cause demands, the cause that urged the bold attempt declare, and soothe the vanquished with a victor's prayer. 
the, the bands relaxed, implore the seer to say what God had interdicts the watery way, who, straight propitious in prophetic strain, will teach you to repass the unmeasured main. She ceased, and bounding from the shelfy shore, round the descending nymph the waves resounding roar. High wrapped in wonder at the future deed, with joy, impetu impetuous to the port I speed, the wants of nature with repast suffice, till night with grateful shade involved the skies, and shed ambrosial dews. Fast by the deep, along the tented shore, in balmy sleep, our cares were lost. When o'er the eastern lawn in saffron robes, the daughter of the dawn advanced her rosy steps. Before the bay, due ritual honors to the gods I pay. Then seek the place where seaborne nymph is signed, with three associates of undaunted mind. Arrived to form along the appointed strand for each a bed, she scoops the hilly sand. Then from her azure cave the finny spoils of our four vast foci takes to veil her wiles. Beneath the finny spoils, extended prone, hard toil, the prophet's piercing eyes to shun. New from the course the scaly frauds dif diffuse unsavory stench of oil and brackish ooze. But the bright sea maid's gentle power implored with nectared drops the sickened senses restored. Thus till the sun with travelled thus till the sun had travelled half the skies, ambushed we lie and wait the bold emprise, when thronging quick to bask in open air, the flocks of ocean to the strand repair, couched on the sunny sand, the monsters sleep, then Proteus, mounting from the hoary deep, surveys his charge, unknowing of deceit, in order told we make the sum complete. Pleased with the false review, secure he lies, and leaden slumbers press his drooping eyes. Rushing impetuous forth, we straight prepare a furious onset with the sound of war, and shouting seize the god, our force to evade his various arts he soon resumes in aid. A lion now, he curls a surgy mane, suddenly our hands a spotted par to re restrain, then armed with tusks and lightning in his eyes, a boar's obscener shape the god belies. On spiry volumes there a dragon rides. Here from our strict embrace a stream he glides, and last sublime his stately growth he rears, a tree, and well-dissembled foliage wears. Vain efforts! With superior power compressed, me with reluctance thus the, sp the seer addressed. Say, son of Atreus, say what God inspired this daring fraud, and what the boon desired. I thus... O thou, whose re certain eye foresees the fixed event of fate's remote degree decrees, after long woes and various toil endured, still on this desert isle my fleet is moored, unfriended in the gales. All-knowing say what godhead interdicts the watery way, what vows repentant will the power appease to speed a prosperous voyage o'er the seas? To Jove, with stern regard, the god replies, and all the offended synod of the skies, just hecatombs with due devotion slain, thy guilt absolved, a prosperous voyage gain, to the firm sanction of thy fate attend. An exile thou, nor cheering face of friend, nor sight of natal shore, nor regal dome, shalt yet enjoy, but still art doomed to roam. Once more the Nile, who from the secret source of Job's high seat descend with sweepy force, must view his billows white beneath thy oar and altars blaze along his sanguine shore. Then will the gods with holy pomp adored, to thy long vows a safe return accord. He ceased, heart wounded with afflictive pain, doomed to repeat the perils of the main, a shelfy track and long. O seer, I cry, to the stern sanction of the offended sky, my prompt obedience bows. But deign to say what fate propitious, or what dire dismay sustain those peers, the relics of our host, whom I with Nestor on the Phrygian coast embracing left? Must I the warriors weep, whelmed in the bottom of the monstrous deep? Or did the kind domestic friend deplore the breathless, on, the, the breathless heroes on their native shore? Press not too far, replied the god, but cease to know what, no, known, will violate thy peace. Too curious of their doom, with friendly woe thy breast will heave, and tears eternal flow. Part live, the rest, a lamentable train, range the dark bounds of Pluto's dreary, dreary reign. Two foremost on the rolls of Mars renowned, whose arms with conquest in thy cause were crowned, fell by disastrous fate, by tempests tossed, a third lives wretched, 
on a distant coast. By Neptune rescued from Minerva's hate, on Graia, safe Olean Ajax state, his ship overwhelmed. But, frowning on the floods, impious he roared defiance to the gods. To his own prowess all the glory gave, the power defrauding who vouchsafed to save. This heard the raging ruler of the main, his spear indignant for such high disdain. He launched, dividing with his forky mace the aerial summit from the marble base. The rock rushed seaward with impetuous roar, engulfing, and to the abyss the boaster bore. By Juno's guardian aid, the watery vast, secure of storms, your royal brother passed, till, coasting nigh the cape where, Mal where Malai shrouds her spiry cliffs amid surrounding, the clou surrounding clouds, a whirling gust tumultuous from the shore, across the deep his laboring vessel bore. In an ill-fated hour the coast he gained, where late in regal pop Thaestes reigned. But when his hoary honors bowed to fate, Aegisthus governed in paternal state. The surges now subside, the tempest ends. From his tall ship the king of men descends, where fondly thinks the gods concluded his toil. Far from his own domain salutes the soil. With raptures oft the verge of Greece reviews, and the dear turf with tears of joy bedews. Him thus exulting on the distant strand, a spy distinguished from his airy stand, to bribe whose vigilance Aegisthus told a mighty sum of ill-persuading gold. There watched this guardian of his guilty fear. There watched the guard this guardian of his guilty fear till the twelfth moon had wheeled her pale career, and now admonished by his eye to court, with terror winged conveys the dread report of deathful arts expert. His lord employs the ministers of blood in dark surprise, and twentieth youths in radiant mail encased. Close ambushed nigh the spacious hall he placed, then bids prepare the, hospi the hospitable treat. Vain shows of love to, f to veil his felon hate. To grace the victor's welcome from the wars, a train of coursers and triumphant cars. Magnificent he leads, the royal guest, thoughtless of ill, accepts the fraudulent feast. The troops, forth issuing from the dark recess, with homicidal rage the king oppress. So whilst he feeds luxurious in the stall, the sovereign of the herd is doomed to fall. The partners of his fame and toils at Troy, around their lord a mighty ruin lie. Mixed with the brave, the base invaders bleed, against this soul survivors, soul survives to boast the deed. He said, Chill horrors shook my shivering soul, racked with convulsive pangs in dust I roll, and hate in madness of extreme despair to view the sun or breathe the vital air. But when, superior to the rage of woe, I stood, restored, and tears had ceased to flow, lenient of grief, the pitying God began, Forget the brother, and resume the man, to fate's supreme dispose the dead resign, that care be fate's a speedy passage thine. Still lives the wretch who wrought the death deplore, but lives a victim for thy vengeful sword. Unless the filial rage Orestes glow and swift prevent, the mediated blow, you timely will return a welcome guest, with him to share the sad funeral feast. He said, New thoughts my beating heart employ, my gloomy soul receives a gleam of joy. Fair hope revives, and eager I address the prescient godhead to reveal the rest. The doom decreed of those disastrous two I've heard with pain, but oh, the tale pursue, what third brave son of Mars, the fates constrained to roam the howling desert of the main or in eternal shade, if cold he lies, provoke new sorrows from these grateful eyes. That chief, rejoined the god, his race derives from Ithaca, and wondrous woe survives. Laertes' son, girt with circumfluous tides, he still calamitous constraint abides. Him in Calypso's cave of late I viewed, when streaming grief his, his faded cheeks bedewed, but vain his prayer, his arts are vain to move the enamored goddess or elude her love. His vessel sunk, a dear and dear companions lost, he lives reluctant on a foreign coast. But, oh, beloved by heaven, reserve to thee a happier lot the smiling fate's decree. Free from that law, beneath whose mortal sway matter is changed, and varying forms decay, Elysium shall be thine, the blissful plains of utmost earth, where Radamanthus reigns, joys ever young, Unmixed with pain or fear, 
fill the wide circle of that eternal year. Stern winter smiles on that auspicious clime, the fields are florid with unfading prime. From the bleak pole no wind's inclement blow, mound the round hail or flake the fleecy snow. But from the breezy deep the, the blessed inhale, the fragrant murmurs of the western gale, this grace, particular will the gods afford, to thee the son of Jove, and beauteous Helen's lord. He ceased, and plunging in the vast profound, beneath the god the whirling billows, the, the whirling billows bound. Then speeding back, involved in various thought, my friends attended at the shore I sought. Arriving, arriving, the rage of hunger we control, till night with silent shade invests the pole. Then lose the cares of life in pleasing rest. As soon as the morn reveals the roseate east, with, with sails we meet the masts, our anchors weigh, unmoor the fleet and rush into the sea. Ranging on the banks beneath our equal oars, white curl the waves, and the vexed ocean roars. Then, steering backward from the Farian isle, we gain the stream of Jove-descended Nile. There quit the ships, and on the destined shore, with ritual hecatombs the gods adore. Their wrath atoned, to Agamemnon's name a cenotaph I raise of deathless fame. These rites to piety and grief discharged, the friendly gods, a springing gale enlarged. The fleet, swift tilting o'er the surges, flew, till Grecian cliffs appeared a blessed view. Thy patient ear hath heard me long relate a story fruitful of disastrous fate. And now, young prince, indulge my fond, fond request. Be Sparta honored with his royal guest, till, from his eastern goal, the joyous sun, his twelfth diurnal race begins to run. Meanwhile my train the friendly gifts prepare, th th three sprightly coursers and a polished car, with these a goblet of capacious mold, figured with art t to dignify the gods, formed for libation to the gods, shall prove a pledge and monument of sacred love. My quick return, young Ithacus rejoined, damps the warm wishes of my raptured mind. Did not my fate my needful haste constrain, charmed by your speech so grateful, graceful and humane? Lost in delight the circling year would roll, while deep attention fixed my listening soul. But now to pile, permit my destined way, my loved associates chide my long delay. In dear remembrance of your royal grace, I take the present of the promised vase. The coursers for the champagne sports retain, that gift our barren rocks will render vain. Horrid with cliffs our meager land allows, thin herbage for the mountain goat to browse. But neither mead nor plain supplies to feed the sprightly courser or indulge his speed. The sea-surrounded realms the gods assign, small tracts of fertile lawn, the least to mine. His hand the king with tender passion pressed, and smiling thus the royal youth addressed. O early worth, a soul so wise and young, proclaims you from the sage Ulysses sprung. Selected from my stores of matchless price, an urn sh shall recompass your prudent choice. Not mean the massy mould of silver graced by Vulcan's art, the verge with gold encased. A pledge the subdued power of Sidon grave, when to his realm I ploughed the orient wave. Thus they alternate, while with artful care the menial train the regal feast prepare. The firstlings of the flock are doomed to die, rich fragrant wines the cheering bowl supply. A female band the gift of Ceres bring, and, and the gilt roofs with genial triumph ring. Meanwhile, in Ithaca, the suitor powers in active games divide their jovial hours. In areas varied with mosaic art, some whirl the disc and some the javelin dart. Aside, sequestered from the vast resort, Antinous sate spec spectator of the sport, with great Eurymachus of worth confessed and high descent superior to the rest, and whom young Naomine lowly thus addressed. My ship equipped within the neighboring port, the prince deporting for the for the Pylian court, requested for his speed, but courteous say, when steers he home, or why this long delay? For Ellis I should sail with utmost speed, to import twelve mares, which there luxurious feed, and twelve young mule, mules, a strong laborious race, new to the plough, unpractised in the trace. Unknowing of the course to pile designed, a sudden horror seized in either mind, 
the prince in rural bower they fondly thought, numbering his flocks and herds, not far remote. Relate, Antinous cries, devoid of guile, when spread the prince his sail for distant pile. Did chosen chiefs across the gulfy main attend his voyage, or domestic train? Spontaneous did you speed his secret course, or was the vessel seized by fraud or force? With willing duty, not reluctant mind, Naoman cried. The vessel was resigned. The vessel was resigned. Who in the balance, with the great affairs of courts, presumed to weigh their private cares? With him the peerage next in power to you, and mentor, captain of the lordly crew, or some celestial in his reverend, reverend, for, reverend form, safe from the secret rock and adverse storm, pilots, f pilots the course. For when the glimmering ray of yester dawn disclosed the tender day, mentor himself I saw, and much admired. Then ceased the youth, the youth, and from the court retired. Confounded and appalled, the unfinished game, the suitors quit, and all to council came. Antinous first, the assembled peers addressed, Rage sparkled in his eyes and burned in his breast. O oh, shamed manhood, shall one daring boy the scheme of all our happiness destroy? Fly unperceived, seducing half the flower of nobles, and invite a foreign power? The ponderous engine raised to crush us all, recoiling on his head is sure to fall. Instant prepare me, on the neighboring strand, with twenty chosen mates, a vessel manned, for ambushed close beneath the Samian shore, his ship returning shall my spies explore. He soon his rashness shall with life atone, seek for his father's fate, but find his own. With vast applause the sentence all approve, then rise into the feastful hall remove. Swift to the queen the herald Medon ran, who heard the consult of the dire divan. Before her dome the royal matron stands, and thus the message of his haste demands. What will the suitors? Must my servant train the allotted labors of the day refrain? For, th for them to form some exquisite repast, heaven grant this, this festival may prove their last. Or if they still must live, from me remove the double plague of luxury and love. Forbear, ye sons of insolence, forbear, in riot to consume a wretched air. In the young soul illustrious thought to raise, were ye not tutored with Ulysses' praise? Have not your fathers oft my lord defined, gentle of speech, beneficent of mind? Some kings with arbitrary rage devour, or in their tyrant minions vest the power. Ulysses let no partial favors fall. The, pres the people's parent he protected all, but absent now perfidious and ingrate, his stores he ravage and usurp his state. He thus. Oh, were the words you speak the worst, they formed a deed more odious and accursed, more dreadful than your boding soul divines. But pitying Jove avert the dire designs. The darling object of your royal care is marked to perish in a deathful snare, before he anchors in his native port, from pile resailing in the Spartan court. Horrid to speak, an ambush is decreed, the hope and heir of Ithaca to bleed. Sudden she sank beneath the weighty woes, the vital streams a chilling horror froze. A big round tear stands trembling in her eye, and on her tongue imperfect accents die. At length, in tender language interwove with sighs, she thus expressed her anxious love. Why rashly would my son his fate explore, ride the wild waves and quit the safer shore? Did he, with all the greatly wretched, crave a blank oblivion and untimely grave? Tis not, replied the sage, to Medon given to know, if some inhabitant of heaven in his young breast the daring thought inspired, or if, alone with filial duty fired, the winds and waves he tempts in early bloom, studious to learn his absent father's doom. The sage retired. Unable to control the mighty griefs that swell her laboring soul, rolling convulsive on the, f on the floor is seen the piteous obje object of a prostrate queen. Words to her dumb compliant a pause, supplies, and breath to waste in unavailing cries, around their sovereigns wept the menial fair, to whom she thus addressed her deep despair. Behold, a wretch whom all the gods consigned to woe, did ever sorrows equal mine? Long to my joys my dearest lord is lost, his country's buckler, and the Grecian boast. Now from my fond embrace by tempests born, our other column of the state is born. Nor take a kind adieu, nor sought consent, unkind confederates in his dire intent. Ill suits it with your shows of duteous zeal, from me the purposed voyage to conceal. 
Though at the solemn midnight hour he rose, why did you fear to trouble my repose? He either had obeyed my fond desire, or seen his mother pierced with grief expire. Bid Dolius quick attend the faithful slave, whom to my nuptial train Icar Icarius gave, to tend the fruit groves. With incessant speed he shall this violence of death decreed to good Laertes tell. <clears throat> Experienced age may timely intercept the ruffian rage, convene the tribes the murder murderous plot reveal, and to their power to save his, his race appeal. Then Eurycleia, thus. My dearest dread, to the sword I bow this hoary head, or if a dungeon be the pain decreased, I own my, me conscious of this unpleasing deed. Auxiliar to his flights my aid implored, with wine and with wine and viands I the vessel stored, a solemn oath, and imposed the secret sealed, till the twelfth dawn the light of heaven revealed. Dreading the effects of a fond mother's fear, he dared not violate your royal ear, but bathe, and in imperial robes arrayed, pay due devotions to the martial maid, and rest affianced in her guardian aid. Send not to good Laertes, nor engage in toils of state the miseries of age. Tis impious to surmise the powers divine, to ruin doom the Jove-descended line. Long shall the race of Arcasius reign, and isles remote enlarged his old, his old domain. The queen her speech with calm attention hears, her eyes restrain the silver-streaming tears. She bathes, and robed the sacred dome ascends. Her pious speeds a female train attends. The salted cakes and canisters are laid, and thus the queen invokes Minerva's aid. Daughter divine of Jove, whose arm can wield the avenging bolt and shake the dreadful shield, if e'er Ulysses to thy fane preferred the best and choicest of his flock and herd, hear, goddess, hear by the, those oblations won, and for the pious sire preserve the son. His wished return with happy power befriend, and on the suitors let thy wrath descend. She ceased, shrill ecstasies of, joys, of joy declare, the favoring goddess present to the prayer. The suitors heard and deemed the mirthful choice a signal of her hymeneal choice, whilst mo one most the jovial thus accost the board. Too late the queen selects a second lord, an evil hour the nuptial rite in intends, when o'er her son disastrous death impends. Thus he, unskilled of what the fa fates provide, but with severe rebuke Antinous cried, These empty vaunts will make the voyage vain, alarm not with discourse the menial train, the great event with silent hope attend, our deeds alone our counsel must commend. His speech thus ended, short, he frowning rose, and twenty chiefs f renowned for valor chose. Down to the strand he speeds with haughty strides, where anchored in the bay the vessel rides replete with mail and military store, and all her tackle trim to quit the shore. The desperate crowd crew ascend, unfurls, unfurl the sails. The seaward prow invites the tardy gales. Then take repast, till Hesperus displayed his golden circlet in the western shade. Meantime the queen, without reflection due, heart wounded, to the bed of state withdrew. In her sad breast the prince's fortunes roll, and hope and doubt alternate seize her soul. So when the woodman's toil her cave surrounds, and when the hunter's cry the grove resounds, with grief and rage the mother lion stung, fearless herself, yet trembles for her young, while pensive in the silent slumberous shade, sleeps gentle powers her drooping eyes invade. Minerva lifelike, on embodied air, impressed the form of Imthema the fair, Icarius' daughter she, whose blooming charms allured, uh, Eumaeus to her virgin arms, a sceptred lord, who o'er the fruitful plain of Thessaly wide stretched his ample reign. As Pallas willed, along the sable skies, to calm the queen, the phantom sister flies. Swift on the regal dome, descending right, the bolts and valves are pervious to her flight. Close to her head the pleasing vision stands, and thus performs Minerva's high commands. O oh, why, Penelope, this causeless fear to render sleep's soft blessing unsincere, alike devote to, to sorrow's dire extreme, the day reflection and the midnight dream, thy son the gods propitious will restore, and bid thee cease his absence to deplore. To whom the queen, whilst yet her pensive mind was in the silent gates of sleep confined, 
O sister, to my soul for ever dear, why this first visit to reprove my fear? How in a realm so distant should you now, from what deep source my ceaseless sorrows flow? To all my hope my royal lord is lost, his country's buckler in the Grecian coast, and, with consummate woe to weigh me down, the heir of all his honors and his crown, my darling son is fled, an easy prey to the fierce storms, or men more fierce than they, who in, league, in a league of blood associates sworn will interswept the unwary youth's return. Courage resume, the shadowy form replied, and the protecting care of heaven confide. On him attend the blue-eyed martial maid. What earthly... What earthly can implore a surer aid? Me now the guardian goddess deigns to send, to bid thee patient his return attend. The queen replies, If in the blessed abodes a goddess thou hast commerce with the gods, say, breathes my lord the blissful realm of light, or lies he wrapped in ever-during night? Incure, inquire not of his doom, the phantom cries. I speak not all the counsel of the skies, nor must indulge with, with vain discourse or long the windy satisfactions of the tongue. Swift through the valves the visionary fair repassed, and viewless mixed with common air, the queen awakes, delivered of her woes, with florid joy her heart dilated glows. The vision, manifest of future fate, makes her with hope her son's arrival wait. Meantime the suitors plough the watery plain, Telemachus in thought already slain, when sight of lessening Ithaca was lost, their sail directed for the Samian coast. A small but verdant isle appeared in view, and Asteres the advancing pilot knew, an ample port the rocks projected form, to break the rolling waves and ruffling storm. That safe recess they gain with, with happy speed, and in close ambush wait the murderous deed. Thus concludes Book 4. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Carson Spratt, and I'm going to read to you from Book 5 of the Odyssey today. Now dawn rose from her bed, where she lay by haughty Tithonos, carrying light to the immortal gods and to mortals. And the gods came and took their places in session, and among them Zeus, who thunders on high, and it is his power that is greatest. And Athena spoke to them of the many cares of Odysseus, remembering. Though he was in the nymph's house, she still thought of him. Father Zeus, and all other blessed gods everlasting, no longer now let one who is a sceptered king be eager to be gentle and kind, be one whose thought is schooled in justice, but let him always rather be harsh and act severely, seeing the way no one of the people he was lord over remembers God like Odysseus, and he was kind, like a father. But now he lies away on an island suffering strong pains in the palace of the nymph Calypso, and she detains him by constraint. He cannot make his way to his country, for he has not any ships by him, nor any companions who can convey him back across the sea's wide ridges. And now there are those who are determined to murder his dear son on his way home. He went in quest of news of his father to Pylos the Sacrosanct, and a glorious Lacedaemon. Then in turn Zeus, who gathers the clouds, made answer, My child, what sort of word has escaped your teeth barrier? For is not this your own intention, as you have counseled it, how it is he shall make his way back and punish those others? Then bring Telemachus home skillfully, since you can do this, so that all without harm he can come back to his own country, while the suitors in their ship come back with nothing accomplished. He spoke, and then spoke directly to his beloved son Hermes. Hermes, since for other things also you are our messenger, announce to the nymph with the lovely hair our absolute purpose the homecoming of enduring Odysseus, that he shall come back by the convoy neither of the gods nor of mortal people, but he shall sail on a jointed raft, and, suffering hardships, on the twentieth day make his landfall on fertile Shiria, at the country of the Phaeacians, who are near the gods in origin, and they will honor him in their hearts as a god, and send him back by ship to the beloved land of his fathers, bestowing bronze and gold in abundance upon him, and clothing, more than Odysseus could ever have taken away from Troy, even if he had escaped unharmed with his fair share of the plunder. For so it is fated that he shall see his people and come back to his house with the high roof and to the land of his fathers. <clears throat> he spoke, nor disobeyed him the courier Argiophontes. Immediately he bound upon his feet the fair sandals, golden and immortal, 
that carried him over the water as over the dry, boundless earth abreast of the wind's blast. He caught up the staff with which he mazes the eyes of those mortals whose eyes he would maze, or wakes again the sleepers. Holding this in his hand, strong Argiophontes winged his way onward. He stood on Pyria and launched himself from the bright air across the sea and sped the wave tops like a sheer water who along the deadly deep ways of the barren salt sea goes hunting fish and sprays quick beating wings in the salt brine. In such a likeness, Hermes rode over much tossing water. But after he had made his way to the far lying island, he stepped then out of the dark blue sea and walked on over the dry land till he came to the great cave where the lovely haired nymph was at home and he found that she was inside. There was a great fire blazing on the hearth, and the smell of cedar split in billets, and sweet wood burning spread all over the island. She was singing inside the cave with a sweet voice as she went up and down the loom and wove with a golden shuttle. There was a growth of grove around the cavern, flourishing. Alder was there, and the black poplar, and fragrant cypress, and there were birds with spreading wings who made their nests in it, little owls and hawks, and birds of the sea with long beaks who are like ravens, but all their work is on the sea water. And right about the hollow cavern extended a flourishing growth of vine that ripened with grape clusters. Next to it there were four fountains, and each of them ran shining water, each next to each, but turned to run in sundry directions. And round about there were meadows growing soft with parsley and violets, and even a god who came into that place would have admired what he saw, the heart delighted within him. There the courier Argiophontes stood and admired it. And after he had admired all in his heart, he went into the wide cave. Nor did the shining goddess Calypso fail to recognize him when he saw him come into her presence. For the immortal gods are not such as to go unrecognized by one another, not even if one lives in a far home. But Hermes did not find great-hearted Odysseus indoors, but he was sitting out on the beach, crying, as before now he had done, breaking his heart in tears, lamentation and sorrow, as weeping tears, he looked out over the barren water. But Calypso, shining among goddesses, questioned Hermes when she had seated him on a chair that shone and glittered. How is it, Hermes, of the golden staff, you have come to me? I honor you and love you, but you have not come much before this. Speak what is in your mind. My heart is urgent to do it if I can, and if it is a thing that can be accomplished. But come in with me, so I can put entertainment before you. So the goddess spoke, and she set before him a table which she had filled with ambrosia and mixed red nectar for him. The courier, Hermes Argiophontes, ate and drank them, but when he had dined and satisfied his hunger with eating, then he began to speak, answering what she had asked him. You, a goddess, ask me, a god, why I came, and therefore I will tell you the whole truth of the tale. It is you who ask me. It was Zeus who told me to come here. I did not wish to. Who would willingly make the run across this endless salt water? And there is no city of men nearby, nor people who offer choice hecatombs to the gods and perform sacrifice. But there is no other way for any god to elude the purpose of Aegis bearing Zeus or bring it to nothing. He says you have with you the man who is wretched beyond all the other men of all those who fought round the city of Priam for nine years. And in the tenth they sacked the city and set sail for home. But on the voyage home they offended Athena who let loose an evil tempest and tall waves against them. Then all the rest of his excellent companions perished, but the wind and the current carried him here, and here they drove him. Now Zeus tells you to send him on his way with all speed. It is not appointed for him to die here, away from his people. It is still his fate that he shall see his people and come back to his house with the high roof and to the land of his fathers. So he spoke, and Calypso, shining among divinities, shuddered and answered him in winged words, and addressed him. You are hard-hearted, you gods, and jealous beyond all creatures beside, when you are resentful toward the goddesses for sleeping openly with such men as each has made her true husband. So when Dawn of the Rosy Fingers chose out Orion, all you gods who live at your ease were full of resentment, until chaste Artemis of the Golden Throne in Ortigia came with a visitation of painless arrows and killed him. And so it was when Demeter of the Lovely Hair yielding to her desire, lay down with Iasion, and loved him in a thrice-turned field. It was not long before this was made known to Zeus, who struck him down with a cast of the shining thunderbolt. So now, you gods, you resent it in me that I keep beside me a man 
the one I saved when he clung astride of the keelboard all alone, since Zeus, with a cast of the Shining Thunderbolt, had shattered his ship, fast ship midway on the wine-blue water. Then all the rest of his excellent companions perished. But the wind of the current carried him here, and here they drove him, and I gave him my love and cherished him. And I had hopes also that I could make him immortal and all his days to be endless. But since there is no way for another god to elude the purpose of Aegis bearing Zeus or bring it to nothing, let him go. Let him go if he himself is asking for this and desires it out on the barren sea. But I will not give him conveyance, for I have not any ships by me, nor any companions who can convey him back across the sea's wide ridges. But I will freely give him my counsel and hold back nothing, so that all without harm he can come back to his own country. Then in turn the courier Argiophontes answered her, then send him accordingly on his way, and beware of the anger of Zeus, lest he hold a grudge hereafter and rage against you. So spoke powerful Argiophontes, and there he left her, while she, the queenly nymph, when she had been given the message from Zeus, set out searching after great-hearted Odysseus, and found him sitting on the seashore. And his eyes were never wiped dry of tears, and the sweet lifetime was draining out of him, as he wept for a way home, since the nymph was no longer pleasing to him. By nights he would lie beside her of necessity in the hollow caverns against his will, by one who was willing. But all the days he would sit upon the rocks at the seaside, breaking his heart in tears and lamentation and sorrow, as, weeping tears, he looked out over the barren water. She, bright among divinities, stood near and spoke to him. Poor man, no longer mourn here beside me, nor let your lifetime fade away, since now I will send you on with a good will. So come, cut long timbers with a bronze axe, and join them to make a wide raft, and fashion decks that will be on the upper side to carry you over the misty face of the water. Then I will stow aboard her bread and water and ruddy wine, strength-giving goods that will keep the hunger from you, and put clothing on you, and send a following stern wind after, so that all without harm you can come back to your own country, if only the gods consent. It is they who hold wide heaven, they are more powerful than I to devise and accomplish. So she spoke to him, but long-suffering great Odysseus shuddered to hear and spoke again in turn and addressed her. Here is some other thing you devise, O goddess. It is not conveyance when you tell me to cross the sea's great open space on a raft. That is dangerous and hard. Not even balanced ships rejoicing in a wind from Zeus cross over. I will not go aboard any raft without your good will, not unless, goddess, you can bring yourself to swear me a great oath that this is not some painful trial you are planning against me. So he spoke, and Calypso, shining among divinities, smiled and stroked him with her hand and spoke to him and named him. You are so naughty, and you will have your own way in all things. See how you have spoken to me and reason with me. The earth be my witness in this, and the wide heaven above us, and the dripping water of the Styx, which oath is the biggest and most formidable oath among the blessed immortals, that this is no other painful trial I am planning against you, but I am thinking and planning for you just as I would do it for my own self, if such needs as yours were to come upon me. For the mind in me is reasonable, and I have no spirit of iron inside my heart. Rather, it is compassionate. So she spoke, a shining goddess, and led the way swiftly, and the man followed behind her, walking in the god's footsteps. They made their way, the man and the god, to the hollow cavern, and he seated himself upon the chair from which Hermes lately had risen, while the nymph set all manner of food before him to eat and drink, such things as mortal people feed upon. She herself sat across the table from godlike Odysseus, and her serving maids set nectar and ambrosia before her. They put their hands to the good things that lay ready before them, but after they had taken their pleasure in eating and drinking, the talking was begun by the shining goddess Calypso. Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, are you still all so eager to go on back to your own house in the land of your fathers? I wish you well, however you do it, but if you only knew in your heart how many hardships you were fated to undergo before getting back to your country, you would stay here with me and be the lord of this household and be an immortal, for all your longing once more to look on that wife for whom you are pining all your days here. And yet, I think that I can claim I am not her inferior, either in build or stature, since it is not likely that mortal women can challenge the goddesses for build and beauty. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered her, Goddess and queen, do not be angry with me. 
I myself know that all you say is true, and that circumspect Penelope can never match the impression you make for beauty and stature. She is mortal, after all, and you are immortal and ageless. But even so, what I want and all my days I pine for is to go back to my house and see my day of homecoming. And if some god batters me far out on the wine-blue water, I will endure it, keeping a stubborn spirit inside me, for I already have suffered much and done much hard work on the waves and in the fighting. So let this adventure follow. So he spoke, and the sun went down and the darkness came over. These two, withdrawn in the inner recess of the hollowed cavern, enjoyed themselves in love, and stayed all night by each other. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, Odysseus wrapped himself in an outer cloak and a tunic, while she, the nymph, mantled herself in a gleaming white robe, fine woven and delightful, and around her waist she fastened a handsome belt of gold, and on her head was a wimple. She set about planning the journey for great-hearted Odysseus. She gave him a great axe that was fitted to his palms and headed with bronze, with a double edge each way, and fitted inside it a very beautiful handle of olive wood, well hafted. Then she gave him a well-finished adze, and led the way onward to the far end of the island where there were trees, tall-grown, alder and black poplar and fir that towered to the heaven, but all gone dry long ago and dead, so they would float lightly. But when she had shown him where the tall trees grew, Calypso, shining among divinities, went back to her own house while he turned to cutting his timbers and quickly had his work finished. He threw down twenty in all and trimmed them well with his bronze axe and planed them expertly and trued them straight to a chalk line. Calypso, the shining goddess, at that time came back, bringing him an auger, and, she, and, and he bored through them all and pinned them together with dowels, and then with cords he lashed his raft together. And as great as is the bottom of a broad cargo-carrying ship, when a man well-skilled in carpentry fashions it, such was the size of the broad raft made for himself by Odysseus. Next, setting up the deck boards and fitting them to close uprights, he worked them on, and closed in the ends with sweeping gunnels. Then he fashioned the mast with an upper deck fitted to it, and made in addition a steering oar by which to direct her, and fenced her in down the whole length with wattles of osier to keep the water up, and expended much timber upon this. Next, Calypso, the shining goddess, brought out the sailcloth to make the sails with, and he carefully worked these also and attached the straps and halyards and sheets all in place aboard her, and then with levers worked her down to the bright salt water. It was the fourth day, and all his work was finished. Then on the fifth day, Shining Calypso saw him off from the island, when she had bathed him and put fragrant clothing upon him. And the goddess put two skins aboard, one filled with dark wine, and the other, the big one, filled with water, and put on provisions in a bag, and stored there many good things to keep a man's strength up and sent a following wind to carry him, warm and easy. Glorious Odysseus, happy with the wind, spread sails, and taking his seat artfully with the steering oar, he held her. Or he held her on her course, nor did, ever, nor did sleep ever descend on his eyelids, as he kept his eye on the Pleiades, and late-setting Bootes, and the bear, to whom men give also the name of the wagon, who turns about in a fixed place and looks on Orion, and she alone is never plunged in the wash of the ocean. For so Calypso, bright among goddesses, had told him to make his way over the sea, keeping the bear on his left hand. Seventeen days he sailed, making his way over the water, and on the eighteenth day there showed the shadowy mountains of the Phaeacian land where it stood out nearest to him, and it looked like a shield lying on the faint, misty face of the water. Coming back from the Ethiopians, the strong earthshaker saw him from far on the mountains of the Solimoi. He was visible sailing over the sea. Poseidon was the more angered with him and shook his head and spoke to his own spirit. <clears throat> For shame! Surely the gods have rashly changed their intentions about Odysseus while I was away in the Ethiopian's land, and he nears the Phaeacian country where it is appointed that he shall escape this great trial of misery that is now his. <clears throat> But I think I can still give him a good full portion of trouble. He spoke and pulled the clouds together, and both hands gripping the trident, and staggered the sea and let loose all the storm blasts of all the winds together, 
and huddled under the cloud scuds land alike in the great water. Night sprang from heaven. East wind and south wind clashed together, and the bitter blown west wind and the north wind, uh, born in the bright air, rolled up a heavy sea. The knees of Odysseus gave way for fear and the heart inside him, and deeply troubled, he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit. Ah, me unhappy, what in the long outcome will befall me? I fear the goddess might have spoken the truth in all ways when she said that on the sea and before I came to my country I would go through hardships. Now all this is being accomplished. Such clouds are these, with which Zeus is cramming the wide sky and has staggered the sea, and storm blasts of winds from every direction are crowding in. My sheer destruction is certain. Three times and four times happy those Danaans were who died then in the wide Troy land, bringing favor to the sons of Atreus. So I wish I too had died at that time and met my destiny on the day when the greatest number of Trojans threw their bronze-headed weapons upon me over the body of perished Achilles, and I would have had my rights and the Achaeans given me glory. Now it is by a dismal death that I must be taken. As he spoke so, a great wave do drove down from above him with a horrible rush and spun the raft in a circle, and he was thrown clear far from the raft and let the steering oars slip from his hands. A terrible gust of storm winds whirling together and the and blowing snapped the mast tree off in the middle and the sail and the upper deck were thrown far and fell in the water he himself was docked for a long time nor was he able to come up quickly from under the great rush of the water for the clothing which divine calypso had given weighted him down at last he got to the surface and spat the bitter salt sea water that drained from his head which was filled with it but he did not forget about his raft for all his trouble but turned and swam back through the waves and laid hold of it, and huddled down in the middle of it, avoiding death's end. Then the waves tossed her about the current, now here, now there, as the north wind in autumn tumbles and tosses thistle down along the plain, and the, brand and the bunches hold fast one on another. So the winds tossed her on the great sea, now here, now there, now it would be south wind and north that pushed her between them, and then again east wind and west would burst in and follow. The daughter of Cadmus, sweet-stepping Ino, called Leucothea, saw him. She had once been one who spoke as a mortal, but now in the gulfs of the sea she holds degree as a goddess. She took pity on Odysseus as he drifted and suffered hardship, and, likening herself to a winged gannet, she came up out of the water and perched on the raft and spoke a word to him. Poor man, why is Poseidon, the shaker of the earth, so bitterly cankered against you to give you such a harvest of evils? and yet he will not do away with you for all his anger. But do as I say, since you seem to me not lacking in good sense. Take off these clothes and leave the raft to drift at the wind's will, and then strike out and swim with your hands and make for a landfall on the Phaeacian country, where your escape is destined. And here, take this veil, it is immortal, and fasten it under your chest, and there is no need for you to die nor to suffer. But when with both your hands you have taken hold of the mainland, untie the veil and throw it out in the wine blue water far from the land and turn your face away as you do so so spoke the goddess and handed him the veil then herself in the likeness of a gannet slipped back into the heaving sea and the dark and tossing water closed above her now long-suffering great odysseus pondered two courses and troubled he spoke then to his own great-hearted spirit ah me which of the immortals is weaving deception against me and tells me to put off from the raft? But no, I will not do it yet, since I have seen with my own eyes that the shore, where she said I could escape, is still far from me. But here is what I will do, and this seems to me the best way. As long as the timbers hold together and the construction remains, I will stay with it and endure through suffering hardships. But once the heaving sea has shaken my raft to pieces, then I will swim. There is nothing better that I can think of. Now, as he was pondering these ways in his heart and spirit, Poseidon, shaker of the earth, drove on a great wave that was terrible and rough on him. And as when the wind blows hard on a dry pile of chaff and scatters it abroad in every direction, so the raft's long timbers were scattered. But now Odysseus sat astride one beam, like a man riding on horseback, and stripped off the clothing which the divine Calypso had given him and rapidly tied the veil of Aino around his chest, then threw himself headfirst in the water, with his, and with his arms spread, stroked as hard as he could. The strong earth-shaker saw him swimming, 
and shook his head and spoke to his own spirit. There now, drift on the open sea, suffering much trouble, until you come among certain people who are the gods, fosterlings. Even so, I hope you will not complain that I stinted your hardships. So he spoke and laid the lash on his fair maned horses and made his way to Agai, where he has his fabulous palace. But now Athena, daughter of Zeus, planned what was to follow. She fastened down the courses of all the rest of the storm winds and told them all to go to sleep now and to give over, but stirred a hastening north wind and broke down the seas before him until Zeus sprung Odysseus, escaping death and the spirits of death, might join the company of oar-loving Phaeacians. Then he was driven two nights and two days on the heavy seas, and many times his heart foresaw destruction. But when dawn with the lovely hair had brought the third morning, then at last the gale went down and windless weather came on. And now he saw the land lying very close to him as he took a sharp look, left it high on the top of a great wave. And as welcome as the show of life again in a father is to his children, when he is laying sick, suffering strong pains, and wasting long away, and the hateful death spirit has brushed him. But then, and it is welcome, the gods set him free of his sickness. So welcome appeared land and forest now to Odysseus, and he swam, pressing on, so as to set foot on the mainland. But when he was as far away as a voice can carry, he heard the thumping of the sea on the jagged rock teeth. For a big surf, terribly sucked up from the main, was crashing on the dry land. All was mantled in salt spray, and there were no harbors to hold ships, no roadsteads for them to ride in, but promontories out thrust in ragged rock teeth and boulders. The knees of Odysseus gave way for fear, and the heart inside him, and deeply troubled, he spoke, again, he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit, Ah me, now that Zeus has granted a sight of unhoped-for land, and now I have made the crossing of this great distance. I see no way for me to get out of the gray sea water, for on the outer side are sharp rocks, and the surf about them breaks and roars, and the sheer of the cliff runs up above them, and the sea is deep close in shore, so that there is no place to stand bracing on both my feet, and so avoid trouble. I fear that as I climb out, a great wave will catch me and throw me against the stony cliff. That will be a pitiful landing. Yet if I try to swim on along in hope of finding beaches that slant against the waves or harbors for shelter from the sea, I fear that once again the whirlwind will snatch me and carry me out on the sea where the fish swarm, groaning heavily, or else the divinity from the deep will let loose against me a sea monster of whom Amphitrite keeps so many, for I know how bitterly the renowned Earthshaker hates me. Now as he was pondering this in his heart and spirit, meanwhile... A great wave carried him against the rough rock face, and there his skin would have been taking off, taken off, his bones crushed together, had not the grey-eyed goddess Athena sent him an inkling, and he frantically caught hold with both hands on the rock face and clung to it, groaning until the great wave went over. This one he so escaped, but the backwash of the same wave caught him where he clung and threw him far out in the open water. And as when an octopus is dragged away from its shelter, the thickly clustered pebbles stick in the cups of the tentacles, so in contact with the rock, the skin from his bold hands was torn away. Now the great sea covered him over, and Odysseus would have perished, wretched, beyond his destiny, had not the grey-eyed goddess Athena given him forethought. He got clear of the surf, where it sucks against the land, and swam on along, looking always toward the shore in the hope of finding beaches that slanted against the waves, or harbors for shelter from the sea. But when he came, swimming along to the mouth of a sweet running river, this at last seemed to him the best place, being bare of rocks, and there was even shelter from the wind there. He saw where the river came out and prayed to him in his spirit, Hear me, my lord, whoever you are. I come in great need to you, a fugitive from the sea and the curse of Poseidon. Even for immortal gods, that man has a claim on their mercy who comes to them as a wandering man in the way that I now come to your current and to your knees after much suffering. Pity me then, my lord, I call myself your suppliant. He spoke, and the river stayed his current, stopped the waves breaking, and made all quiet in front of him, and let him get safely into the outlet of the river. Now he flexed both knees and his ponderous hands. His very heart was sick with salt water, and all his flesh was swollen, and the sea water crusted stiffly in his mouth and nostrils, and with a terrible weariness fallen upon him, he lay, 
unable to breathe or speak in his weakness. But when he got his breath back, and the spirit regathered into his heart, he at last unbound the veil of the goddess from him, and let it go, to drift in the seaward course of the river, and the great wave carried it out on the current, and presently Aino took it back into her hands. Odysseus staggered from the river, and lay down again in the rushes, and kissed the grain-giving soil. Then, deeply troubled, he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit, What will happen now, and what in the long outcome will befall me? For if I wait out the uncomfortable night by the river, I fear that the female dew and the evil frost together will be too much for my damaged strength. I am so exhausted. And in the morning a chilly wind will blow from the river. But if I go up the slope and into the shadowy forest, and lie down to sleep among the dense bushes, even if the chill and weariness let me be, and a sweet sleep comes upon me, I fear I may become spoil and prey to the wild animals. In the division of his heart this last way seemed best, and he went to look for the wood, and found it close to the water in a conspicuous place, and stopped underneath two bushes that grew from the same place, one of shrub and one of wild olive. Neither the force of wet blowing winds could penetrate these, nor could the shining sun ever strike through with his rays, nor yet could the rain pass all the way through them, so close together were they grown, interlacing each other. And under these now Odysseus entered, and with his own hands heaped him a bed to sleep on, making it wide, since there was a great store of fallen leaves there, enough for two men to take cover in, or even three men in the winter season, even in the very worst kind of weather. Saying this, long-suffering great Odysseus was happy, and lay down in the middle and made a pile of leaves over him. As when a man buries a burning log in a black ash heap in a remote place in the country where none live near his neighbors and saves the seed of fire, having no other place to get a light, from, so Odysseus buried himself in the leaves, and Athena shed a sleep on his eyes so as most quickly to quit him by veiling his eyes from the exhaustion of his hard labors. Hello, this is Daniel Fukushan, founder of Roman Roads Press. Today I'll be reading book six of Homer's Odyssey. Uh, I'll be reading from Richmond Lattimore's translation, which is one of my favorite. And uh, I really enjoy book six because it's just a fun story. Uh, you get to see some of Odysseus's cunning and wisdom, as well as that of uh, Nausicaa, the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous. Uh, so um, without further ado, book six of Homer's Odyssey. So long-suffering great Odysseus slept in that place, in an exhaustion of sleep and weariness, and now Athena went her way to the district and city of the Phaeacian men, who formerly lived in the spacious land, Hyperia, next to the Cyclops, who were men too overbearing, and who had kept har harrying them, being greater in strength. From here godlike Nusithous had removed and led a migration, and settled in Shearia, far away from men who ate bread and driv driven a wall about the city, and built the houses, and made the temples of the gods, and allotted the holdings. But now he had submitted to his fate, and gone to Hades, and Alcinous learned in the designs from the gods now ruled there. It was to his house that the gray-eyed goddess Athena went, devising the homecoming of great-hearted Odysseus, and she went into the ornate chamber in which a girl was sleeping, like the immortal goddess, goddesses for stature and beauty, now Sakea, the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous. And beside her two handmaidens, with beauty given from the graces, slept on either side of the post with the shining doors closed. She drifted in like a breath of wind to where the girl slept, and came and stood above her and spoke a word to her, likening herself to the daughter of Dimas, famed for seafaring, a girl of the same age, in whom her fancy delighted. In this likeness the grey-eyed Athena spoke to her. Now, Sakea, how could your mother have a child so careless? The shining clothes are lying away uncared for, while your marriage is not far off, when you should be in your glory for clothes to wear, and provide too for those who attend you. It is from such things that a good reputation among people springs up, giving pleasure to your father and the lady your mother. So let us go on a washing tomorrow, when dawn shows. I too will go along with you and help you, so that you can have all done most quickly, since you will not long stay unmarried." For already you are being courted by all the best men of the Phaeacians hereabouts, and you too are a Phaeacan. So come, urge your famous father early in the morning to harness the mules and wagon for you, and it shall carry the sashes and dresses and shining coverlets for you. In this way it will be so much more becoming than for you to go there on foot, for the washing places are a long way from the city. 
So the great, gray-eyed Athena spoke and went away from her to Olympus, where the, where the abode of the gods stands firm and unmoving forever, they say, and is not shaken with winds nor spattered with rains, nor does snow pile ever there, but the shining bright air stretches cloudless away, and the white light glances upon it. And there, and all their days, and blessed gods take their pleasure. There the gray-eyed one went, when she had talked with the young girl, and the next the dawn came, throned in splendor and wakening the well-robed girl Nausicaa, and she wondered much at her dreaming, and went through the house so as to give the word to her parents, to her dear father and her mother. She found them within there. The queen was sitting by the fireside with her attendant women, turning sea-purple yarn on a distaff. Her father, she met as he was coming, going out the door to the council of famed barons, where the proud Viacans used to summon him. She stood very close up to her dear father and spoke to him. Daddy, dear, will you not have them harness me the wagon, the one with the good wheels so that I can take the clothing to the river and wash it? Now it is lying about all dirty, and you yourself, where you sit among the first men in council and share their counsels, ought to have clean clothes about you. And also you have five dear sons who are grown in the palace. Two of them are married, and the other three are spritingly, sprightly bachelors, and they are forever wanting clean, fresh clothes to wear it when they go to dance, and it is my duty to think about all this. So she spoke, but she was ashamed to speak of her joyful marriage to her dear father, but he understood all and answered, I do not begrudge you the mules, child, nor anything else. So go, and the serving men will harness the wagon, the one, the high one with the good wheels that has the carrying basket. He spoke and gave the order to the serving men. The, these obeyed and brought the muled wagon with good wheels outside and put it together and led the mules under the yoke and harnessed them. And the girl brought the bright clothing out from the inner chamber and laid it in the well-polished wagon. Meanwhile, her mother put in a box all manner of food which would preserve strength and put many good things to eat with it and poured out wine in a goatskin bottle. And her daughter put that in the wagon. She gave her limpid olive oil in a golden flask for her and her attendant women to use for anointing. Nausicaa took up the whip and the shining reins, then whipped them into a start, and the mules went noisily forward and pulled without stint, carrying the girl and the clothing. She was not alone. The rest, her handmaidens, walked on beside her. Now when they had come to the delightful stream of the river, where there was always a washing place, the plenty and plenteous of glorious water that ran through to wash what was ever so dirty, there they unyoked the mules and set them free from the wagon, and chased them out along the banks of the swirling river to graze on the sweet river grass, while they from the wagon lifted the wash in their hands and carried it to the black water, and stamped on it in the basins, making a race and game of it, until they had washed and rinsed all dirt away then spread it out in line along the beach of the sea, where the water of the sea had washed the most big pebbles up on the dry shore. Then they themselves, after bathing and anointing themselves with olive oil, ate their dinner all along by the banks of the river, and waited for the laundry to dry out in the sunshine. But when she and her maids had taken their pleasure in eating, they all threw off their veils for a game of ball, and among them it was now Sakea of the White Arms who led in the dancing, and as Artemis, who showers arrows, moves on the mountains, either along Tyagetos or on high-towering Ermanthos, delighting in boars and deer in their running, and along with her nymphs, daughters of Zeus and Aegeus, range in the wilds and play, and the heart of Leto is gladdened, for the head and the brows of Artemis are above all the others, and she is easily marked among them, though all are lovely. So this one shone among her handmaidens, a virgin unwedded. But now, when she was about ready once more to harness the mules and fold the splendid clothing and start on her way home, then the gray-eyed goddess Athena thought what to do next, how Odysseus should awake and see the well-favored young girl, and she should be his guide to the city of the Phaeacans. Now the princess, the princess threw the ball towards one handmaiden and missed the girl, and the ball went into the swirling water, and they all cried out aloud, and noble Odysseus wakened and sat up and began pondering in his heart and his spirit, Ah, me, what are the people whose land I have come to this time? And are they violent and savage and without justice or hospitable to strangers with a godly mind? See now how an outcry of young women echoed about me, of nymphs who keep the sudden and sheer high mountains places and the springs of the rivers and grasses of the meadows. Or am I truly in the neighborhood of a human people I can converse with? But come now, I myself shall see what I can discover. So speaking, great Odysseus came from under his thicket, 
and from the dense foliage with his heavy hand he broke off a leafy branch to cover his body, and hid the male parts, and went in confidence of his strength like some hill-kept lion who advances, though he is rained on and blown by the wind, and both eyes kindle. He goes out after cattle or sheep, or it may be deer in the wilderness, and his belly is urgent upon him to get inside of a close steading and go for the sheep folks. So Odysseus was ready to face young girls with well-ordered hair, naked though he was, for the need was on him, and yet he appeared terrifying to them, all crusted with dry spray, and they scattered one way and another down the jutting beaches. Only the daughter of Alcaneus stood fast, for Athena put courage into her heart and took the fear from her body, and she stood her ground and faced him. And now Odysseus debated whether to supplicate the well-favored girl by clasping her knees, or stand off where he was and, in words of blandishment, ask if he would show if she would show him the city and lend him clothes. Now, in the diversion of his heart, this way seemed best to him to stand well off and supplicate in words of blandishment, for fear that if he clasped her knees the girls might be the girl might be angry. So blandishingly and full of craft he began to address her. I am at your knees, O queen, but are you mortal or goddess? If indeed you are one of the gods who hold wide heaven, then I must find in, in, in you the nearest likeness to Artemis, the daughter of great Zeus, for beauty, figure, and stature. But if you are one among those mortals who live in this country, three times blessed are your father and the lady your mother, and three times blessed your brothers too, and I know their spirits are warmed forever with happiness at the thought of you, seeing such a slip of beauty taking her place in the chorus of dancers. But blessed at the heart, even beyond these others, is the one who, after loading you down with gifts, leads you as his bride home. I have never with these eyes seen anything like you, neither man nor woman. Wonder takes me as I look on you. Yet on, in Delos once I saw such a thing by Apollo's altar. I saw the stalk of a young palm shooting up. I had gone there once, and with a following of a great many people on that journey, which was to mean hard suffering for me. And as, when I looked upon that tree, my heart admired it, long since such a tree had never yet sprung from the earth. So now, lady, I admire you and wonder, and am terribly afraid to glass, uh, clasp you by the knees. The hard sorrow is on me. Yesterday on the twentieth day I escaped the, escaped the wine-blue sea. Until then the current and the tearing winds had me swept along from the island Ogigia, and my fate has landed me here. Here, too, I must have evil to suffer. I do not think I, it will stop. Before then the gods have much to give me. Then have pity, O queen. You are the first I have come to after much suffering. There is no one else that I know of here among the people who hold this land and this city. Show me the way to the town, and give me some rag to wrap me in, if you have any kind of piece of cloth when you came here. And then may the gods give you everything that your heart longs for. May they grant you a husband, and a house, and sweet agreement in all things. For nothing is better than this, more steadfast than when two people, a man and his wife, keep a harmonious household, a thing that brings much distress to the people who hate them, and pleasure to their well-wishers, and for them the best reputation." Then in turn Nausicaa of the White Arms answered him, My friend, since you seem not like a thoughtless man nor a mean one, it is Zeus himself the Olympian who gives good people good fortune, to each single man, to the good and the bad, just as he wishes. And since he must have given you yours, you must even endure it. But now, since it is our land and our city that you have come to, you shall not lack for clothes nor anything else of those gifts which should befall the unhappy suppliant on his arrival. And I will show you our town, and tell you the name of our people. It is the Phaeacaeans who hold this territory and city, and I myself and the daughter of great-hearted Alcanoas, whose power and dominion are held by right, given from the Phaeacaeans. She spoke, and to her attendants with well-ordered hair gave instruction. Steadfast, girls, where are you flying? Just because you have looked on a man? Do you think this is some enemy coming against us? There is no such man living, nor can there ever be one who can come into the land of the Phaeacaeans bringing warlike attack. We are so very dear to the immortals, and we live far apart from our, by ourselves in the wash of the great sea at the utter end, nor do any other people mix with us. But since this is some poor wanderer who has come to us, we must now take care of him since all strangers and wanderers are sacred in the sight of Zeus, and the gift is a light and a dear one. So, my attendants, give some food and drink to the stranger, and bathe him. 
where there is shelter from the wind and the river. She spoke, and they stopped their flight, encouraging one at each other, and led Odysseus down to the sheltered place, as Nausicaa, daughter of great-hearted Alcanoas, had told them to do, and laid out for him to wear a mantle and tunic, and gave him limpid olive oil and a golden oil flask, and told him he could bathe himself in the stream of the river. Then the glorious Odysseus spoke to these serving maids, Stand as you are, girls, a little away from me, so that I can wash the salt off my shoulders and use the olive oil on them. It is long since my skin has known any ointment. But I will not bathe in front of you, for I feel embarrassed in the presence of lovely-haired girls to appear all naked. He spoke, and they went away and told it to their young mistress. But when great Odysseus had bathed in the river and washed from his body the salt brine which clung to his back and his broad shoulders, he scraped from his head the scurf of brine from the barren salt sea. But when he had bathed all and anointed himself with olive oil and put on the clothes this unwedded girl had given him, then Athena, daughter of Zeus, made him seem taller for the eye to behold, and thicker, and on his head she arranged the curling locks that hung down like hyacinthine petals. And as when a master craftsman overlays gold on silver, and he is one who is taught by Habethos and Pallas Athena in art complete, and grace is on every work he finishes, so Athena gilded with grace his head and his shoulders, and he went a little aside and sat by himself on the seashore, radiant in grace and good looks. And the girl admired him. It was to her attendants with well-ordered hair that she, she now spoke. Hear me, my white-armed serving women. Let me say something. It is not against the will of all the gods on Olympus that this man is here to be made known to the godlike Phaeacaeans. A while ago he seemed an unpromising man to me. Now he even resembles one of the gods, who hold high heaven. If only the man to be called my husband could be like this one, a man living here, if only this one were pleased to stay here. But come, my attendants, give some food and drink to the stranger." So she spoke, and they listened well to her and obeyed her, and they set food and drink down beside Odysseus. He, then noble and long-suffering Odysseus, eagerly ate and drank, since he had not tasted food for a long time. Then Nausicaa of the white arms, though what to do, thought what to do next. She folded the laundry and put it away in the fine mule wagon, and yoked the mules with powerful hooves, and herself mounted, and urged Odysseus, and spoke a word, and named him by title. Rise up now, stranger, to go to the city, so I can see you to the house of my own prudent father, where I am confident you will be made known to all the highest Phaeacaeans. Or rather, do it this way. You seem to me not to be thoughtless. While we are still among the fields and the lands that the people work, for that time follow the mules and the wagon, walking lightly along with the maids, and I will point the way to you. But when we come to the city, and around this is a towering wall and a handsome harbor uh, either side of the city, and a narrow causeway, and along the road there is an oar-swept ship drawn up, for they all have slips, one for each vessel. And there is the place of assembly, put together with quarried stone and built around a fine precinct of Poseidon, and there they tend all that gear that goes with the black ships and housers and sails, and there they find down their oar blades, for the Phaeacans have no concern with the bow or the quiver, but it is all masts and oars of ships and balanced vessels themselves in which they delight in crossing over the grey sea. And it is their graceless speech I shrink from, for fear one may mock us hereafter, since there are insolent men in our community, and see how one of the worst sort might say when they meet us, who is this large and handsome stranger with whom Nausicaa has, has with her, and where did she find him? Surely he is to be her husband, but is he astray from some ship of alien men whom she found for herself, since there are no such where hereabouts? Or did some god, after much entreaty, come down and answer to her prayers out of the sky, and all his days will, have he, will he have her? Better so, if she goes out herself and finds her a husband from elsewhere, since she pays no heed to her own Phaeacan neighbors, although many of these and the best ones court her. So they will speak, and they will. there will be a scandal against me, and I myself would disapprove of a girl who acted so, that is, without the good will of her dear father and mother making friends with a man before being formally married. Then, stranger, understand what I say in order soon to win escort and a voyage home from my father. You will find a glorious grove of poplars sacred to Athena near the road, and a spring runs there, and there is a meadow, about it, and there is my father's estate and this flowering orchard, as far from the city as the shout of a man will carry. Sit 
that down there and wait for some time enough for the rest of us to reach the town and make our way to my father's palace. When you estimate that we shall have reached the palace, then go to the city of the Phaeacans and inquire for the palace of my father, great-hearted Alcanoas. This is easily distinguished, so an innocent child could guide you there, for there are no other houses built for other Phaeacans anything like the house of the hero Alcanoas. But when you have disappeared inside the house in the courtyard, then go on quickly across the hall until you come to my mother, and she will be sitting beside the hearth in the firelight, turning sea purple yarn on a distaff, a wonder to look at, and leaning against the pillar, and her maids are sitting be behind her. And there is my father's chair of state, drawn close beside her, in which he sits when he drinks his wine like any immortal. Go on past him, and then with your arms embrace our mother's knees. Do this so as to behold your day of homecoming with happiness and speed, even if you live very far off. For if she thought, if she has thoughts in her mind that, that are friendly to you, then there is hope that you can see your own people and come back to your strong-founded house and to the land of your fathers. So now Sakea spoke, and with a shining lash whipped up her mules, and swiftly they left the running river behind them. And the mules, neatly twinkling their feet, ran very strongly, but she drove them with care, so that those on foot, Odysseus and the serving maids, could keep up, and used the whip with discretion. And the sun went down, and they came to the famous grove, sacred to Athena. And there the great Odysseus sat down, and immediately thereafter prayed to the daughter of great Zeus, Hear me! Atritone, child of Zeus and of the Aegis, listen to me now, since before you did not listen to my stricken voice as the famous shaker of the earth battered me. Grant that I come, as one loved and pitied, among the Phaeacans. So he spoke in prayer, and Pallas Athena heard him. But she did not yet show herself before him, for she respected her father's brother, Poseidon, who still nursed a sore anger at godlike Odysseus until his arrival in his own country. My name is Ian Anderson. I'm a student at New St. Andrews College, and I'm studying music. Today, I'll be reading Book 7 of Homer's The Odyssey. Now, as Odysseus, long in exile, prayed in Athena's grove, the hardy mule team drew the princess toward the city. Reaching her father's splendid halls, she reined in, just as the gates, her brothers clustering around her, men like gods, released the mules from the yoke, and brought the clothes indoors, as Nausicaa made her way towards her bedroom. There her chambermaid lit a fire for her. Yuri Medusa, the old woman who'd come from Apirea years ago, when the rolling ships had sailed her in, and the country picked her out as King Alcinous' prize. For he ruled all the Phaeacians. They obeyed him like a god. Once she had nursed the white-armed princess in the palace. Now she lit a fire and made her supper in the room. At the same time, Odysseus set off toward the city. Pallas Athena, harboring kindness for the hero, drifted a heavy mist around him, shielding him from any swaggering islander who'd cross his path provoke him with taunts and search out who he was. Instead, as he was about to enter the welcome city, the bright-eyed goddess herself came up to greet him there. For all the world, like a young girl, holding a pitcher, standing face to face with the visitor, who asked, Little girl, now wouldn't you be my guide to the palace of the one they call Alcinous? The king who rules the people of these parts, I am a stranger, you see, weighed down with troubles. Come this way from a distance, far offshore. So I know no one here, no one at all, in your city and the farmlands round about. Oh, yes, sir, good old stranger, the bright-eyed goddess said. I'll show you the very palace that you're after. The king lives right beside my noble father. Come quietly, too and I will lead the way. Now not a glance at anyone, not a question. The men here never suffer strangers gladly, have no love for hosting a man from foreign lands. All they really trust are their fast flying ships that cross the mighty ocean. Gifts of Poseidon, ah, what ships they are, 
quick as a bird, quick as a darting thought. And Pallas Athena sped away in the lead as he followed in her footsteps, man and goddess. But the famed Phaeacian sailors never saw him, right in their midst, striding down the streets. Athena, the one with lovely braids, would not permit it. The awesome goddess poured an enchanted mist around him, harboring kindness for Odysseus in her heart. And he marveled now at the balanced ships and havens, the meeting grounds of the great lords and the long ramparts looming, coped and crowned with palisades of stakes, an amazing sight to see. And once they reached the king's resplendent halls, the bright-eyed goddess cried out, Good old stranger, here, here is the very palace that you're after. I've guided you all the way. Here you'll find our princes dear to the gods, busy feasting. You'll go on inside. Be bold, nothing to fear. In every venture the bold man comes off best, even the wanderer, bound from distant shores. The queen is the first you'll light on in the halls. Arete, she is called, and earns the name. She answers all our prayers. She comes, in fact, from the same stock that bred our king Alcinous. First came Nausithous, son of the earthquake god Poseidon and Periboea, the lovely, matchless beauty, the youngest daughter of iron-willed Eurymedon, king of the overweening giants years ago. He led that reckless clan to its own ruin, killed himself in the bargain, but the sea lord lay in love with Periboea, and she produced a son, now Sithos, that lion heart who ruled Phaeacia well. Now Nasithous had two sons, Rexenor and Alcinous. But the lord of the silver bow, Apollo, shot Rexenor down, married, true, yet still without a son in the halls. He left one child behind, a daughter named Arete. Alcinous made the girl his wife, and honors her as no woman is honored on this earth, of all the wives now keeping households under their husband's sway. Such is her pride of place, and always will be so, dear to her loving children, to Alcinous himself, and all our people. They gaze on her as a god, saluting her warmly on her walks through town, she lacks nothing in good sense and judgment. She can dissolve quarrels even among men, whoever win her sympathies. If only our queen will take you to her heart, then there's hope that you will see your loved ones reach your high-roofed house, your native land, at last. And with that vow, the bright-eyed goddess sped away over the barren sea, leaving welcome Scaria far behind and reaching Marathon and the spacious streets of Athens, entered Erechtheus's sturdy halls, Athena's stronghold. Now as Odysseus approached Alcinous' famous house, a rush of feeling stirred within his heart, bringing him to a standstill. Even before he crossed the bronze threshold, a radiance strong as the moon or rising sun came flooding through the high-roofed halls of generous King Alcinous. Walls plated in bronze, crowned with a circling frieze, glazed as blue as lapis, ran to left and right, from outer gates to the deepest court recess, and solid golden doors enclosed the palace. Up from the bronze threshold, silver doorposts rose, with silver lintel above, and golden handles, too. And dogs of gold and silver were stationed either side, forged by the god of fire with all his cunning craft, to keep watch on generous King Alcinous' palace, his immortal guard dogs, ageless all their days. Inside to left and right, in a long, unbroken row from farthest outer gate to the inmost chamber, 
Thrones stood backed against the wall, each draped with a finely spun brocade, women's handsome work. Here the Phaeacian lords would sit enthroned, dining, drinking. The feast flowed on forever. And young boys, molded of gold, set on pedestals standing firm, were lifting torches high in their hands to flare through the nights and light the feasters down the hall. And Alcinous had some fifty serving women in his house, some turning the handmill, grind the apple yellow grain, some weave at their webs or sit and spin their yarn, fingers flickering quick as aspen leaves in the wind, and the densely woven woolens dripping oil droplets. Just as Phaeacian men excel the world at sailing, driving their swift ships on the open seas, so the women excel at all the arts of weaving. That is Athena's gift to them beyond all others, a genius for lovely work, and a fine mind, too. Outside the courtyard, fronting the high gates, a magnificent orchard stretches four acres deep, with a strong fence running round it side to side. Here, luxuriant trees are always in their prime, pomegranates and pears, and apples glowing red, succulent figs and olives swelling sleek and dark. And the yield of all these trees will never flag or die, neither in winter nor in summer, a harvest all year round, for the west wind always breathing through will bring some fruits to the bud and others warm to ripeness. Pear, mellowing ripe on pear, apple on apple, cluster of grapes on cluster, fig crowding fig. And here is a teeming vineyard planted for the kings, beyond it an open level bank where the vintage grapes lie baking to raisins in the sun, while pickers gather others. Some they trample down in vats, and here in the front rows bunches of unripe grapes have hardly shed their blooms, while others under the sunlight slowly darken purple. And there by the last rows are beds of greens, bordered and plotted, greens of every kind, glistening fresh, year in, year out. And last, there are two springs, one rippling in channels over the whole orchard. The other, flanking it, rushes under the palace gates to bubble up in front of the lofty roofs, where the city people come and draw their water. Such were the gifts, the glories showered down by the gods on King Alcino's realm. And there Odysseus stood, gazing at all this bounty, a man who'd borne so much, once he'd had his filling of marveling at it all, he crossed the threshold quickly, strode inside the palace. Here he found the Phaeacian lords and captains, tipping out libations now to the guide and giant killer Hermes, the god to whom they would always pour the final cup before they sought their beds. Odysseus went on striding down the hall, the man of many struggles, shrouded still in the mist, Athena drifted round him, till he reached Arete and Alcinous, the king. And then, the moment he flung his arms around Arete's knees, the god-sent mist rolled back to reveal the great man. And silence seized the feasters all along the hall. Seeing him right before their eyes, they marveled, gazing on him now as Odysseus pleaded, Queen, Arete, daughter of godlike King Rexenor. Here, after many trials, I come to beg for mercy, your husbands, yours, and all these feasters here. May the gods endow them with fortune all their lives. May each hand down to his sons the riches of his house and the pride of place the realm has granted him. But as for myself, grant me a rapid convoy home to my own native land. How far away I've been from all my loved ones. How long I have suffered. 
pleading so, the man sank down in the ashes, just at the hearth beside the blazing fire, while all the rest stayed hushed, stock still. At last, the old revered Echenius broke the spell, the eldest lord in Phaeacia, finest speaker, too, a past master at all the island's ancient ways. Impelled by kindness now, he rose and said, This is no way, Alcinous. How indecent, look, our guest on the ground, in the ashes by the fire. Your people are holding back, waiting for your signal. Come, raise him up and seat the stranger now in a silver-studded chair, and tell the heralds to mix more wine for all, so we can pour out our cups to Zeus, who loves the lightning, champion of suppliants. Suppliants' rites are sacred. And let the housekeeper give our guest his supper, unstinting with her stores. Hearing that, Alcinous, poised in all his majesty, took the hand of the seasoned, worldly-wise Odysseus, raised him up from the hearth, and sat him down in a burnished chair, displacing his own son, the courtly lord Laodamas, who had sat beside him, the son he loved the most. A maid brought water soon in a graceful golden pitcher, and over a silver basin tipped it out, so the guest might rinse his hands. Then, pulling a gleaming table to his side. A staid housekeeper brought on bread to serve him, appetizers aplenty, too, lavish with her bounty. As long-suffering great Odysseus ate and drank, the hollowed king Alcinous called his herald, Come, Pontinous, mix the wine in the bowl, pour rounds to all our banqueters in the house, so we can pour out cups to Zeus, who loves the lightning, champion of suppliants. Suppliants' rites are sacred. At that, Pontinous mixed the heavy, honeyed wine and tipped first drops for the god in every cup, then poured full rounds for all. And once they'd poured libations out and drunk to their heart's content, Alcinous rose and addressed his island people. Hear me, lords and captains of Phaeacia, hear what the heart inside me has to say. Now our feast finished, home you go to sleep. But at dawn we call the elders in to full assembly, host our guest in the palace, sacrifice to the gods, and then we turn our minds to his passage home, so under our convoy our new friend can travel back to his own land. No toil, no troubles. Soon, rejoicing, even if his home's a world away. And on the way, no pain or hardship suffered, not till he sets foot on native ground again. There, in the future, he must suffer all that fate and the overbearing spinners spun out on his lifeline the very day his mother gave him birth. But if he's one of the deathless powers... Out of the blue, the gods are working now in strange new ways. Always, up to now, they came to us face to face whenever we'd give them grand, glorious sacrifices. They always sat beside us here and shared our feasts. Even when some lonely traveler meets them on the roads, they never disguise themselves. We're too close kin for that, close as the wild giants are. The Cyclops, too. Alcinous, wary Odysseus countered, cross that thought from your mind. I'm nothing like the immortal gods who rule the skies, either in build or breeding. I'm just a mortal man. Whom do you know most saddled down with sorrow? They are the ones I'd equal, grief for grief. And I could tell a tale of still more hardship, all I've suffered thanks to the gods' will. But despite my misery, let me finish dinner. The belly's a shameless dog. There's nothing worse. Always insisting, pressing, it never lets us forget. Destroyed as I am, 
my heart racked with sadness, sick with anguish. Still it keeps demanding, eat, drink. It blots out all the memory of my pain, commanding, fill me up. But you, at the first light of day, hurry, please, to set your unlucky guest on his own home soil. How much I have suffered. Oh, just let me see my lands, my serving men, and the grand high-roofed house. Then I can die in peace. All burst into applause, urging passage home for their new-found friend. His pleading rang so true. And once they'd poured libations out and drunk to their heart's content, each one made his way to rest in his own house. But King Odysseus still remained at hall, seated beside the royal Alcinous and Arete, as servants cleared the cups and plates away. The white-armed queen Arete took the lead. She'd spotted the cape and shirt Odysseus wore, fine clothes she'd made herself with all her women. So now her words flew brusquely, sharply. Stranger, I'll be the first to question you myself. Who are you? Where are you from? Who gave you the clothes you're wearing now? Didn't you say you reached us roving on the sea? What hard labor, queen, the man of craft replied, to tell you the story of my troubles start to finish. The gods on high have given me my share. Still, this much I will tell you. Seeing you probe and press me so intently. There is an island, Ogygia, lying far at sea, where the daughter of Atlas, Calypso, has her home, the seductive nymph with lovely braids, a danger, too, and no one, god or mortal, dares approach her there. But I, cursed as I am, some power brought me to her hearth, alone when Zeus with a white-hot bolt had crushed my racing warship down the wine-dark sea. There all the rest of my loyal shipmates died, but I, locking my arms around my good ship's keel, drifted along nine days. On the tenth, at dead of night, the gods cast me upon Ogygia, Calypso's island, home of the dangerous nymph with glossy braids, and the goddess took me in with all her kindness, welcomed me, cherished me, even vowed to make me immortal, ageless all my days. But she never won the heart inside me, never. Seven endless years I remained there, always drenching with my tears the immortal clothes Calypso gave me. Then at last, when the eighth came wheeling round, she insisted that I sail. Inspired by warnings sent from Zeus, perhaps, or her own mind had changed. She saw me on my way in a solid craft, tight and trim, and gave me full provisions, food and mellow wine, immortal clothes to wear, and summoned a wind to bear me onward, fair and warm. And seventeen days I sailed, making headway well. On the eighteenth, shadowy mountains slowly loomed, your land. My heart leapt up, unlucky as I am, doomed to be comrades still to many hardships. Many pains the god of earthquakes piled upon me, loosing the winds against me, blocking passage through, heaving up a terrific sea beyond belief. Nor did the whitecaps let me cling to my craft for all my desperate groaning. No, the squalls shattered her stem to stern. But I, I swam hard. I plowed my way through those dark gulfs till at last the wind and current bore me to your shores. But here, had I tried to land, the breakers would have hurled me, smashed me against the jagged cliffs of that grim coast. So I pulled away, swam back till I reached a river, the perfect spot at last or so it struck me, free of rocks, with a windbreak from the gales. So, fighting for my life, I flung myself ashore, and the godsent, 
bracing night came on at once. Clambering up from the river, big with Zeus's reins, I bedded down in the brush, my body heaped with leaves, and a god poured down a boundless sleep upon me. Yes, and there in the leaves, exhausted, sick at heart, I slept the whole night through, and on to the break of day, and on into high noon, and the sun was wheeling down when sweet sleep let me free. And I looked up, and there were your daughter's maids, at play on the beach, and she, she moved among them like a deathless goddess. I begged her for help, and not once did her sense of tact desert her. She behaved as you'd never hope to find in one so young, not in a random meeting. Time and again the youngsters prove so flighty, not she. She gave me food aplenty and shining wine, a bath in the river too, and gave me all this clothing. That's my whole story, wrenching to tell, but true. Ah, but in one regard, my friend, the king replied, her good sense missed the mark, this daughter of mine. She never escorted you to our house with all her maids, but she was the first you asked for care and shelter. Your Majesty, diplomatic Odysseus answered, don't find fault with a flawless daughter now, not for my sake, please. She urged me herself to follow with her maids. I chose not to, fearing embarrassment, in fact. What if you took offense, seeing us both together? Suspicious we are, we men who walk the earth. Oh no, my friend, Alcinous stated flatly. I'm hardly a man for reckless, idle anger. Balance is best in all things. Father Zeus, Athena, and Lord Apollo, if only, seeing the man you are, seeing we think as one, you could wed my daughter and be my son-in-law and stay right here with us. I'd give you a house and great wealth, if you chose to stay, that is. No Phaeacian would hold you back by force. The curse of Father Zeus on such a thing, and about your convoy home, you rest assured. I have chosen the day, and I decree it is tomorrow. And all that voyage long you'll lie in a deep sleep while my people sail you on through calm and gentle tides till you reach your land and house, or any place you please. Truly, even if landfall lies more distant than Euboea, off at the edge of the world, so say our crews, at least, who saw it once, that time they carried the gold-haired Rhadamanthus out to visit Titius, son of Mother Earth. Imagine there, uh, they sailed and back they came in the same day. They finished the homeward run with no strain at all. You'll see for yourself how far they top the best. My ships and their young shipmates tossing up the white caps with their oars. So he vowed, and the long-enduring great Odysseus glowed with joy and raised a prayer and called the god by name. Father Zeus on high, may the king fulfill his promises one and all. Then his fame would ring through the fertile earth and never die, and I should reach my native land at last. And now, as the two men exchanged their hopes, the white-armed queen instructed her palace maids to make a bed in the porch's shelter, lay down some heavy purple throws for the bed itself, and over it spread some blankets, thick, woolly robes, a warm covering laid on top. Torches in hand, they left the hall and fell to work at once, briskly preparing a good, snug resting place, and then returned to Odysseus, urged the guest, Up, friend, time for sleep. Your bed is made. How welcome the thought of sleep to that man now. So there, after many trials, Odysseus lay at rest on a corded bed inside the echoing colonnade. 
Alcinous slept in chambers deep in his lofty house, where the queen, his wife, arranged and shared their bed. Hi there. I am Carissa Hale, and I work for Roman Roads as a a book formatter and designer, copy editor, um, project manager. So today I will be reading books 8 and 14 of the Odyssey. So this is book 8. When young dawn with her rose-red fingers shone once more, royal Alcinous, hallowed island king, rose from bed, and great Odysseus, raider of cities, rose too. Poised in his majesty, Alcinous led the way to Phaeacia's meeting grounds, built for all beside the harbored ships. Both men sat down on the polished stone benches side by side, as Athena started roaming up and down the town, in build and voice the wise Alcinous' herald, furthering plans for Odysseus's journey home, and stopped beside each citizen, urged them all, "'Come this way, you lords and captains of Phaeacia, come to the meeting grounds and learn about the stranger. A new arrival, here at our wise king's palace now, he's here from roving the ocean, driven far off course. He looks like a deathless god. Rousing their zeal, their curiosity, each and every man, and soon enough the assembly seats were filled with people thronging, gazing in wonder at the seasoned man of war. Over Odysseus's head and shoulders now, Athena lavished a marvelous splendor, yes, making him taller, more massive to all eyes, so Phaeacians might regard the man with kindness, awe and respect as well, and he might win through the many trials they'd pose to test the hero's strength. Once they'd grouped, crowding the meeting grounds, Alcinous rose and addressed his island people. Hear me, lords and captains of Phaeacia, Hear what the heart inside me has to say. This stranger here, our guest, I don't know who he is or whether he comes from sunrise lands or the western lands of evening, but he has come in his wanderings to my palace. He pleads for passage. He begs we guarantee it. So now, as in years gone by, let us press on and grant him escort. No one, I tell you, no one who comes to my house will languish long here, heart-sick for convoy home. Come, my people, haul a black ship down to the bright sea, rigged for her maiden voyage. Enlist a crew of fifty-two young sailors, the best in town, who've proved their strength before. Let all hands lash their oars to the thwarts, then disembark. Come to my house and fall in for a banquet quickly. I'll lay on a princely feast for all. So then, these are the orders I issue to our crews. For the rest, you sceptered princes here, you come to my royal halls so we can give this stranger a hero's welcome in our palace. No one here refuse. Call in the inspired bard, Demodocus. God has given the man the gift of song, to him beyond all others, the power to please, however the spirit stirs him on to sing. With those commands, Alcinous led the way, and a file of sceptered princes took his lead, while the herald went to find the gifted bard. And the fifty-two young sailors, duly chosen, briskly following orders, went down to the shore of the barren salt sea. And once they reached the ship at the surf's edge, first they hauled the craft into deeper water, stepped the mast amidships, canvas brailed, they made oars fast in the leather oarlock straps, moored her riding high on the swell, then disembarked and made their way to wise Alcinous's high-roofed halls. There colonnades and courts and rooms were overflowing with crowds, a mounting host of people young and old. The king slaughtered a dozen sheep to feed his guests, eight boars with shining tusks and a pair of shambling oxen. These they skinned and dressed, and then laid out a feast to fill the heart with savor. In came the herald now, leading along the faithful bard the muse adored above all others true but her gifts were mixed with good and evil both she stripped him of sight but gave the man the power of stirring rapturous song pontinus brought the bard a silver-studded chair right amid the feasters leaning it up against a central column hung his high clear lyre on a peg above his head and showed him how to reach up with his hands and lift it down and the herald placed a table by his side with a basket full of bread and cup of wine for him to sip when his spirit craved refreshment. 
all reached out for the good things that lay at hand, and when they'd put aside desire for food and drink, the muse inspired the bard to sing the famous deeds of fighting heroes, the song whose fame had reached the skies those days, the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, Peleus' son, how once at the gods' lavish feast the captains clashed in a savage war of words, while Agamemnon, lord of armies, rejoiced at heart that Achaia's bravest men were battling so. For this was the victory sign that Apollo prophesied at his shrine in Pitho when Agamemnon strode across the rocky threshold, asking the oracle for advice, the start of the tidal waves of ruin tumbling down on Troy's and Achaia's forces both at once thanks to the will of Zeus, who rules the world. That was the song the famous harper sung, but Odysseus, clutching his flaring sea-blue cape in both powerful hands, drew it over his head and buried his handsome face, ashamed his hosts might see him shedding tears. Whenever the rapt bard would pause in the song, he'd lift the cape from his head, wipe off his tears, and ho hoisting his double-handed cup, pour it out to the gods. But soon as the bard would start again, impelled to sing by Phaeacia's lords, who reveled in his tale, again Odysseus hid his face and wept. His weeping went unmarked by all the others. Only Alcinous, sitting close beside him, noticed his guest's tears, heard the groan in the man's labored breathing, and said at once to the master mariners around him, "'Hear me, my lords and captains of Phaeacia! By now we've had our fill of food well shared, and the liar too, our loyal friend at banquets. Now out we go again, and test ourselves in contests, games of every kind, so our guest can tell his friends, when he reaches home, how far we excel the world at boxing, wrestling, jumping, speed of foot. He forged ahead, and the rest fell in behind. The herald hung the ringing lyre back on its peg, and, taking Demodocus by the hand, led him from the palace, guiding him down the same path the island lords had just pursued, keen to watch the contests. They reached the meeting grounds with throngs of people streaming in their trail as a press of young champions rose for competition. Topsail and riptide rose, the helmsmen row hard too, and seamen and sternmen surf at the beach and stroke oar, breaker and bowsprit racing the wind and swing aboard, and Sigurd, the son of Great Fleet, Shipwright son and the son of Launcher, Broad Sea, rose up too, a match for murderous Ares, death to men. In looks and build the best of all Phaeacians after gallant Laudamas, the captain of the people. Laudamas rose with two more sons of great Alcinous, Halius bred to the sea, and Clytonius famed for ships. And now the games began, the first event of foot race. They towed the line, and broke flat out from the start, with a fast pack flying down the field in a whirl of dust, and Clytonius, the prince, outstripped them all, by far. Flashing ahead for length, two mules will plough a furrow before he turned for home, leaving the pack behind and raced to reach the crowds. Next, the wrestling, grueling sport. They grappled, locked, and Broadsea, pinning the strongest champions, won the bouts. Next, in the jumping, Seagirt leapt and beat the field. In the discus, Rohard up and out hurled them all by far, and the king's good son, Laudamas, boxed them to their knees. When all had enjoyed the games to their heart's content, Alcinous's son, Laudamas, spurred them. Come, my friends, let's ask our guest if he knows the ropes of any sport. He's no mean man, not with a build like that. Look at his thighs, his legs, and what a pair of arms, his massive neck, his big, rippling strength. Nor is he past his prime, just beaten down by one too many blows. Nothing worse than the sea, I always say, to crush a man, the strongest man alive. And Broadsea put in quickly, Well said, Laudamas, right to the point. Go up to the fellow, challenge him yourself. On that cue the noble prince strode up before Odysseus, front and center, asking, Come, stranger, sir, won't you try your hand at our contests now? If you have skill in any, it's fit and proper for you to know your sports. What greater glory attends a man while he's alive than what he wins with his racing feet and striving hands? Come and compete, then. Throw your cares to the wind. It won't be long. Your journey's not far off. Your ship's already hauled down to the sea. Your crew is set to sail. 
Laudamas, quick to the mark, Odysseus countered sharply. Why do you taunt me so with such a challenge? Pains weigh on my spirit now, not your sports. I've suffered much already, struggled hard. But here I sit amid your assembly still, starved for passage home, begging your king, begging all your people. Oh, I knew it, Brodsey broke in, mocking him to his face. I never took you for someone skilled in games, the kind that real men play throughout the world. Not a chance. You're some skipper of profiteers, roving the high seas in his scudding craft, reckoning up his freight with a keen eye out for home cargo, grabbing the gold he can. You're no athlete, I see that. With a dark glance, wily Odysseus shot back, indecent talk, my friend. You, you're a reckless fool, I see that. So the gods don't hand out all their gifts at once, not build and brains and flowing speech to all. One man may fail to impress us with his looks, but a god can crown his words with beauty, charm, and men look on with delight when he speaks out. Never faltering, filled with winning self-control, he shines forth at assembly grounds, and people gaze at him like a god when he walks through the streets. Another man may look like a deathless one on high, but there's not a bit of grace to crown his words. Just like you, my fine, handsome friend. Not even a god could improve those lovely looks of yours, but the mind inside is worthless. Your slander fans the anger in my heart. I'm no stranger to sports, for all your taunts. I've held my place in the front ranks, I tell you, long as I could trust to my youth and striving hands. But now I'm wrestled down by pain and hardship. Look, I've borne my share of struggles, cleaving my way through wars of men and pounding waves at sea. Nevertheless, despite so many blows, I'll compete in your games. Just watch. Your insults cut to the quick. You rouse my fighting blood. Up he sprang, cloak and all, and seized a discus, huge and heavy, more weighty by far than those the Phaeacians used to hurl and test each other. Wheeling round, he let loose with his great hand and the stone word on, and down to ground they went, those lords of the long oars and master mariners, cringing under the rocks on rush, soaring lightly out of his grip, flying away past all the other marks, and Queen Athena, built like a man, staked out the spot and cried with a voice of triumph, "'Even a blind man, friend, could find your mark by groping round. It's not mixed up in the crowd, it's far in front. There's nothing to fear in this event. No one can touch you, much less beat your distance.' At that, the heart of the long-suffering hero laughed, so glad to find a ready friend in the crowd, that, lighter in mood, he challenged all Phaeacia's best. "'Now go match that, you young pups, and straight away I'll hurl you another just as far, I swear, or even farther. All the rest of you, anyone with the spine and spirit, step right up and try me. You've incensed me so. At boxing, wrestling, racing, nothing daunts me. Any Phaeacian here except Laudamas himself— the man's my host. Who would fight his friend? He'd have to be good for nothing, senseless. Yes, to challenge his host and come to grips and games, in a far-off land at that. He'd cut his own legs short. But there are no others I deny or think beneath me. I'll take on all contenders gladly, test them head to head. I'm no disgrace in the world of games where men compete. Well I know how to handle a fine polished bow, the first to, the first to hit my man in a mass of enemies even with rows of comrades pressing near me, taking aim with our shafts to hit our targets. Philoctetes alone outshot me there at Troy when ranks of Achaean archers bent their bows. Of the rest I'd say that I outclass them all, men still alive who eat their bread on earth. But I'd never vie with the men of days gone by, not Heracles, not Eurytus of Ochalia, archers who rivaled immortal powers with their bows. That's why noble Eurytus died a sudden death, no old age creeping upon him in his halls. Apollo shot him down, enraged that the man had challenged him, the archer god. As for spears, I can fling a spear as far as the next man wings an arrow. Only at sprinting I fear you'd leave me in the dust. I've taken a shameful beating out on heavy seas, no conditioning there on shipboard day by day. My legs have lost their spring. He finished. All stood quiet, hushed. Only Elsinus found a way to answer. Stranger, friend, nothing you say among us seems ungracious. You simply want to display the gifts you're born with. 
stung that a youngster marched up to you in the games, mocking, ridiculing your prowess as no one would who had some sense of fit and proper speech. But come now, hear me out, so you can tell our story to other lords as you sit and feast in your own halls some day, your own wife and your children by your side, remembering there our island prowess here. What skills great Zeus has given us as well, down all the years from our father's days till now? We are hardly world-class boxers or wrestlers, I admit, but we can race like the wind. We're champion sailors, too, and always dear to our hearts, the feast, the lyre and dance, and changes of fresh clothes, our warm baths and beds. So come, all you Phaeacian masters of the dance, now dance away, so our guest can tell his friends when he reaches home how far we excel the world in sailing, nimble footwork, dance and song. Go, someone, quickly, fetch Demodocus now, his ringing lyre. It must be hanging somewhere in the palace. At the king's word, the herald sprang to his feet and ran to fetch the vibrant lyre from the house. And stewards rose, nine in all, picked from the realm to set the stage for contests, masters at arms who leveled the dancing floor to make a fine, broad ring. The herald returned and placed the ringing lyre now in Demodocus's hands, and the bard moved toward the center, flanked by boys in the flush of youth, skilled dancers who stamped the ground with marvelous pulsing steps, as Odysseus gazed at their flying, flashing feet, his heart to glow with wonder. A rippling prelude, now the bard struck up an irresistible song, the love of Ares and Aphrodite crowned with flowers. How the two had first made love in Hephaestus's mansion, all in secret. Ares had showered her with gifts, and showered Hephaestus's marriage bed with shame, but a messenger ran to tell the god of fire. Helios, lord of the sun, who'd spied the couple lost in each other's arms and making love. Hephaestus, hearing the heart-wounding story, bustled toward his forge, brooding on his revenge, planted the huge anvil on its block and beat out chains not to be slipped or broken, all to pin the lovers on the spot. This snare the fire god forged, ablaze with his rage at war, then limped to the room where the bed of love stood firm, and round the posts he poured the chains in a sweeping net, with streams of others flowing down from the roof beam, gossamer fine as spider webs no man could see, not even a blissful god. The smith had forged a masterwork of guile. Once he'd spun that cunning trap around his bed, he feigned a trip to the well-built town of Lemnos, dearest to him by far of all the towns on earth. But the god of battle kept no blind man's watch. As soon as he saw the master craftsman leave, he plied his golden reins and arrived at once and entered the famous god of fire's mansion, chafing with lust for Aphrodite crowned with flowers. She'd just returned from her father's palace, mighty Zeus, and now she sat in her rooms as Ares strode right in and grasped her hand with a warm, seductive urging. Quick, my darling, come, let's go to bed and lose ourselves in love. Your husband's away. By now he must be off in the wilds of Lemnos, consorting with his ruckus, Sintian friends. So he pressed, and her heart raced with joy to sleep with war, and off they went to bed and down they lay. And down around them came those cunning chains of the crafty god of fire, showering down now till the couple could not move a limb or lift a finger. Then they knew at last there was no way out, not now. But now the glorious crippled smith was drawing near. He'd turned around miles short of the Lemnos coast, for the sun god kept his watch and told Hephaestus all. So back he rushed to his house, his heart consumed with anguish. Halting there at the gates, seized with savage rage, he howled a terrible cry, imploring all the gods, "'Father Zeus, look here, the rest of you happy gods who live forever. Here is a sight to make you laugh, revolt you too. Just because I am crippled, Zeus's daughter Aphrodite will always spurn me and love that devastating Ares, just because of his striking looks and racer's legs, while I am a weakling, lame from birth, and who's to blame? Both my parents. Who else? If only they'd never bred me. Just look at the two lovers, crawled inside my bed, locked in, in each other's arms. The sight makes me burn. But I doubt they'll want to lie that way much longer, not a moment more, mad as they are for each other. 
No, they'll soon tire of bedding down together, but then my cunning chains will bind them fast, till our father pays my bride gifts back in full, all I handed him for that shameless bitch his daughter, irresistible beauty, all unbridled too. So Hephaestus wailed as the gods came crowding up to his bronze-floored house. Poseidon, god of the earthquake, came, and Hermes came, the running god of luck, and the archer, Lord Apollo, while modesty kept each goddess to her mansion. The immortals, givers of all good things, stood at the gates, and uncontrollable laughter burst from the happy gods when they saw the god of fire's subtle, cunning work. One would glance at his neighbor, laughing out, A bad day for adultery, slow outstrips the swift. Look how limping Hephaestus conquers war, the quis quickest of all the gods who rule Olympus. The cripple wins by craft, the adulterer, he will pay the price. So the gods would banter among themselves, but Lord Apollo goaded Hermes on. Tell me, Quicksilver, giver of all good things, even with those unwieldy shackles wrapped around you, how would you like to bed the golden Aphrodite? Oh, Apollo, if only, the giant killer cried. Archer, bind me down with triple those endless chains. Let all you gods look on, and all you goddesses too, how I love to bed that golden Aphrodite. A peal of laughter broke from the deathless ones, but not Poseidon, not a smile from him. He kept on begging the famous smith to loose the god of war, pleading, his words flying, let him go. I guarantee you Ares will pay the price, whatever you ask, Hephaestus, whatever's right in the eyes of all the gods. But the famous crippled smith appealed in turn, God of the earthquake, please don't urge this on me. A pledge for a worthless man is a worthless pledge indeed. What if he slips out of his chains? His debts as well. How could I shackle you while all the gods look on? But the god of the earthquakes reassured the smith. Look, Hephaestus, if Ares scuttles off and away, squirming out of his debt, I'll pay the fine myself. And the famous crippled smith complied at last. Now there's an offer I really can't refuse. With all his force, the god of fire loosed the chains, and the two lovers, free of the bonds that overwhelmed them so, sprang up and away at once, and the war god sped to Thrace, while love, with her tale-tale laughter, sped to Paphos, Cypress Isle, where her grove and scented altar stand. There the graces bathed and anointed her with oil, ambrosial oil, the bloom that clings to the gods who never die, and swathed her round in gowns to stop the heart an ecstasy, a vision. That was the song the famous harper sang, and Odysseus relished every note as the islanders, the lords of the long oars and master mariners, rejoiced. Next the king asked Halius and Laudamas to dance, the two alone, since none could match that pair. So taking in hand a gleaming sea-blue ball made by the craftsman Polybus, Arching back, one prince would hurl it toward the shadowy clouds, as the other, leaping high into the air, would catch it, quickly, nimbly, before his feet hit ground again. Once they'd vied at throwing the ball straight up, they tossed it back and forth in a blur of hands as they danced across the earth that feeds us all, while boys around the ring stamped out the beat, and a splendid rhythmic drumming sound arose, and good Odysseus looked at his host, exclaiming, King Alcinous, shining among your island people, you boasted Phaeacia's dancers are the best. They prove your point. I watch, and I am amazed. His praises cheered the hallowed island king, who spoke at once to the master mariners around him. Hear me, my lords and captains of Phaeacia. Our guest is a man of real taste, I'd say. Come, let's give him the parting gifts a guest deserves. There are twelve peers of the realm who rule our land, thirteen counting myself. Let each of us contribute a fresh cloak and shirt and a bar of precious gold. Gather the gifts together, hurry, so our guest can have them all in hand when he goes to dine, his spirit filled with joy. As for Broadsea, let him make amends, man to man, with his words as well as gifts. His first remarks were hardly fit to hear. All assented and gave their own commands, each noble sent a page to fetch his gifts, and Broadsea volunteered in turn, obliging. Great Alcinous, shining among our island people, of course I'll make amends to our new-found friend as you request. I'll give the man this sword, 
It's solid bronze, and the hilt has silver studs. The sheath around it, ivory, freshly carved. Here's a gift our guest will value highly. He placed the silver-studded sword in Odysseus's hands with a burst of warm words. Farewell, stranger, sir. If any remark of mine gave you offense, may storm winds snatch it up and sweep it off. May the gods grant you safe passage home to see your wife. You've been so far from loved ones, suffered so. Tactful Odysseus answered him in kind, and a warm farewell to you too, my friend. May the gods grant you good fortune. May you never miss this sword, this gift you give with such salutes. You've made amends in full. With that he slung the silver-studded sword across his shoulder. As the sun sank, his glittering gifts arrived, and proud heralds bore them into the hall, where sons of King Alcinous took them over, spread them out before their noble mother's feet, a grand array of gifts. The king in all his majesty led the rest of his peers inside, following in a file, and down they sat on rows of high-backed chairs. The king turned to the queen and urged her, "'Come, my dear, bring in an elegant chest, the best you have, and lay inside it a fresh cloak and shirt, your own gifts. Then heat a bronze cauldron over the fire, boil water, so once our guest has bathed and reviewed his gifts, all neatly stacked for sailing, gifts our Phaeacian lords have brought him now, he'll feast in peace and hear the harper's songs. And I will give him this gorgeous golden cup of mine, so he'll remember Alcinous all his days to come, when he pours libations out in his own house to Father Zeus and the other gods on high. And at that Arete told her serving women, Set a great three-legged cauldron over the fire, do it right away. And hoisting over the blaze a cauldron, filling it brimful with bathing water, they piled fresh logs beneath and lit them quickly. The fire lapped at the vessel's belly, the water warmed. Meanwhile the queen had a polished chest brought forth from an inner room and laid the priceless gifts inside, the clothes and gold the Phaeacian lords had brought, and added her own gifts, a cloak and a fine shirt, and gave her guest instructions, quick and clear. Now look to the lid yourself and bind it fast with a good tight knot, so no one can rob you on your voyage, drifting into a sweet sleep as the black ship sails you home. Hearing that, the storm-tossed man secured the lid straight away. He battened it fast with a swift, intricate knot the Lady Circe had taught him long ago. And the housekeeper invited him at once to climb into a waiting tub and bathe. A hot, steaming bath. What a welcome sight to Odysseus's eyes. He'd been a stranger to comforts such as these since he left the lovely-haired Calypso's house, yet all those years he enjoyed such comforts there, never ending as if he were a god. And now, when maids had washed him, rubbed him down with oil, and drawn warm fleece and a shirt around his shoulders, he stepped from the bath to join the nobles at their wine. And there stood Nausicaa as he passed. Beside a column that propped the sturdy roof she paused, endowed by the gods with all her beauty, gazing at Odysseus right before her eyes. Wonderstruck, she hailed her guest with a winning flight of words. Farewell, my friend, and when you are at home, home in your own land, remember me at times. Mainly to me you owe the gift of life. Odysseus rose to the moment deftly, gently. Nausicaa, daughter of generous King Alcinous, may Zeus the Thunderer, Hera's husband, grant it so, that I travel home and see the dawn of my return. Even at home I'll pray to you as a deathless goddess all my days to come. You saved my life, dear girl. And he went and took his seat beside the king. By now they were serving out the portions, mixing wine, and the herald soon approached, leading the faithful bard, Demodocus, prized by all the people, seated him in a chair amid the feasters, leaning it against a central column. At once alert Odysseus carved a strip of loin, rich and crisp with fat, from the white-tusked boar that still had much meat left, and called the herald over. Here, herald, take this choice cut to Demodocus, so he can eat his fill, with warm regards from a man who knows what suffering is. From all who walk the earth, our bards deserve esteem and awe, for the muse herself has taught them paths of song. She loves the breed of harpers. 
The herald placed the gift in Demodocus's hands, and the famous blind bard received it overjoyed. They reached for the good things that lay outspread, and when they put aside desire for food and drink, Odysseus, master of many exploits, praised the singer. I respect you, Demodocus, more than any man alive. Surely the muse has taught you, Zeus's daughter, or god Apollo himself. How true to life, all too true. You sing the Achaeans' fate, all they did and suffered, all they soldiered through, as if you were there yourself or heard from one who was. But come now, shift your ground. Sing of the wooden horse Epius built with Athena's help, the cunning trap that good Odysseus brought one day to the heights of Troy, filled with fighting men who laid the city waste. Sing that for me, true to life as it deserves, and I would tell the world at once how freely the muse gave you the god's own gift of song. Stirred now by the muse, the bard launched out in a fine blaze of song, starting at just the point where the main Achaean force, setting their camps afire, had boarded the oar-swept ships and sailed for home, but famed Odysseus's men already crouched in hiding in the heart of Troy's assembly, dark in that horse the Trojans dragged themselves to the city heights. Now it stood there, looming, and round its bulk the Trojans sat debating, clashing, days on end. Three plans split their ranks, either to hack open the hollow vault with ruthless bronze, or haul it up to the highest ridge and pitch it down the cliffs, or let it stand, a glorious offering made to pacify the gods, and that, that final plan, was bound to win the day. For Troy was fated to perish, once the city lodged inside her walls, the monstrous wooden horse where the prime of Argive power lay in wait with death and slaughter bearing down on Troy. And he sang how troops of Achaeans broke from cover, streaming out of the horse's hollow flanks to plunder Troy. He sang how left and right they ravaged the steep city, sang how Odysseus marched right up to Deiphobus's house like the god of war on attack with diehard Menelaus. There, he sang, Odysseus fought the grimmest fight he had ever braved, but he won through at last, thanks to Athena's superhuman power. That was the song the famous harper sang, but great Odysseus melted into tears, running down from his eyes to wet his cheeks. As a woman weeps, her arms flung round her darling husband, a man who fell in battle, fighting for town and townsmen, trying to beat the day of doom from home and children. Seeing the man go down, dying, gasping for breath, she clings for dear life, screams and shrills. But the victors, just behind her, digging spear butts into her back and shoulders, drag her off in bondage, yoked to hard labor, pain, and the most heartbreaking torment wastes her cheeks. So from Odysseus's eyes ran tears of heartbreak now. But his weeping went unmarked by all the others. Only Alcinous, sitting close beside him, noticed his guest's tears, heard the groan in the man's labored breathing, and said at once to the master mariners around him, "'Hear me, my lords and captains of Phaeacia. Let Demodocus rest his ringing lyre now. This song he sings can hardly please us all. Ever since our meal began and the stirring bard launched his song, our guest has never paused in his tears and throbbing sorrow. Clearly grief has overpowered his heart. Break off this song. Let us all enjoy ourselves, the hosts and guests together. Much the warmer way. All these things are performed for him, our honored guest, the royal send-off here and gifts we give in love. Treat your guest and suppliant like a brother. Anyone with a touch of sense knows that. So don't be crafty now, my friend. Don't hide the truth I'm after. Fair is fair. Speak out. Come, tell us the name they call you there at home. Your mother, father, townsmen, neighbors round about. Surely no man in the world is nameless, all told. Born high, born low, as soon as he sees the light, his parents always name him, once he's born. And tell me your land, your people, your city, too, so our ships can sail you home. Their wits will speed them there. For we have no steersmen here among Phaeacia's crews, or steering oars that guide your common craft. Our ships know in a flash their mate's intentions. 
know all ports of call and all the rich green fields. With wings of the wind they cross the sea's huge gulfs, shrouded in mist and cloud. No fear in the world of foundering, fatal shipwreck. True, there's an old tale I heard my father telling once. Nosothus used to say that Lord Poseidon was vexed with us because we escorted all mankind and never came to grief. He said that one day, as a well-built ship of ours sailed home on the misty sea from such a convoy, the god would crush it, yes, and pile a huge mountain round about our port. So the old king foretold. And as for the god, well, he can do his worst or leave it quite undone, whatever warms his heart. But come, my friend, tell us your own story now, and tell it truly. Where have your rovings forced you? What lands of men have you seen? What sturdy towns? What men themselves? Who were wild, savage, lawless? Who were friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? Tell me, why do you weep and grieve so sorely when you hear the fate of the Argives, hear the fall of Troy? That is the God's work, spinning threads of death through the lives of mortal men, and all to make a song for those to come. Did one of your kinsmen die before the walls of Troy? Some brave man? A son by marriage? Father by marriage? Next to our own blood kin, our nearest, dearest ties. Or a friend, perhaps, someone close to your heart, staunch and loyal. No less dear than a brother, the brother-in-arms who shares our inmost thoughts. Hello, my name is Carson Spratt, and I'll be reading Book 9 of the Odyssey for you today. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke and turned and answered him, O great Alcinous, preeminent among all people, surely indeed it is a good thing to listen to a singer, such as this one before us, who is like the gods in his singing. For I think that there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant than when festivity holds sway among all the populace, and the feasters up and down the houses are sitting in order and listening to the singer, and beside them the tables are loaded with bread and meats, and from the mixing bowl the wine steward draws the wine and carries it about and fills the cups. This seems to my own mind to be the best of occasions. But now your wish was inclined to ask me about my mournful sufferings, so that I must mourn and grieve even more. What then shall I recite to you first of all? What leave till later? Many are the sorrows the gods of the sky have given me. Now first I will tell you my name, so that all of you may know me, and I hereafter, escaping the day without pity, be your friend and guest, though the home where I live is far away from you. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs, and my fame goes up to the heavens. I am at home in sunny Ithaca. There is a mountain there that stands tall, leaf-trembling Neritos and there are islands settled around it, lying one very close to another. There is Dulichion and Same, wooded Zakynthos, but my island lies low and away, last of all on the water toward the dark, with the rest below facing east and sunshine, a rugged place, but a good nurse of men. For my part, I cannot think of any place sweeter on earth to look at. For in truth, Calypso, shining among divinities, kept me with her in her hollow caverns, desiring me for her husband. And so likewise, Iain Circe, the guileful, detained me beside her in her halls, desiring me for her husband, but never could she persuade the heart within me. So it is that nothing is more sweet in the end than country and parents ever, even when far away one lives in a fertile place, when it is, in an alien country, far from his parents. But come, I will tell you of my voyage home with its many troubles, which Zeus inflicted on me as I came from Troy land. From Ilion the wind took me and drove me ashore at Ismaros by the Ciconians. I sacked their city and killed their people, and out of their city, taking their wives and many possessions, we shared them out, so none might go cheated of his proper portion. There I was for the light foot and escaping, and urged it, but they were greatly foolish and would not listen. And then and there much wine was being drunk, and they slaughtered many sheep on the beach and lumbering horn-curved cattle. But meanwhile the Caconians went and summoned the other Caconians, who were their neighbors living in the inland country, more numerous and better men, well skilled in fighting men with horses, but knowing too at need the battle on foot. They came at early morning, like flowers in season, or leaves, 
and the luck that came our way from Zeus was evil, to make us unfortunate, so we must have hard pains to suffer. Both sides stood and fought their battles there by the running ships, and with bronze-headed spears they cast at each other. And as long as it was early and the sacred daylight increasing, so long we stood fast and fought them off, though there were more of them. But when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking of cattle, then at last the Caconians turned the Achaeans back and beat them, and out of each ship six of my strong, grieved companions were killed, but the rest of us fled away from death and destruction. From there we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions. Even then I would not suffer the flight of my oar-swept vessels until a cry had been made three times for each of my wretched companions, who died there in the plain, killed by the Caconians. Cloud-gathering Zeus drove the north wind against our vessels in a supernatural storm, and huddled under the cloud scuds land alike and the great water. Night sprang from heaven. The ships were swept along, yawing down the current. The violence of the wind ripped our sails into three and four pieces. These then, in fear of destruction, we took down and stowed in the ship's hulls and rowed them on ourselves until we had made the mainland. There for two days and two nights together we lay up, for pain and weariness together eating our hearts out. But when the fair-haired dawn in her rounds brought on the third day, we, setting the masks upright, masts upright and hoisting the white sails on them, sat still and let the wind and the steersmen hold them steady. And now I would have come home unscathed to the land of my fathers, but as I turned the hook of Malia, the sea and current and the north wind beat me off course and drove me on past Kithera. Nine days then I was swept along by the force of the hostile winds on the fishy sea, but on the tenth day we landed in the country of the lotus eaters, who live on a flowering food, and there we set foot on the mainland and fetched water, and my companions soon took their supper there by the fast ships. But after we had tasted of food and drink, then I sent some of my companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eaters of bread, might live here in this country. I chose two men and sent a third with them as a herald. My men went on and presently met the lotus eaters, nor did these lotus eaters have any thoughts of destroying our companions, but they only gave them lotus to taste of. But any of them who ate the honey-sweet fruit of lotus was unwilling to take any message back, or to go away, but they wanted to stay there with the lotus-eating people, feeding on lotus, and forget the way home. I myself took these men back, weeping, by force, to where the ships were, and put them aboard under the rowing benches, and tied them fast, and gave the order to the rest of my eager companions to embark on the ships in haste, for fear someone else might taste of the lotus and forget the way home. And the men quickly went aboard and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the grey sea. From there, grieving still at heart, we sailed on further along, and reached the country of the lawless, outrageous Cyclopes, who, putting all their trust in the immortal gods, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything, but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation, wheat and barley, and also the grapevines, which yield for them wine of strength, and it is Zeus's rain that waters it for them. These people have no institutions, no meetings for councils. Rather, they make their habitations in caverns hollowed among the peaks of the high mountains, and each one is the law for his own wives and children, and cares nothing about the others. There is a wooded island that spreads away from the harbor, neither close in to the land of the Cyclopes, nor far out from it, forested. Wild goats beyond number breed there, for there is no coming and going of humankind to disturb them, nor are they visited by hunters, who in the forest suffer hardships as they haunt the peaks of the mountains. Neither again is it held by herded flocks, nor farmers, but all its days, never plowed up and never planted, it goes without people, and supports the bleating wild goats." For the Cyclopes have no ships with cheeks of vermilion, nor have they builders of ships among them, who could have made them strong-benched vessels, and these, if made, could have run them sailings to all the various cities of men, in the way that people cross the sea by means of ships and visit each other, and they could have made this island a strong settlement for them. For it is not a bad place at all, it could bear all crops in season, and there are meadowlands near the shores of the Grey Sea, well watered and soft. There could be grapes grown there endlessly, and there is smooth land for plowing. Men could reap a full harvest always in season, since there is very rich subsoil. 
Also, there is an easy harbor, with no need for a hawser nor anchor stones to be thrown ashore, nor cables to make fast. One could just run ashore and wait for the time when the sailor's desire stirred them to go and the right winds were blowing. Also, at the head of the harbor, there runs bright water, spring beneath rock, and there are black poplars growing around it. There we sailed ashore, and there was some god guiding us in through the gloom of the night. Nothing showed to look at, for there was a deep mist around the ships, nor was there any moon showing in the sky, but she was under the clouds and hidden. There was none of us there whose eyes had spied out the island, and we never saw any long waves rolling in and breaking on the shore. But the first thing was when we beached the well-benched vessels. Then, after we had beached the ships, we took all the sails down, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, we made a tour about the island, admiring everything there. And the nymphs, daughters of Zeus of the Aegis, started the hill-roving goats our way for my companions to feast on. At once we went and took from the ships curved bows and javelins with long sockets, and arranging ourselves in three divisions, cast about, and the god granted us the game we longed for. Now there were twelve ships that went with me, and for each one nine goats were portioned out, but I alone had ten for my portion. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine, for the red wine had not yet given out in the ships. There was still some left, for we had, for we all had taken away a great deal in storing jars when we stormed the Caconian sacred citadel. We looked across at the land of the Cyclopes, and they were nearby, and we saw their smoke and heard sheep and goats bleating. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I held an assembly and spoke forth before all. The rest of you who are my eager companions, wait here while I, with my own ship and companions that are in it, go and find out about these people, and learn what they, and learn what they are, whether they are savage and violent and without justice, or hospitable to strangers and with minds that are godly. So speaking, I went aboard the ship and told my companions also to go aboard and to cast off the stern cables. And quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks, and, sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the grey sea. But when we had arrived at the place which was nearby, there at the edge of the land we saw the cave, close to the water, high and overgrown with laurels, and in it were stabled great flocks, sheep and goats alike, and there was a fenced yard built around it with a high wall of grubbed-out boulders and tall pines and oaks with lofty foliage. Inside there lodged a monster of a man who now was herding the flocks at a distance away, alone, for he did not range with others, but stayed away by himself. His mind was lawless, and in truth he was a monstrous wonder made to behold, not like a man an eater of bread, but more like a wooded peak of the high mountain seen standing away from the others. At, the t at that time I told the rest of my eager companions to stay where they were beside the ship and guard it. Meanwhile, I choosing out the twelve best men among my companions, went on, but I had with me a goatskin bottle of black wine, sweet wine, given to me by Meron, son of Euanthes, and priest of Apollo, who bestrides Ismaros. He gave it because, respecting him with his wife and child, we saved them from harm. He made his dwelling among the trees of the sacred gro grove of Phoebus Apollo, and gave me glorious presents. He gave me seven talents of well-wrought gold, and he gave me a mixing bowl, made all of silver, and gave along with it wine, drawing it off in storing jars, twelve in all. This was a sweet wine, unmixed, a divine drink. No one of his servants or thralls that were in his household knew anything about it, but only himself and his dear wife and a single housekeeper. Whenever he drank this honey-sweet red wine, he would pour out enough to fill one cup, then twenty measures of water were added, and the mixing bowl gave off a sweet smell, magical, then, the, then would be no pleasure in holding off. Of this wine I filled a great wineskin full and took two provisions in a bag, for my proud heart had an idea that presently I would encounter a man who was endowed with great strength and wild, with no true knowledge of laws or any good customs. Quietly we made our way to the cave, but we did not find him there. He was off herding on the range with his fat flocks. We went inside the cave and admired everything inside it. Baskets were there, heavy with cheeses, and the pens crowded with lambs and kids. 
They had all been divided into separate groups, the firstlings in one place, and then the middle ones, the babies again by themselves. And all his vessels, milk pails and pans that he used for milking into, were running over with we. From the start, my companions spoke to me and begged me to take some of the cheeses, come back again, and the next time to drive the lambs and kids from their pens, and get back quickly to the ship again, and go sailing off across the salt water. But I would not listen to them. It would have been better their way, not until I could see him, see if he would give me presents. My friends were to find the sight of him in no way lovely. There we built a fire and made sacrifice. And helping ourselves to the cheeses, we, wait, we ate and sat waiting for him inside until he came home from his herding. He carried a heavy load of dried up wood to make a fire for his dinner and threw it down inside the cave, making a terrible crash. So in fear, we scuttled away into the cave's corners. Next, he drove into the cavern, all from the fat flocks that he would milk. But he left all the male animals, billy goats and rams, outside in his yard with the deep fences. Next thing, he heaved up and set into position the huge doorstop, a massive thing. No 22 of the best four-wheeled wagons could have taken that weight off the ground and carried it. Such a piece of sky-towering cliff that was, he set over his gateway. Next, he sat down and milked his sheep and his bleeding goats, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one to suck, then drew off half of the white milk and put it by in baskets made of wickerwork, served for cheeses, but let the other half stand in the milk pails so as to have it to help himself to and drink from, and it would serve for his supper. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, at last he lit the fire and saw us and asked us a question. Strangers, who are you? From where do you come sailing over the watery ways? Is it on some business, or are you recklessly roving pirates? Recklessly roving as pirates do when they sail on the salt sea and venture their lives as they wander, bringing evil to alien people. So he spoke, and the inward heart in us was broken in terror of the deep voice, and for seeing him so monstrous. But even so, I had words for an answer, and I said to him, We are Achaeans coming from Troy, beaten off our true course by winds from every direction across the great gulf of the open sea, making for home by the wrong way on the wrong courses. So we have come, so it has pleased Zeus to arrange it. We claim we are of the following of the son of Atreus, Agamemnon, whose fame now is the greatest thing under heaven. Such a city was that he sacked and destroyed so many people. But now in turn we come to you and our suppliants at your knees. If you might give us a guest present or otherwise some gift of grace, for such is the right of strangers. Therefore respect the gods, O best of men. We are your suppliants and Zeus, the guest god, who stands behind all strangers with honors due them avenges any wrong towards strangers and suppliants. So I spoke, but he answered me in pitiless spirit. Stranger, you are a simple fool, or come from far off, when you tell me to avoid the wrath of the gods or fear them. The Cyclopes do not concern themselves over Zeus of the Aegis, nor any of the rest of the blessed gods, since we are far better than they. And for fear of the hate of Zeus, I would not spare you or your companions either, if the fancy took me otherwise. But tell me, so I may know, where did you put your well-made ship when you came? Nearby or far off? So he spoke, trying me out, but I knew too much and was not deceived, but answered him in turn, and my words were crafty. Poseidon, shaker of the earth, has shattered my vessel. He drove it against the rocks on the outer coast of your country, cracked on the cliff. It is gone. The wind on the sea took it. But I, with these you see, got away from sudden destruction. So I spoke, but he in pitiless spirit answered nothing, but sprang up and reached for my companions, caught up two together and slapped them like killing puppies against the ground, and the brains ran all over the floor, soaking the ground. Then he cut them up limb by limb and got supper ready. And like a lion reared in the hills without leaving anything, ate them, entrails, flesh, and the marrowy bones alike. We cried out aloud and held up our hands to Zeus, seeing the cruelty of what he did, but our hearts were helpless. 
But when the Cyclops had filled his enormous stomach, feeding on human flesh and drinking down milk, unmixed with water, he lay down to sleep in the cave, sprawled out through his sheep. Then I took counsel with myself in my great-hearted spirit to go up close, drawing from beside my thigh the sharp sword, and stab him in the chest where the midriff joins on the liver, feeling for the place with my hand. But the second thought stayed me, for there we too would have perished away in sheer destruction, seeing that our hands could never have pushed from the lofty gate of the cave the ponderous boulder he had propped there. So, morning, we waited, just as we were for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, he lit his fire, and then set about milking his glorious flocks, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, again he snatched up two men and prepared them for dinner, and when he had dined, drove his fat flocks out of the cavern, easily lifting off the great doorstone. But then he put it back again like a man closing the lid on a quiver, and so the cyclops, whistling loudly, guided his fat flocks to the hills, leaving me there in the cave, mumbling my black thoughts of how I might punish him, how Athena might give me that glory. And as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. The cyclops had lying there beside the pen a great bludgeon of olive wood, still green. He had cut it so that when it dried out, he could carry it about, and we, looking at it, considered it to be about the size for the mast of a cargo-carrying broad black ship of twenty oars which crosses the open sea. Such was the length of it, such the thickness, to judge by looking. I went up and chopped a length of about a fathom, and handed it over to my companions and told them to shave it down, and they made it smooth while I was standing by them, sharpened the point, then put it over the blaze of the fire to harden. Then I put it well away and hid it under the ordure which was all over the floor of the cave, much stuff lying about. Next, I told the rest of the men to cast lots, to find out which of them must endure, with me, to take up the great beam and spin it in Cyclops' eye when sweet sleep had come over him. The ones drew it, whom I myself would have wanted chosen, four men, and I myself was the fifth, and allotted with them. With the evening he came back again herding his fleecy flocks, but drove all his fat flocks inside the wide cave at once, and did not leave any outside in the yard with the deep fence, whether he had some idea or whether a god so urged him. When he had heaved up and set in position the huge doorstop, next he sat down, and started milking his sheep and his bleeding goats, each of them in order, and put lamb or kid under each one. But after he had briskly done all his chores and finished, again he snatched up two men and prepared them for dinner. Then at last I, holding in my hands an ivy bowl full of the black wine, stood close up to the Cyclops and spoke out. Here, Cyclops, have a drink of wine now that you have fed on human flesh and see what kind of drink our ship carried inside her. I brought it for you and it would have been your libation had you taken pity and sent me home. But I cannot suffer your ra your rages. Cruel, how can any man come and visit you ever again now that you have done what has no sanction? So I spoke, and he took it and drank it off, and was terribly pleased with the wine he drank, and questioned me again, saying, Give me still more freely, and tell me your name straightway now, so I can give you a guest present to make you happy. For the grain-giving land of the Cyclopes also yields them wine of strength, and it is Zeus's rain that waters it for them. But this comes from where ambrosia and nectar flow in abundance. So he spoke, and I gave him the gleaming wine again. Three times I brought it to him and gave it to him. Three times he recklessly drained it. But when the wine had got into the brains of the Cyclops, then I spoke to him, and my words were full of beguilement. Cyclops, you ask me for my famous name. I will tell you then but you must give me a guest gift as you have promised. Nobody is my name. My father and mother call me nobody, as do all the others who are my companions. So I spoke, and he answered me in pitiless spirit. Then I will eat nobody after his friends, and the others I will eat first, and that shall be my guest present to you. He spoke and slumped away and fell on his back and lay there with his thick neck crooked over on one side. And sleep, who subdues all, came on and captured him, and the wine gurgled up from his gullet with gobs of human meat. This was his drunken vomiting. 
And then I shoved the beam underneath a deep bed of cinders, waiting for it to heat. And I spoke to all my companions in words of courage, so none should be in a panic and back out. But when the beam of olive, green as it was, was nearly at the point of catching fire and glowed, terribly incandescent, then I brought it close up from the fire, and my friends about me stood fast. Some great divinity breathed courage into us. They seized the beam of olive sharp at the end and leaned on it into the eye, while I, from above, leaning my weight on it, twirled it like a man with a brace and bit who bores into a ship timber. And his men from underneath, grasping the strap on either side, whirl it, and it bites resolutely deeper. So, seizing the fire point hardened timber, we twirled it in his eye, and the blood boiled around the hot point, so that the blast and scorch of the burning ball singed all his eyebrows and eyelids, and the fire made the roots of his eye crackle. As when a man who works as a blacksmith plunges a screaming great axe blade or plane into cold water, treating it for temper, since this is the way steel is made strong, even so Cyclops' eyes sizzled about the beam of the olive. He gave a giant horrible cry, and the rocks rattled to the sound, and we scuttled away in fear. He pulled the timber out of his eye, and it blubbered with plenty of blood. Then when he had frantically taken it in his hands and thrown it away, he cried aloud to the other Cyclopes who live around him in their own caves along the windy pinnacles. They, hearing him, came swarming up from their various places, and they stood around the cave and asked him what was his trouble. Why, Polyphemus, what do you want with all this outcry through the immortal night, and it made us all thus sleepless? Surely no mortal against your will can be driving your sheep off. Surely none can be killing you by force or treachery? Then from inside the cave, strong Polyphemus answered, Good friends, nobody is killing me by force or treachery. So then the others, speaking in winged words, gave him an answer. If alone as you are, none uses violence on you. Why, there is no avoiding the sickness sent by great Zeus, so you had better pray to your father, the Lord Poseidon. So they spoke as they went away, and the heart within me laughed over how my name and my perfect planning had fooled him. But the Cyclops, groaning aloud and in the pain of his agony, felt with his hands and took the boulder out of the doorway and sat down in the entrance himself, spreading his arms wide to catch anyone who tried to get out with the sheep, hoping that I would be so guileless in my heart as to try this. But I was planning so that things would come out the best way, and trying to find some release from death for my companions and myself too, combining all my resource and treacheries, as with life at stake, for the great evil was very close to us. And as I thought, this was the plan that seemed best to me. There were some male sheep, rams, well-nourished, thick and fleecy, handsome and large, with a dark depth of wool. Silently, I caught these and lashed them together with pliant willow withes from where the monstrous cyclops, lawless of mind, had used to sleep. <clears throat> I had them in threes, and the one in the middle carried a man, while the other two went on each side, so guarding my friends. Three rams carried each man, but as for myself, there was one ram, far the finest of all the flock. This one I clasped around the back, snuggled under the wool of the belly, and stayed there still, and with a firm twist of the hands and enduring spirit, clung fast to the glory of this fleece, unrelenting. So he grieved for the time, and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then the male sheep hastened out of the cave toward pasture, but the ewes were bleating all through the pens unmilked, their udders ready to burst. Meanwhile, their master, suffering and in bitter pain, felt over the backs of all his sheep, standing up as they were, but in his guilelessness did not notice how many men were fastened under the breasts of his fleecy sheep. Last of all the flock, the ram went out of the doorway, loaded with his own fleece and with me and my close counsels. Then feeling him, powerful Polyphemus spoke a word to him. My dear old ram, why are you thus leaving the cave last of the sheep? Never in the old days were you left behind by the flock, but long striding far ahead of the rest would pasture on the tender bloom of the grass, be first at running rivers, and be eager always to lead the way back to the sheepfold at evening. Now you are last of all. Perhaps you are grieving for your master's eye, which a bad man with his wicked companions put out after he had made my brain helpless with wine. This nobody, who I think has not yet got clear of destruction, 
If only you could think like us and only be given a voice to tell me where he is skulking away from my anger, then surely he'd be smashed against the floor and his brains go spattering all over the cave to make my heart lighter from the burden of all the evils this nittering nobody gave me. So he spoke and sent the ram along from him outdoors, and when we had got a little way from the yard in the cavern, first I got myself loose from my ram, then set my companions free, and rapidly then, with many a backward glance, we drove the long striding sheep, rich with fat, until we reached our ship, and the sight of us who had escaped death was welcome to our companions, but they began to mourn for the others. Only I would not let them cry out, but with my brows nodded to each man, and told them to be quick and to load the fleecy sheep on board our vessel and sail out on the salt water. Salt water. Quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the grey sea. But when I was as far from the land as a voice shouting carries, I called out aloud to the Cyclops, taunting him, Cyclops! In the end, it was no weak man's companions you were to eat by violence and force in your hollow cave, and your evil deeds were to catch up with you and be too strong for you, hard one! who dared to eat your own guests in your own house, so Zeus and the rest of the gods have punished you? So I spoke, and still more the heart in him was angered. He broke away the peak of a great mountain, and let it fly and threw it in front of the dark proud ship by only a little, and just failed to graze the steering oar's edge. But the sea washed up in the splash as the stone went under. The tidal wave it made swept us suddenly back from the open sea to the mainland again, and forced us on shore. Then I caught up in my hands the very long pole and pushed her clear again, and urged my companions with word and nodding my head to throw their weight on the oars and bring us out of the threatening evil, and they leaned on and rowed hard. But when we had cut through the sea to twice the previous distance, again I started to call out to Cyclops. My friends about me checked me, first one, then another speaking, trying to soothe me. Hard one, why are you trying once more to stir up this savage man, who just now threw his missile in the sea, forcing our ship to the land again? And we thought once more we were finished. And if he had heard a voice or any one of us speaking, he would have broken all our heads and our ship's timbers with a cast of a great jagged stone so strong as his throwing. So they spoke, but could not persuade the great heart in me. But once again, in the anger of my heart, I cried to him, Cyclops, if any mortal man ever asks you who it was that inflicted upon your eye this shameful blinding, tell him that you were blinded by Odysseus, sacker of cities. Laertes is his father, and he makes his home in Ithaca. So I spoke, and he groaned aloud and answered me, saying, Ah, uh, now... A prophecy spoken of old is come to completion. There used to be a man here, great and strong, and a prophet, Telemos, Eurymos' son, who for prophecy was preeminent and grew old as a prophet among the Cyclopes. This man told me how all this that has happened now must someday be accomplished, and how I must lose the sight of my eye at the hands of Odysseus. But always I was on the lookout for a man handsome and tall, with great endowment of strength on him to come here. But now the end of it is that a little man, nittering, feeble, has taken away the sight of my eye, first making me helpless with wine. So come here, Odysseus, grant, let me give you a guest gift, and urge the glorious shaker of the earth to grant you conveyance home, for I am his son. He announces himself as my father. He himself will heal me, if he will, but not any of the other one of not any other one of the blessed gods, nor any man who is mortal. So he spoke, but I answered him again and said to him, I only wish it were certain I could make you reft of spirit and life, and send you to the house of Hades, as it is certain that not even the shaker of the earth will ever heal your eye for you. So I spoke, but he then called to the Lord Poseidon in prayer, reaching both arms up toward the starry heaven. Hear me, Poseidon, who circle the earth, dark-haired. If truly I am your son, and you acknowledge yourself as my father, grant that Odysseus, Sacre of Cities, son of Laertes, 
who makes his home in Ithaca may never reach that home. But if it is decided that he shall see his own people and come home to his strong founded house and to his own country, let him come late in bad case with the loss of all his companions in someone else's ship and find troubles in his household. So he spoke in prayer, and the dark-haired god heard him. Then for the second time, lifting a stone far greater, he whirled it and threw, leaning into the cast his strength beyond measure, and the stone fell behind the dark, proud ship by only a little. It just failed to graze the steering oar's edge, and the sea washed up, washed up in the splash as the stone went under. The tidal wave drove us along forward and forced us onto the island. But after we had so made the island, where all the rest of our strong bench ships were waiting together, and our companions were sitting about them grieving, having waited so long for us, making this point we ran our ship on the sand and beached her, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach, and from the hollow ships bringing out the flocks of the cyclops, we shared them out so none might go cheated of his proper portion. But for me alone, my strong grieved companions accepted the ram when the sheep were shared, and I sacrificed him on the sands to Zeus, dark-clouded son of Kronos, lord over all, and burned him the thighs. But he was not moved by my offerings, but was still pondering on a way how all my strong bench ships should be destroyed and all my eager companions. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I urged on the rest of my companions and told them to go aboard their ships and to cast off the stern cables. And quickly they went aboard the ships and sat to the oarlocks, and sitting well in order, dashed their oars in the gray sea. From there we sailed further along, glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions. Hello, I'm Brandon LeBlanc from the Circe Institute. I'll be reading from the Lattimore translation. I'll be reading book 10. We came next to the Aeolian island where Aelos lived, Hippotas' son, beloved by the immortal gods on a floating island, the hole enclosed by a rampart of bronze not to be broken, and the sheer of the cliff runs upward to it. And 12 children were born to him in his palace, six of them daughters and six of them and six sons in pride of their youth. So he bestowed his daughters on his sons to be their consorts. And evermore beside their dear father and gracious mother, these feast and good things beyond number are set before them. And all their days, the house fragrant with food echoes in the courtyard. But their nights, they sleep each one by his modest wife under coverlets and on bedsteads corded for bedding. We came to the city of these men and their handsome houses. And a whole month, he entertained me and asked me everything of Ilion and the ships of the Argives and the Achaeans homecoming. And I told him all the tales that happened. But when I asked him about the way back and requested conveyance again, he did not refuse, but granted me passage. He gave me a bag made of skin taken off a nine year ox stuffed full inside with courses of all the blowing winds. But the son of Kronos had set him in charge over the winds and told them to hold them still or start them up at his pleasure. He stuttered away in the hollow ship tied fast with a silver string, so there should be no wrong breath of wind, not even a little, but set the west wind free to blow me and carry the ships and the men aboard them on their way. But it was not so to be, for we were ruined by our own folly. Nevertheless, we sailed on night and day for nine days, and on the tenth at last appeared the land of our fathers, and we could see people tending fires. We were very close to them. But then the sweet sleep came upon me, for I was worn out with always handling the sheet myself, and I would not give it up to any other companion so we could come home the quicker to our own country. But my companions talked with each other and said that I was bringing silver and gold home with me, given me by great-hearted Aelos, son of Hippotus. And thus they would speak to each other, each looking at the man next to him. See, now this man is loved by everybody and favored by all. Whenever he visits anyone's land and city and is bringing home with him his handsome treasures taken from the plunder of Troy, while we who have gone through everything he has on the same venture come home with our hands empty. Now too, Aelos in favor of friendship has given him all these goods. Let us quickly look inside and see what is there and how much silver and gold this bag contained inside it. 
So he spoke, and the evil counsel of my companions prevailed, and they opened the bag, and winds all burst out. Suddenly the storm caught them away and swept them over the water, weeping away from their own country. Then I, waking, pondered deeply in my own blameless spirit, where to throw myself over the side and die in the open water, or wait it out in silence and still be one of the living. And I endured it and waited, and hiding my face, I lay down in the ship, while all were carried on the evil blast of storm wind back to the Aeolian island with, and my friends grieving. There again, we set foot on the mainland and fetched water, and my companions soon took their supper there by the fast ships. But after we had tasted of food and drink, then I took along one herald with me and one companion and went up to the famous house of Alos. There I found him sitting at dinner with his wife and his own children. We came to the house beside the pillars, and on the doorstone we sat down, and their minds wondered at us, and they asked us, What brings you back, Odysseus? What evil spirit has vexed you? We sent you properly on your way so you could come back to your own country and house and whatever else is dear to you. So they spoke, and I, though sorry at heart, answered, My wretched companions brought me to ruin, helped by the pitiless sleep. Then make it right, dear friends, for you have the power. So I spoke to them, plying them with words of endearment. But they were all silent. Only the father found words and answered, O least of living creatures, out of this land, hurry. I have no right to see on his way, none to give passage to any man whom the blessed gods hate with such bitterness. Out, this arrival means you are hateful to the immortals. So speaking, he sent me groaning heavily out of his palace. And from there, grieving still at heart, we sailed on further. But the men's spirit was worn away with the pain of rowing and our own silliness, since homecoming seemed ours no longer. Nevertheless, we sailed on night and day for six days. And on the seventh came to the sheer citadel of Lemos, Telepilos of the Lastagones, where the one herdsman driving his flocks and hails another, who answers as he drives his flocks out. And there a man who could go without sleep could earn him double wages, one for herding the cattle, one for the silvery sheep. There the courses of the night and day lie close together. There as we entered the glorious harbor, which a sky towering cliff encloses on either side with no break anywhere, but and two projecting promontories facing each other run out toward the mouth, and there's a narrow entrance. There all the rest of them had their oar-swept ships in the inward part. There they tied up close together inside the hollow harbor, for there never was a swell of surf inside it, neither great nor small, but there was a pale calm on it. I myself, however, kept my black ship on the outside at the very end, making her fast to the cliff with a cable, and climbed to a rocky point of observation and stood there. From here, no trace of cattle nor working of men was visible. All we could see was the smoke going up from the country. So I sent companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eaters of bread, that might live here in this country. I chose two men and sent a third with them as a, as a herald. They left the ship and walked on a smooth road where the wagons carried the timber down from the high hills to the city. And there in front of the town, they met a girl drawing water. This was the powerful daughter of the Lacestonian Antiphantes, who had gone down to the sweet running wellspring a turkey, whence they could, would carry their water back to the city. My men stood by her and talked with her and asked her who was king of these people and who was lord over them. She readily pointed out to them the high roofed house of her father. But when they entered the glorious house, they found there a woman as big as a mountain peak, and the sight of her filled them with horror. At once she summoned famous Antiphantes, her husband, from their assembly, and he devised dismal death against them. He snatched up one of my companions and prepared him for dinner but the other two darted away in flight and got back to my ship. The king raised a cry through the city. Hearing him, the powerful Lestragones came swarming up from every direction, tens of thousands of them, and not like men, like giants. These, standing along the cliffs, pelted my men with man-sized boulders, and a horrid racket went up from the ships of men being killed and ships being smashed to pieces. They speared them like fish and carried them away for their joyless feasting. But while they were destroying them in their deep water harbor, meanwhile I, drawing from beside my thigh the sharp sword, chopped away the cable that tied the ship with the dark prow, and called out to my companions and urged them with all speed to throw their weight on the oars and escape the threatening evil. And they made the water fly, fearing destruction. Gladly my ship and only mine fled out from the overhanging cliffs to the open water, but the others were all destroyed there. From there, we sailed on further along 
glad to have escaped death, but grieving still at, at heart for the loss of our dear companions. We came to Aea, which is an island. There lived Circe, the lovely of the lovely hair, the dread goddess who talks with mortals, who is his own sister to the Mugent minded Aetes, for they both are children of Helios, who shines on mortals, and their mother, Percy, who in turn is daughter of Ocean. There we brought our ship to the shore in silence at a harbor fit for ships, and some god guided us in. There we disembarked, and for two days and two nights we lay there for sorrow and weariness eating out our hearts. But when the fair-haired dawn, her rounds brought on the third day, then at last I took up my spear again, my sharp sword, and went quickly from beside the ship to find a lookout place, to look for some trace of people, listen for some sound. I climbed to a rocky point of observation and stood there, and got a sight of smoke which came from the halls of Circe, going up from wide weighed earth, undergrowth, and forest. Then I pondered deeply my heart and my spirit, whether since I had seen the fire and smoke to investigate, but in the division of my heart, this way seemed the best to me, to go back first to the fast ship and the beach of the sea and give my companions some dinner, then send them forward to investigate. But on my way, I was close to the oar swept vessel. Some god, because I was all alone, took pity upon me and sent a great stag with towering antlers right in my very path. He had come from his range in the forest down to the river to drink, for the fierce strength of the sun was upon him. As he stepped out, I hit him in the middle of the back next to the spine so that the brazen spearhead smashed its way clean through. He screamed and dropped in the dust and the life spirit fluttered from him. I set my foot on him and drew the bronze spear out of the wound it had made and rested it on the ground while I pulled growing twigs and willow woods and braiding them to get into rope about six feet in length and looping them over the feet of this great monster on both sides, lashed them together. And with him loaded over my neck, went toward the black ship, propping myself on my spear, for there was no way to carry him on the shoulder, but holding him with one hand. He was such a very big beast. I threw him down by the ship and roused my companion standing beside each man and speaking to him in kind words. Dear friends, sorry as we are, we shall not yet go down into the house of Hades, not until our day is appointed. Come then, while there is something to eat and drink by the fast ship. Let us think of our food and not be worn out with hunger. So I spoke, and they listened at once to me and obeyed me, and unveiling their heads along the beach of the barren water, they admired the stag, and truly he was a very great beast. But after they had looked at him and their eyes had, laid, had enjoyed him, they washed their hands and set to preparing a communal high feast. So for the whole length of the day until the sun's setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I held my assembly and spoke forth to all of them. Hear my words, my companions, in spite of your heart's sufferings, dear friends, for we do not know where the darkness is, nor the sunrise, nor where the sun who shines upon people rises, nor where he sets. Then let us hasten to our minds and think whether there is any course left open to us. But I think there is none, for I climbed to a rocky place of observation and looked at the island, and the endless sea lies in all a circle around it, and the island itself lies low, and my eyes saw smoke rising in the middle through the undergrowth and the forest. So I spoke, and the inward heart of them was broken as they remembered Antiphates and the Gastonian, and the violence of the great-hearted cannibal Cyclops. And they wept loud and shrill, letting the big tears fall but there came no advantage to them for all their sorrowing. I counted off all my strong grief companions into two divisions and appointed a leader for each. I myself taking one while godlike like Locos had the other. Promptly then we shook the lots in a brazen helmet and the lot of great hearted Yuri Locos sprang out. He then went on his way and with him two and 20 companions weeping and we whom they left behind were mourning also. In the florist glen, they came upon the house of Circe. It was an open in an open place and put together from stones well polished. And all about it, there were lions and wolves of the mountains whom the goddess had given evil drugs and enchanted. And these made no attack on the men, but came up thronging about them, waving their long tails and fawning in the way that dogs go fawning about their master when he comes home from dining out, for he always brings back something to please them. So these wolves with great strong claws and lions came fawning about on my men. But they were afraid when they saw the terrible beasts, they stood there in the forecourt of the goddess with the glorious hair and heard Circe inside singing a sweet 
in a sweet voice as she went up and down a great design on a loom. Immortal such as goddesses have, delicate and lovely and glorious their work. Now Polites, leader of men, who is the best and dearest to me of my friends, began the discussion. Friends, someone inside going up and down a great piece of weaving is singing sweetly, and the whole place murmurs to the echo of it, whether she is a woman or a goddess. Come, let us call her. So he spoke to them, and the rest gave voice and called her. And at once she opened the shining doors and came out and invited them in. And all in their innocence entered. Only Eurylochus waited outside, for he suspected treachery. She brought them inside and seated them on chairs and benches and mixed them a potion with barley and cheese and pale honey added to Permanian wine. But she put into the mixture malignant drugs to make them forgetful of their own country. When she had given them this and they had drunk it down, the next th thing she struck them with her wand and drove them into the, her pig pens. And they took on the look of pigs with the heads and voices and bristles of pigs. But the minds within them stayed as they had been before. So crying, they went in, and before them, Circe threw down acorns them to eat, and ilix and cornel buds, such foods as pigs who sleep on the ground always feed on. Eurylochus came back again to the fast black ship to tell the story of our companions and of their dismal fate, but he could not get a word out, though he was trying to speak, but his heart was stunned by great sorrow, and both eyes filled with tears. He could think of nothing but lamentation. But after we had wondered at him and asked him questions, at last he told us about the loss of his other companions. We went, O glorious Odysseus, through the growth as you told us, and found a fine house in the glen. It was in an open place and put together from stones well polished. Someone, goddess or woman, was singing inside in a clear voice as she went up and down her loom. And they called her and spoke to her. And at once she opened the shining doors and came out and invited them in. And all in their innocence entered, only I waited for them outside for a suspected treachery. The whole lot of them vanished away together, nor did one single one come out, though I, though I sat and watched for a long time. So he spoke, and I slung my great bronze sword with the silver nails across my shoulders and hung my bow on also, and told him to guide me back to the same way he had gone. But he, clasping my knees in both hands, entreated me, and in a loud lamentation spoke to me and addressed me. Illustrious, do not take me against my will there. Leave me here, for I know you will never come back yourself, nor bring back any of your companions. Let us rather make haste, and with these who are left escape, for we still may avoid the day of evil. So he spoke, and I answered again in turn and said to him, Your locos, you may stay here eating and drinking, even where you are and beside the hollow black ship. Only I shall go, for there is strong compulsion upon me. So I spoke and started up from the ship and the seashore. But as I went up the lonely glens and was coming near to the great house of Circe, skilled in medicines, there as I came up to the house, Hermes of the golden staff met me on my way in the likeness of a young man with beard new grown, which is the most graceful time of young manhood. He took me by the hand and spoke to me and named me saying, where are you going unhappy man all alone through the hilltops, ignorant of the land lay and your friends are here in Circe's place in the shape of pigs and holed up in the close pig pens. Do you come here meaning to set them free? I do not think you will get back yourself, but must stay here with the others. But see, I will find you a way out of your troubles and save you. Here, this is a good medicine. Take it and go into Circe's house. It will give you power against the day of trouble. And I will tell you all the malevolent guiles of Circe. She will make you a potion and put drugs in the food, but she will not even so be able to enchant you for this good medicine, which I will give you now will prevent her. I will tell you the details of what to do. As soon as Circe with her long wand strikes you, then drawing from beside your thigh, your sharp sword, rush forward against Circe as if you were raging to kill her and she will be afraid and invite you to go to bed with her. Do not then resist and refuse the bed of the goddess for so she will set free your companions and care for you also, but bid her swear the oath of the blessed gods that she has no other evil hurt that she is devising against you. So she will not make you weak and unmanned once you are naked. So spoke Argofantes, and he gave me the medicine, which he picked out of the ground, and he explained the nature of it to me. It was black at the root, but with a milky flower. The gods call it moly. It is hard for mortal men to dig up, but the gods have power to do all things. Then Hermes went away, passing over the wooded island toward tall Olympos, and I meanwhile made my way to the house of Circe. But my heart was a storm in, in me as I went. Now st I stood outside at the doors of the goddess with the glorious hair, 
and standing, I shouted aloud, and the goddess heard me, and at once she opened the shining doors and came out and invited me in, and I, deeply troubled in my heart, went in with her. She made me sit down in a chair that was wrought elaborately and splendid with silver nails, and under my feet was a footstool. She made a potion for me to drink and gave it in a golden cup, and with evil thoughts in her heart, added the drug to it. Then, when she had given it and I drank it off, without being enchanted, she struck me with her wand and spoke and named me. Go to your sty now and lie down with your other friends there. So she spoke, but I, drawing from beside my thigh the sharp sword, rushed forward against Circe as if I were raging to kill her. But she screamed aloud and ran under my guard and clasping both knees in loud lamentation spoke to me and addressed me in winged words. What man are you and whence? Where are your city and parents? The wonder is on me that you drank my drugs and have not been enchanted, for no other man beside could have stood up under my drugs once he drank and they passed the barrier of his teeth. There's in mind, there's a mind in you no magic will work on. You are the resourceful Odysseus. Argafantes of the golden staff was forever telling me you would come to me on your way back from Troy with your fast black ship. Come then, put away your sword in its sheath and let us two go up into my bed so that lying together in the bed of love, we may then have faith and trust in each other. So she spoke and I answered her again and said to her, Circe, how can you ask me to be gentle with you when it is you who turned my companions into pigs in your palace? And now you have me to hear yourself. You treacherously ask me to go into your chamber and go to bed with you so that when I am naked, you can make me weakling unmanned. I will not be willing to go to bed with you unless you can bring yourself, O goddess, to swear me a great oath that there is no other evil hurt you devise against me. So I spoke and she at once swore me oath as I asked her, but after she had sworn me the oath and made an end of it, I mounted the surpassingly beautiful bed of Circe. Meanwhile, the four maidservants who wait on Circe in her house were busy at their work all through the palace. These are daughters born of the springs from the coppices and the sacred rivers which flow down to the sea. Of these, one laid the coverlets, splendid and stained in purple, over the backs of the chairs and spread on the seats the cloth to sit on. The second drew up silver tables and placed on them in front of the chairs and laid out the golden serving baskets upon them. The third mixed wine, kindly sweet and fragrant, in the silver mixing bowl and set out the golden goblets. The fourth one brought in water, then set about building up an abundant fire underneath the great cauldron and the water heated. But when the water had come to a boil and the shining bronze, then she sat me down in the bathtub and washed me from the great cauldron, mixing hot and cold just as I wanted, and pouring it over shoulders and head to make the heart wasting weariness for my limbs. When she had bathed me and anointed me with olive oil, she put a splendid mantle and a tunic upon me and made me sit down in a chair that was wrought elaborately and splendid with silver nails. And under my feet was a footstool. A maidservant brought water for us and poured it from a splendid and golden pitcher, holding it above a silver basin for us to wash. And she pulled a polished table before us. A grave housekeeper brought in bread and served it to us, adding many good things to it, generous with her provisions and told us to eat. But nothing pleased my mind, and I sat there thinking of something else, mindful of evil imaginings. When Circe noticed how I sat there without ever putting my hands to the food and with the strong sorrow upon me, she came close and stood beside me addressed, and addressed me in winged words. Why, Odysseus, do you sit so, like a man who has lost his voice, eating your heart out, but touch neither food nor drink? Is it that you suspect me of more treachery? But you have nothing to fear, since I have already sworn by my strong oath to you. So she spoke, but I answered her again and said to her, O oh, Circe, how could any man right in his mind ever endure to taste the food and drink that are set before him, until with his eyes he saw his pain set free? So then, if you are sincerely telling me to eat and drink, set them free so my eyes can again behold my eager companions. So I spoke, and Circe walked on out through the palace, holding her wand in her hand, and opened the doors of the pigsty and drove them out. They looked like nine-year-old porkers. They stood ranged and facing her, and she, making her way through their ranks, anointed each of them with some other medicine, and the bristles, grown upon them by the evil medicine Circe had bestowed upon them before, now fell away from them, and they turned back once more into men, younger than they had been, and taller for the eye to behold, and handsomer by far. They recognized me, and each of them clung to my hand. The lovely longing for lamentation came over us, and the house echoed terribly to the sound, and even the goddess took pity. And she, shining among goddesses, came close and said to me, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, 
Go back down now to your fast ship and the sand of the seashore. And first of all, drag your ship up to, on the land, stowing your possessions and all the ship's running gear away in the sea caves. And then come back, bringing with you your eager companions. So she spoke, and the proud heart in me was persuaded. And I went back down to my fast ship and the sand of the seashore. And there I found beside the fast ship my eager companions, pitiful in their lamentation and weeping big tears. And as in the country, the calves around the cows returning from the pasture back to the dung of the farmyard, well filled with grazing, come gambling together to meet them, and the pens no longer can hold them in, but lowing incessantly, they come running around their mothers. So these men, once their eyes saw me, came streaming around me in tears and in the spirit in them made them feel as if they were back in their own country, the very city of rugged Ithaca, where they were born and raised up. So they came in tears about me and cried in winged words, O great Odysseus, we are as happy to see you as returning as if we had come back to our own Ithacan country. But come, tell us about the death of our other companions. So they spoke, but I answered in soft words and told them, First of all, let us drag our ship up on the land, stowing our possessions and all the ship's running gear away in the sea caves, and then make haste, all of you, to come with me, so that you can see your companions in the sacred dwelling of Circe, eating and drinking, for they have all in abundance. So I spoke, and at once they did as I told them. Only Eurylochus was trying to hold back all my other companions. And he spoke to them and addressed them in winged words. Ah, poor wretches, where are we going? Why do you long for the evils of going down into Circe's palace? For she will transform the lot of us into pigs or wolves or lions. And so we shall guard her great house for her under compulsion. So too it happened with the Cyclops when our companions went into his yard, and the bold Odysseus was of their company for it was by this man's recklessness that these two perished. So he spoke, and I considered in my mind whether to draw out the long-edged sword from beside my big thigh and cut off his head and throw it on the ground, even though he was nearly related to me by marriage. But companions checked me, first one, then another speaking, trying to soothe me. Zeus sprung Odysseus, if you ask us to, we will leave this man here to stay where he is and keep watch over the ship. You show us the way to the sacred dwelling of Circe. So they spoke and started up from the ship and the seashore, nor would Eurylochus be left alone by the hollow ship, but followed along in fear of my fierce reproaches. Meanwhile, inside the house, Circe, with loving care, bathed the rest of my companions and anointed them well with olive oil and put about them mantles of fleece and tunics. We found them all together feasting well in the halls. When my men looked at each other in the face and knew one another, they burst into the out an outcry of tears and the whole house echoed. But she, shining among goddesses, came close and said to us, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful of Odysseus, no longer raise the soil of your lamentation. I too know all the pains you have suffered in the sea where the fish swarm and all the damage done you on the dry land by hostile men. But come now, eat your food and drink your wine until you gather back again into your chests, that kind of spirit you had in you when you first left the land of your fathers on rugged Ithaca. Now you are all dried out, dispirited from the constant thought of your hard wandering, nor is there any spirit in your festivity because of such suffering. So she spoke, and the proud heart in us was persuaded. There for all our days until a year was completed, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when it was the end of a year and the months wasted away, and the seasons changed, and the long days were accomplished. Then my eager companions called me aside and said to me, What ails you now? It is time to think about our own country. If truly it is ordained that you shall survive and come back to your strong founded house and to the land of your fathers. So they spoke, and the proud heart me was persuaded. So for the whole length of the day until the sun's setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, they lay down to sleep all about the shadowy chambers. But I, mounting the surpassingly beautiful bed of Circe, clasped her by the knees and entreated her, and the goddess listened to me, and I spoke to her and addressed her in winged words. O oh, Circe, accomplish now the promise you gave, that you would see me on my way home. The spirit within me is urgent now, as also in the rest of my friends who are wasting my heart away, lamenting around me when you are elsewhere. So I spoke, and she, shining among goddesses, answered, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, you shall no longer stay in my house when none of you wish to. But first, there is another journey you must accomplish and reach the house of Hades and of revered Persephone, there to consult with the soul of Tersaeus, the thespian. 
the blind prophet whose senses stay unshaken within him, to whom alone Persephone has granted intelligence, even after death, but the rest of them are flittering shadows. So she spoke, and the inward heart in me was broken, and I sat down in the bed and cried, nor did the heart in me wish to go on living any longer, nor to look on the sunlight. But when I had glutted myself with rolling about and weeping, then at last I spoke aloud and answered the goddess, Circe, who will be our guide on that journey? No one has ever yet in a black ship gone all the way to Hades. So I spoke, and she, shining among goddesses, answered, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful as Odysseus, let no need for a guide on your ship trouble you. Only set up your mast pole and spread the white sails upon it, and sit still and let the blast of the north wind carry you. But when you have crossed with your ship the stream of the ocean, you will find there a thickly wooded shore and the groves of Persephone, and tall black poplars growing and fruit perishing willows. Then beat your ship on the shore of the deep eddying ocean, and yourself go forward into the moldering home of Hades. There, Pyrophlegethion and Kokitos, which is an off break from the water of the Styx, flow in the Archeron. There is a rock there and the junction of two thunderous rivers. There, hero, you must go close in and do as I tell you. Dig a pit of about a cubit in each direction and pour it full of drink offerings for all the dead. First honey mixed with milk, then a second pouring of sweet wine and, th and a third water and over all then sprinkle white barley and promise many times to the strengthless heads of the parish dead. Returning to Ithaca, you will slaughter a barren cow, your best in the palace and pile a pyre with treasures and to Tercius apart, dedicate an all black ram the one conspicuous in all your sheep flocks. But when with your prayers you have entreated the glorious forward to the dead, then sacrifice one ram and one black female, turning them toward Erebos, but yourself turn away from them and make for, for where the river runs. And there the numerous souls of the parish dead will come and gather about you. Then encourage your companions and tell them, taking the sheep they are lying by, slaughtered with the pitiless bronze to skin these and burn them, and pray to the divinities, to Hades, the powerful, and to revered Persephone. While you yourself, drawing from beside your thigh the sharp sword, crouch there, and do not let the strengthless heads of the perished dead draw near to the blood, until you have questioned Tertius. Then leader of the host, the prophet will soon come to you, and he will tell you the way to go, the stages of your journey, and tell you how to make your way home on the sea where the fish swarm. So she spoke, and dawn of the golden throne came on us, and she put clothing on upon me, an outer cloak and a tunic, while she, the nymph, mantled herself in a gleaming white robe, fine woven and delightful, and around her waist she fastened a handsome belt of gold, and on her head was a wimple. While I walked all about the house and roused my companions, standing beside each man and speaking to him in kind words, no longer lie abed, dreaming away in sweet sleep. The queenly Circe has shown me the way, so let us go now. So I spoke, and the proud heart in them was persuaded. Yet I did not lead my, away my companions without some loss. There was one, Elpinor, the youngest man, not terribly powerful in fighting nor sound in his thoughts. This man, apart from the rest of his friends in search of cool air, had lain down drunkenly to sleep on the roof of Circe's palace. And when his companions stirred to go, he, hearing their tumult and noise of talking, started suddenly up and never thought when he went down to go by way of the long ladder, but blundered straight off the edge of the roof so that his neck bone was broken out of its sockets and his soul went down to Hades. Now as my men were on their way, I said a word to them. You think you are on your way back now to your own beloved country, but Circe has indicated another journey for us to the house of Hades and a revered Persephone, there to consult with the soul of Tertius, the Theban. So I spoke and the inward heart of them was broken. They sat down on the ground and lamented and tore their hair out, but there came no advantage to them from all their sorrowing. When we came down to our fast ship in the sand of the seashore, we sat down sorrowful and weeping big tears. Circe, meanwhile, had gone down herself to the side of the black ship and tethered aboard it a ram and one black female, easily passing by us unseen. Whose eyes can follow the movement of a god passing from place to place unless the god wishes? My name is David Beecham. I am a graduate of New St. Andrews, class of 2002. I am reading from Richmond, Lattimore's translation. Book 11. Now, when we had gone down again to the sea and our vessel, first of all we dragged the ship down into the bright water, 
and in the black hole set the mast in place and set sails, and took the sheep and walked them aboard, and ourselves also embarked. But sorrowful and weeping big tears, Circe of the lovely hair, the dread goddess who talks with mortals, sent us an ex excellent company, a following wind filling the sails to carry from astern the ship with the dark prow. We ourselves over all the ship making fast the running gear sat still and let the wind and the steersman hold her steady. All day long her sails were filled as she went through the water and the sun set and all the journeying ways were darkened. She made the limit, which is of the deep running ocean. There lie the community and city of Cimmerian people, hidden in fog and cloud. Nor does Helios, the radiant sun, ever break through the dark to illuminate them with his shining, neither when he climbs up into the starry heaven, nor when he wheels to return again from heaven to earth. But always a glum night is spread over the wretched mortals. Making this point, we ran the ship ashore, and took out the sheep and ourselves walking along by the stream of the ocean until we came to that place of which Circe had spoken. There Perimedes and Eurylochus held the victims fast, and I, drawing from beside my thigh my sharp sword, dug a pit of about a cubit in each direction, and poured it full of drink offerings for all the dead, first honey mixed with milk, and second pouring with sweet wine, and third water, and over it all I sprinkled white barley. I promised many times to the strengthless heads of the parish dead that, returning to Ithaca, I would slaughter a barren cow, my best in my place, and pile the pyre with treasures, and Teresius apart would dedicate an all-black ram, the one conspicuous in all our sheep flocks. Now when, with sacrifices and prayers, I had so entreated the hordes of the dead, I took the sheep and cut their throats over the pit, and the dark clouding blood ran in, and the souls of the perished dead gathered to the place, up out of Erberos. Brides and young unmarried men and long-suffering elders, virgins, tender and with sorrows of their young hearts upon them, and many fighting men killed in battle, stabbed with brazen spears, still carrying their bloody armor upon them. These came swarming around my pit from every direction, with inhuman clamor, and green fear took hold of me. Then I encouraged my companions and told them, taking the sheep that were lying by, slaughtered with the pitiless bronze, to skin these and burn them, and pray to the divinities, to Hades the powerful, and to revered Persephone, while I myself, drawing from beside my thigh my sharp sword, crouched there, and would not let the strengthless heads of the perished dead draw nearer to the blood, until I had questions Teresius. But first there came the soul of my companion Elpinor, for he had not yet been buried under earth of the wide way since we had left his body behind in Circe's palace, unburied and unwept, with his other errand before us. I broke into tears at the sight of him, and my heart pitied him, and so I spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words. Elpinor, how did you come here beneath the fog and the darkness? You have come faster on foot than I could in my black ship. So I spoke, and he groaned aloud and spoke and answered, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, the evil will of the spirit and the wild wine bewildered me. I lay down on the roof of Circe's palace and never thought when I went down to go by way of the long ladder, but blundered straight off the edge of the roof so that I broke my neck broke and was broken out of its socket and my soul went down to Hades. But now I pray you, by those have, you have yet to see, who are not here, by your wife and by your father, who reared you when you were little, and by Telemachus, who you left alone in your palace. For I know that after you leave this place and the house of Hades, you will put back with your well-made ship to the islands, Aiaia. There, at that time, my lord, I ask that you remember me, and do not go and leave me behind, unwept, unburied. But when you leave, for fear I might become the gods' curse upon you, but burn me there with all my armor that belongs to me, and heap up a grave mound beside the beach of the gray sea for an unhappy man, so that those who come will know me, know of me. Do this for me, and on top of the grave mound plant the oar with which I rode when I was alive and among my companions. So he spoke, and I in turn spoke to him in answer. All this, my unhappy friend, I will do for you as you ask me. 
So we two stayed there exchanging our sad words, I on one side holding my sword over the blood, while opposite me the phantom of my companion talked long with me. Next there came to me the soul of my dead mother, Anticlea, daughter of great-hearted great Autolycus, whom I had left alive when I went to sacred Ilion. I broke into tears at the sight of her, and my heart pitied her. But even so, for all my thronging sorrow, I would not let her draw near the blood until I had questioned Tiresias. Now came the soul of Tiresias, the Theban, holding a staff of gold, and he knew who I was, and spoke to me. Son of Laertes, and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, how is this? How is it then, unhappy man, that you have left the sunlight and come here to look on dead men and this place without pleasure? Now draw back from the pit and hold your sharp sword away from me, so that I can drink of the blood and speak the truth to you. So he spoke, and I, holding away the sword with the silver nails, pushed it back in the sheath, and the flawless prophet, after he had drunk the blood, began to speaking to me. Glorious Odysseus, what you are after is sweet homecoming, but the god will make it hard for you. I think you will not escape the shaker of the earth who holds a grudge against you in his heart, and because you blinded his dear son, hates you. But even so, and still you might come back after much suffering, if you can contain your own desire and contain your companions, at that time when you first put in your well-made vessel at the island Thrinachia, escaping the sea's blue water, and there discover pasturing the cattle and fat sheep of Helios, who sees all things and listens to all things. Then, if you keep your mind on homecoming and leave these unharmed, you might all t make your way back way to Ithaca after much suffering. But if you harm them, then I testify to the destruction of your ship and your companions. But if you let yourself get clear, you will come home in bad case and with loss of all your companions and someone else's ship and finding troubles in your household. Insolent men who are eating away your livelihood and courting your godlike wife and offering gifts to win her. You may punish the violences of these men when you come home, but after you have killed these suitors in your own place, either by treachery or openly with the sharp bronze, then you must take up your well-shaped oar and go on a journey until you have come to where there are men living who know nothing of the sea and who eat food that is not mixed with salt, who never have known ships whose cheeks are painted purple, who never have known well-shaped oars which act for ships as wings do. And I will tell you a very clear proof, and you cannot miss it. When, as you walk, some other wayfarer happens to meet you and says you carry a winnow fan on your bright shoulder, then you must plant your well-shaped oar in the ground and render ceremonies sacrificed Render ceremonies sacrificed to the Lord Poseidon, one ram and one bull, and a mounter of sows, a boar pig, and make your way home again, and render holy hecatombs to the immortal gods to ho who hold the wide heaven, all of them in order. Death will come to you from the sea in some altogether unwarlike way, and it will end you in the ebbing time of a sleek old age. Your people about you will be prosperous. All this is true that I can tell you. So he spoke, but I in turn said to him in answer, all this Tiresias surely must be as the gods spun it. But come now, tell me this, and give me an accurate answer. I see before me now the soul of my perished mother, but she sits beside the blood in silence, and has not yet deigned to look directly at her own son and speak a word to me. Tell, them, tell me, Lord, what will make her know me and know my presence? So I spoke, and he at once said to me in answer, Easily I will tell you and put it in your understanding. Any one of the perished dead you allow to come up to the blood will give you an, a true answer, but if you begrudge this to any one, he will return to the place from where he came from. So speaking, the soul of the Lord Tiresias went back into the house of Hades once he had uttered his prophecies while I waited steadily where I was standing, until my mother came and drank the dark, clouding blood, and at once she knew me, and full of lamentation she spoke to me in winged words. My child, how did you come here, beneath the fog and the darkness, and still alive? All this is hard for the living to look on, for in between lie the great rivers and terrible waters that flow. Ocean, first of all, which there is no means of crossing on foot, not unless one has a well-made ship. 
Are you come now to this place from Troy with your ship and your companions after wandering a long time, and have not yet come to Ithaca, and there seen your wife in your palace? So she spoke, and I in turn said to her in answer, Mother, a duty brought me here to the house of Hades. I had to consult the soul of Tiresias the Theban, for I have not yet been near Achaean country, nor ever set foot on our land, but always suffering. I have wandered since the time I first went along with great Agamemnon to Ilion, land of good horses and the battle against the Trojans. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. What doom of death that lays men low has been your undoing? Was it at long sickness, or did Artemis of the arrows come upon you with her painless shafts and destroy you? And tell me of my father and son whom I left behind. Is my inheritance still with them, or does some other man hold them now, and thinks I will come no more? Tell me about the wife I married, that she wants what she is thinking, and whether she stays fast by my son and guards everything, or if she has buried the best man among the Achaeans. So I spoke, and my queenly mother answered me quickly, all too much with enduring heart she does wait for you there in your own palace, and always with her ret the wretched nights, and the days also waste her away, away with weeping. No one yet holds your fine inheritance, but in freedom Telemachus administers your allotted lands and apportions the equal feasts, working that befits a man with authority to judge, for all call him in. Your father remains on the estate where he is, and does not go to the city. There is no bed there, nor is there bed clothing, nor blankets, nor shining coverlets. But in the winter time he sleeps in the house where the thralls do, in the dirt next to the fire and with foul clothing upon him. But when summer comes and the blossoming time of harvest, everywhere he has places to sleep on the ground, on fallen leaves and piles along the raised, rising ground of his orchard. And there he lies grieving and sorrows grow, sorrow grows big within him as he longs for your homecoming and harsh old age is on him. And so it was with me also, and that was the reason I perished. Nor in my palace did the Lady of Arrows, well aiming, come upon me with her painless shafts and destroy me, nor was I visited by sickness, which beyond other things takes the life out of the man with hateful weakness. But shining Odysseus, it was my longing for you, your cleverness and your gentle ways, that took the sweet spirit of life from me. So she spoke, but I pondered in my, it in my heart, yet wished to take the soul of my dead mother in my arms. Three times I started toward her, and my heart was urgent to hold her, and three times she fluttered out of my hands like a shadow, or a dream, and the sorrow sharpened at the heart within me. And so I spoke to her and addressed her in winged words, saying, Mother, why will you not wait for me when I am trying to hold you, so that even in Hades, with our arms embracing, we can both take the satisfaction of dismal mourning? Or are you nothing but an image that proud Persephone sent my way to make me grieve all the more for sorrow. So I spoke, and my queenly mother answered me quickly, O oh, my child, ill-fated beyond all other mortals, this is not Persephone, daughter of Zeus, beguiling you, but it is only what happens when they die to all mortals. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bones together, and once the spirit has left the white bones, all the rest of the body is made subject to the fire's strong fury, but the soul flutters out like a dream and flies away. Therefore you must strive back towards the light again with all speed, but remember the, these things for your wife, so that you may tell her hereafter. So we too were conversing back and forth, and the women came to me. They were sent my way by proud Persephone. These were all who had been the wives and daughters of princes, and now they gathered in swarms around the dark blood. I then thought about a way to question them, each by herself, as I thought this was the plan that seemed best to me. Drawing out the long-edged sword from beside my big thigh, I would not let them all drink the dark blood at the same time. So they waited and came to me in order, and each one I told me, told me about her origin, and I questioned all of them. There first I saw Tyro, glorious descended, and she told me she was the daughter of the stately Salmoneus, but she was, set, she was the wife of Cretheus, son of Aeolus, and she was in love with a river god Anipius, by far the handsomest of all the rivers whose streams crossed over the earth. And she used to, used to haunt Anipius' beautiful waters, taking his likeness. The god who circles the earth and shakes it lay with her with, where the swirling river finds its outlet, and sea-blue wave curved into a hill of water reared up about the two to hide the god and the mortal woman. 
and he broke her virgin zone and drifted asleep upon her. But when the god had finished with the act of love-making, he took her by the hand and spoke to her and named her, saying, Be happy, lady, in this love, and when the years passes, you will bear glorious children, for the couplings of the immortals are not without issue. You must look after them and raise them. Go home now and hold your peace and tell nobody my name, but I will tell you I am the earth-shaker Poseidon. So he spoke and divided back into the heaving water of the sea, but she conceived and bore Peleus and Neleus. The both of these grew up to be strong henchmen of mighty Zeus. Peleus lived rich in sheep flocks in the wide spaces of Iolcos, while the other was king in Sandy Pylos. But this queen among women bore the rest of her children to Cretheus, Ison and Pheris and Amatheon delighting in horses. After her I saw Antiope, who was the daughter of Asopus, who claimed she had also lain in the embraces of Zeus and borne two sons to him, Amphion and Zethos. The first established the foundations of seven-gated Thebes and built the bulwarks, since without bulwarks they could not have lived for all their strength in Thebes of the wide spaces. After her I saw Amphitryon's wife, Alcmene, who after lying in love in the embraces of great Zeus brought forth Heracles, lion-hearted and bold of purpose, and I saw Megara, daughter of high-spirited Creon, whom Amphitryon's bold and weariless son had married. I saw beautiful Epicaste, Oedipodes' mother, who in the ignorance of her mind had done a monstrous thing when she married her own son. He killed his father and married her, but the gods soon made all known to mortals. But he, for all his sorrows, in beloved Thebes continued to be lord over Cadmeans all through the bitter designing of the gods, while she went down to Hades of the gates, the strong one, nodding a noose and hanging sheer from the high ceiling in the constraint of her sorrow, but left to him who survived her all the sorrows that are brought to pass by a mother's furies. And I saw Chloris surpass, surpassingly lovely, the one whom Neleus married for her beauty and giving numerous gifts to win her, she was the youngest daughter of Iasus' son Amphion, who once ruled strongly over Orchomenos of the Minyae. So, he was, so she was queen of Pylos, and she bore him glorious children, Nestor and Chromios and proud Periclymenos. Also she bore that marvel among mortals, majestic Pero, whom all the heroes around, around about courted, but Neleus would not give her to any, unless he could drive away the broad-faced, horn-curved cattle of strong Iphicles out of Philake. It was hard to do, and only the blameless seer Melampus undertook it, but he was bound fast by hard destiny of the god and painful fetters on him and the loudish oxherds. But when the months and days had come to an end and the year had gone full circle and come back with the seasons returning, then strong Iphicles released him, and he had told him all the prophecies he knew, and the will of Zeus was accomplished. And I saw Leda, who had been the wife of Tyndareos, and she had borne to, to Tyndareos two sons with strong hearts, Castor, breaker of horses, and the strong boxer, Polydukes. The life-giving earth holds both of them, yet they are still living, and even underneath the earth enjoy the honor of Zeus. They, still, they live still every other day, on the next day they are dead, but they are given honor even as gods are. After her I saw Iphimedia, wife of Aelius, but she told me how she had been joined in love with Poseidon and borne two sons to him, but these in the end had not lived long, Atos the god and the far-famed Ephialtes. And these were the tallest men the grain-giving earth had brought forth ever, and the handsomest by far, after famous Orion. When they were only nine years old, they measured nine cubits across, but in height they grew to nine fathoms, and even made threats against the immortal gods on Olympus, that they would carry the turmoil of battle with all its many sorrows against them, and were minded to pile Asa on Olympus, and above Asa Pelion of the trembling leaves to climb the sky, Surely they would have carried it out if they had come to maturity. But the son of Zeus, whom Leto with the ordered hair had borne him, Apollo killed them both before ever the down gathered below their temples, or on their chin the beards had blossomed. I saw Phaedra, 
and Procus, and Ariadne, the beautiful daughter of malignant Minos. Theseus at one time was bringing her from Crete to the high ground of sacred Athens, but got no joy of her, since before that Artemis killed her in sea-washed Dia when Dionysus bore witness against her. I saw Mera, Clymene, and Eriphyle, the hateful, who accepted precious gold for the life of her own dear husband. But I cannot tell over the whole number of them, nor name all the women I saw who were the wives and daughters of heroes, for before that the divine night would give out. It is time now for my sleep, either joining my companions on board the fast ship or here, but you and the gods will see my homeward journey. So he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence, held in thrall by the story all through the shadowy chambers. Now it was white-armed Arete who began the discourse. Phaeacians, what do you think now of this man before you, for beauty and stature, and for the mind well balanced within him? And again he is my own guest, but each one of you has some part in honoring him. Do not hurry to send him off, nor cut short his gifts when he is in such need, for you all have many possessions by the grace of the gods stored up in your palaces. Then in turn the aged hero Echeneus both spoke forth who is the most advanced in age of all the Phaeacians. Friends, our circumspect queen is not off the mark in her speaking, nor short of what be expected of her. Do then as she tells us. From now on the word and the act belong to Alcanus. Then in turn Alcanus spoke to him and answered, Even so this word will be mine to say, as long as I am alive and king over all the oar-loving Phaeacians. But let our guest, much though he longs for the homeward journey, still endure to wait till tomorrow, till until I have raised all the contribution. But the men shall see to his convoy home, and I most of all, for mine is the power in this district. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, O great Alcanos, preeminent among all people, if you urged me to stay here even for the length of a year, and still sped my conveyance home and gave me glorious presence, that would be what I wished. There would be much advantage in coming back with a fuller hand to my own dear country, and I would be more respected so and be more popular with all people who saw me make my return to Ithaca. Then Alcanos answered him in turn and said to him, Odysseus, as we look upon you, do not imagine that you are a dece deceptive or thievish man, the sort of that the black earth breeds in great numbers, people who wander widely, making up lying stories from which no one could learn anything. You have a grace upon your words, and there is sound sense within them, and expertly as a singer would do, you have told the story of the dismal sorrows befallen yourself and all the Ar and all of the Argives. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. Did you see any of your godlike companions who once with you went to Ilion and there met their destiny? Here is a night that is very long, it is endless. It is not yet time yet to sleep in the palace, but go on telling your wonderful story. I myself can hold out until the bright dawn, if only you could bear to tell me, here in the palace of your sufferings. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him, O great Alcanos, preeminent among all people, there is a time for many words and a time for sleeping, but if you insist upon hearing me still, I would not begrudge you the tale of these happenings and others yet more pitiful to hear, the sorrows of my companions who perished later, who escaped onslaught and cry of battle, but perished for all, perished all for the sake of a vile woman on the homeward journey. Now when chaste Persephone had scattered the female souls of the women, driving them off in every direction, there came the soul of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, grieving and the souls of the other men who died with him and met their doom in the house of Aegisthus were gathered around him. He knew me at once, and he drank the dark blood and fell, and fell to lamentation loud and shrill, and the tears came springing and threw himself into my arms, meaning so to embrace me. But there was no force there any longer, nor any juice left now in his flexible limbs as there had been in time past. I broke into tears at the sight of him, and my heart pitied him, and so I spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words. Son of Atreus, most lordly and king of men, Agamemnon, what doom of death that lays men low has been your undoing? Was it with the ships, and did Poseidon, rousing a storm-blast of battering winds and none would wish for? 
prove your undoing? Or was it on the dry land? Did men in battle destroy, in battle destroy you as you tried to cut out cattle and fleecing sheep from their holdings or fighting against them for the sake of their city and women? So I spoke, and he in turn said to me in answer, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, not in the ships, nor did Poseidon, rousing a storm blast of battering winds that none would wish for, prove my destruction. Nor on dry land did enemy men destroy me in battle. Aegisthus, working out my death and destruction, invited me to his house and feasted me and there killed me there with the help of my sluttish wife as one cuts down an ox at his manger. So I died a most pitiful death, and my other companions were killed around me without mercy, like pigs with shining tusks in the house of a man rich and very powerful, for a wedding or a festival or a communal dinner. You have been present in your time at the slaughter of many men, killed singly or in the strong encounters of battle, but beyond all others you would have been sorry at heart for this scene, how we lay sprawled by the mixing bowl and the loaded tables all over the place, and the whole floor was steaming with blood. And most pitiful was the voice I heard of Priam's daughter Cassandra, killed by treacherous Clytemnestra over me. But I lifted my hands, and with them beat on the ground as I died upon the sword. But the sluttish woman turned away from me, and was so hard that her hands would not press shut my eyes and mouth, though I was going to Hades. So there is nothing more deadly or more vile than a woman who stores her mind with acts that are of such sort as this one when she thought of this act of dishonor and plotted the murder of her lawful husband. See, I had been thinking that I would be welcome to my children and thralls of my household when I came home, but she with thought surpassingly grisly splashed the shame on herself and the rest of her sex, on women still to come and on the, the one whose acts are virtuous. So he spoke, and I again said to him in answer, Shame it is, for how terribly Zeus of the wide brows from the beginning had, has been hateful to the seed of Atreus through the schemes of women. Many of us died for the sake of Helen, and when you were far, Clytemnestra plotted treason against you. So I spoke, and he in turn said to me in answer, So by this do not be easy even with your wife, nor give her an entire account of all you are sure of. Tell her part of it, but lest the rest be hidden in silence. And yet you, Odysseus, will never be murdered by your wife. The daughter of Icario's circumspect Penelope is all too virtuous, and her mind is stored with good thoughts. Ah, well, she was only a young wife when we left her, and went off to the fighting, and she had an infant child then at her breast. That child now must sit with the men and be counted. Happy he, for his dear father will come back and see him, and he will fold his arm his father in his arms as is right. My wife never even let me feed my eyes with the sight of my own son, but before that I, that I myself was killed by her. And put away in your heart this other thing that I tell you. When you bring your ship into your own country, do it secretly, not in the open. There is no trusting in women. But come now, tell me this and give me an accurate answer. Tell me if you happen to hear that my son was still living, whether perhaps in Orchomenus or in Sandy Pylos, or perhaps with Menelaus in wide Sparta, for nowhere upon the earth has there been any death of noble Orestes. So he spoke, and I again said to him in answer, Son of Atreus, why do you ask me that? I do not know if he is alive or dead. It is bad to babble em emptily. So we two stood there exchanging our sad words, grieving both together and shedding the big tears. After this there came to us the soul of Peleus' son, Achilles, and the soul of Patroclus, and the soul of stately Antilochus, and the soul of Aias, for who, who for beauty and stature was greatest of all the Danans, next to the stately son of Peleus, the soul of swift-footed Achilles, scion of Achaius, knew me, and, fully, and full of lamentation he spoke to me in winged words, Son of Laertes, and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, hard man, what made you think of this bigger endeavor? How could you endure to come down here to Hades' place, where the senseless dead dwell, mere imitations of perished mortals? So he spoke, and I again said to him in answer, Son of Peleus, far the greatest of the Achaeans, Achilles, I came for the need to consult Teresius, if he might tell me some plan by which I might come back to rocky Ithaca. For have, I have not yet been near Achaean country, 
nor has ever set foot in my land, but always I have had troubles, Achilles. No man before has been more blessed than you, nor ever will be. Before, when you were alive, we Argives honored you as we did the gods, and now in this place you have great authority over the dead. Do not grieve even in death, Achilles. So I spoke, and he in turn said to me in answer, O shining Odysseus, never try to console me for dying. I would rather follow the plow as thrall to another man, one with no land allotted him and not much to live on, than be a king over all the perished to dead. But come now, and tell me anything you have heard of my proud son, whether or not he went along to war to fight as champion, and tell me anything you have heard about stately Peleus, whether he still keeps his position among the Myrmidon hordes, or whether in Hellas and Phythia they have diminished his state because old age constrains his hands and feet, and I am no longer there under the light of the sun to help him, not the man I used to be once, when in the wide Troad I killed the best of their people fighting for the Argives. If only for a little while I could come like that to the house of my father, my force and my invincible hands would terrify such men as use force on him and keep him away from his rightful honors. So he spoke, and I again said to him in answer, I have no report to give you of stately Peleus, but as for your beloved son Neoptolemus, I will tell you, since you ask me to do it, all the true story. For I myself, in the hollow hull of the balanced ship, brought him over from Skyros to join the strong grieved Achaeans. Whenever we, around the city of Troy, Troy took, talked over our counsels, he would always speak first and never blunder. In speaking, only godlike Nestor and I were better than he was. And when we Achaeans fought the tra in the Trojan plain, he never would hang back where there, would be, where, where there were plenty of other men nor stay with the masses, but run far out in front, giving way to no man for fury, and many were those he killed in the terrible fighting. I cannot tell over the number of all, or no, nor name all, the people he killed as he fought for the Argives, but what a great man was one, the son of Tele Telephos, he slew with the brazen spear, the hero Eurip Eurypylos, and many Catean companions were killed about him by reason of womanish presence. Next to great Memnon, this was the finest man I ever saw. Again, we who were best of the Argives entered the horse of the Apeus maid, and all the command was given to me to keep close hidden inside or sally from it. Out from it, the other leaders of the Danans and men of council were wiping their tears away, and the limbs were shaking under each man of them. But never at any time did I see him losing his handsome color or going pale or wiping the tears off his face but rather he implored me to let him sally out of the horse. He kept feeling for his sword hilt, and spear weighted with bronze, full of evil thoughts for the Trojans. But after we had sacked the sheer citadel of Priam, with his fair share and princely surprise of his own, he boarded his ship to unscathed. He had not been hit by thrown and piercing bronze, nor stabbed in close-up combat, as often happens in fighting. The war god rages at all and favors no man. So I spoke, and the soul of the swift-footed scion of Iacos stalked away in long strides across the meadow of Asphodel, happy for what I had said of his son and how he was famous. Now the rest of the souls of the perished dead stood near me grieving, and each one of spoke to me and told of his sorrows. Only the soul of the Telamonian Aias stood off at a distance from me, angry still over that decision I won against him, when beside the ships we disputed our cases for the arms of Achilles. His queenly mother set them as prize, and the sons of the Trojans with Pallas Athena judged. And I wish I had never won in a contest like this. So high a head has gone under the ground for the sake of that armor. Aias, who for beauty and for achievement surpassed all the Danans next to the stately son of Peleus. So I spoke to him now in terms of conciliation. Aias, son of stately Telamon, could you then never even in death forget your anger against me because of that cursed armor? armor? The gods made it to pain the Achaeans. So great a bulwark were you who were lost to them. We Achaeans grieved for your death as, as incessantly as for Achilles, the son of Peleus, at his death. And there is no other to blame but Zeus. 
He, in his terrible hate for the army of the Danon spearmen, visited this destruction upon you. Come nearer, my lord, so you can hear what I say and listen to my story. Suppress your anger and lordly spirit. So I spoke. He gave no answer, but went off after the other souls of the perished dead men into the darkness. There, despite his anger, he might have spoken, or I might have spoken to him. But the heart in my inward breast wanted still to see the souls of the glory of other perished dead men. There I saw Minos, the glorious son of Zeus, seated holding a golden scepter and issuing judgments among the dead, who all around the great Lord argued their cases, some sitting and some standing by the wide-gated house of Hades. After him I was aware of the gigantic or Orion, in the meadow of Asphodel, rounding up and driving together wild animals he himself had killed in the lonely mountains, holding in his hands a brazen club forever unbroken. And I saw Titius, Earth's glorious sun, lying in the plains and sprawled over nine acres. Two vultures sitting one on either side were tearing his liver, plunging inside the call. With his hands he could not beat them away. He had manhandled Leto, the honored consort of Zeus, as she went through spacious Panopeus towards Pytho. And I saw Tantalos also suffering hard pain, standing in lake water that came up to his chin, and thirsty as he was, he tried to drink but could capture nothing. For every time the old man tried to drink, stooping over, the water would drain away and disappear, and the black earth show showed at his feet, and the divinity dried it away. Over his head, trees with lofty branches had fruit like a shower descending, pear trees and pomegranate trees, and apple trees with fruit shining, and figs that were sweet and olives ripened well. But each time the old man would straighten up and reach with his hands for them, the wind would toss them away towards the clouds overhanging. Also I saw Sisyphus. He was suffering strong pains, and with both arms embracing the monstrous stones, struggled, struggling with his hands and feet alike. He would try to push the stone upward to the crest of the hill, but when it was on the point of going over the top, the force of gravity turned it backward, and the pitiless stone rolled back down to the level. He then tried once more to push it up, straining hard, and sweat ran all down his body, and over his head a cloud of dust rose. After him I was aware of powerful Heracles, his image that is, but he himself among the immortal gods enjoys their festivals married to sweet-stepping Hebe, child of great Zeus and Hera of the golden sandals. All around him was a clamor of the dead, as of birds scattering scared in every direction. But he came on like dark night, holding his bow bare with an arrow laid on the bowstring, and forever looking, as one who shot with terrible glances. There was a terrible belt crossed over his chest, and a golden baldric with marvelous works of art, figured upon it, bears and lions with glaring eyes and boars of the forests, the battles and the quarrels, the murders and the manslaughters. May he who artfully designed them and artfully put them upon that baldric never again do any designing. He recognized me at once, as soon as his eyes had seen me, and full of lamentation he spoke to me in winged words, Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, Unhappy man, are you too leaning some wretched destiny such as I, to, I too pursued when I went still in the sunlight? For I was son of Cronian Zeus, but I had an endless spell of misery. I was made bondman to one who was far worse than I, and he loaded my difficult labors upon me. One time he sent me here to fetch the dog back, and thought there could be no other labor to be devised more difficult than that one. But I brought the dog up and led him from the realms of Hades, and Hermes saw me on my way with Pallas Athena. So he spoke and went back into the realm of Hades. But I stayed fast in place where I was to see if some other one of the generation of heroes who died before me would come, and I might have seen men earlier still whom I wanted to see, Perithous and Theseus, God's glorious children. But before the ho that the hordes of the dead gathered about me with inhuman clamor, and green fear took hold of me with the thought that proud Persephone might send up against me some gorgonish head of a terrible monster up out of Hades. So going back on board my ship, I told my companions also to go aboard, and to cast off the stern cables, and quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks, 
and the swell of the current carried her down the ocean river with rowing at first, but after that on a fair wind following. Book 12. Now when our ship had left the stream of the ocean river and come back to the wide crossing of the sea's waves and to the island of Aiaia, where lies the house of the early dawn, her dancing spaces, and where Helios the sun makes his uprising, making this point, we ran our ship to the sand and beached her, and we ourselves stepped out onto the break of the sea beach. And there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn. But when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, then I sent my companions away to the house of Circe to bring back the body of El Penor, who died there. Then we cut logs, and where the extreme of the foreland jutted out, we buried him, sorrowful, shedding warm tears for him. But when the dead man had burned, and the dead man's armor piling the grave mound and pulling the gravestone to stand above it, we planted the well-shaped oar in the very top of the grave mound. So we were busy, each with our various work, nor was Circe unaware that we had come back from Hades. Presently she came attired, and her attendants following carried bread at her will, and many meats, and the shining red wine. Bright among goddesses, she stood in our midst and addressed us, unhappy men who went alive to the house of Hades, so dying twice, when all the rest of mankind die only once. Come then, eat what is there, and drink your wine, staying here all the rest of the day, and then tomorrow, when the dawn shows, you shall sail." And I will show you the way, and make plain all the details, so that neither by land nor on the salt water you may suffer and come to grief by unhappy bad designing. So she spoke, and the proud heart in us was persuaded. So for the whole length of the day until the sun setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, the men lay down to all sleep by the ship's stern cables. But she, taking me by the hand, made me sit down away from my dear companions and talked with me and asked me the details of everything, and I recited all just as it had happened. Then the queenly Circe spoke in words and addressed me. So all that has been duly done. Listen now, I will tell you all what the very God himself will make you remember. You will come, first of all, to the sirens, who are enchanters of all mankind and whoever comes their way. And that man who unsuspecting approaches them and listens to the siren singing has no prospects of coming home and delighting his wife and little children as they stand about him in greeting. But the sirens, by the melody of their singing, enchant him. They sit in their meadow, but the beach before it is piled with the bone heaps of men, now rotted away, and the skin shrivels upon them. You must drive straight on past, but melt down the sweet wax of honey, and with it stop your companions' ears so none can listen. The rest, that is, but if you yourself are wanting to hear them, then have them tie your hand and foot on the fast ship, standing upright against the mast, and with ropes lashed around it so you can have joy in hearing the song of the sirens. But if you supplicate your men and implore them to set you free, they must tie you fast with even more lashings. Then, for the time when your companions have driven you past them, for that time I will no longer tell you in detail which way of the two your course must lie, but you yourself must consider this in your mind. I will tell you the two ways of it. On the one side there are overhanging rocks, and against them crash the heavy swell of the dark-eyed amphitrite. The blessed gods called these rocks the rovers. By this way, not even any flying thing, not even the tremendous doves, which tremulous doves, which carry ambrosia to Zeus the father, can pass through. But every time the sheer rock catches away one even of these, but the father then adds another to keep the number right. No ship of men that came here ever has fled through, but the waves of the sea and storms of ravening fire carry away together the ship's timbers and the men's bodies. That way, the only sea-going ship to get through was Argo, who is in all men's minds on her way home from Aetes. And even she would have been driven on the great rocks that time, but Hera saw her through, out of her great love for Jason. But of the two rocks, one reaches up into the wide heaven with a pointed peak, and a dark cloud stands hours around it, and never at any time draws away from it, nor does the sunlight ever hold that peak, either in the early or the late summer nor could any man who was mortal climb there, or stand mounted on the summit. Not if he had twenty hands and twenty feet, for the rock goes sheerly up, as if it were polished. Halfway up the cliff there is a cave, misty-looking, and turned toward Erebos, and the dark, the very direction from which, O shining Odysseus, you and your men will be steering your hollow ship, and from the hollow ship no vigorous young man with a bow could shoot to that hole in the cliffside. In that cavern Scylla lives, whose howling is terror, her voice, indeed, is only as loud as a newborn puppy could make, but she is herself an evil monster. 
No one, not even a god encountering her, could be glad at that sight. She has twelve feet, and all of them wave in the air. She has six necks upon her, grown to great length, and upon each neck there is a horrible head with teeth in it, set in three rows, close together and stiff, full of black death. Her body from the waist down is holed up inside the hollow cavern, but she holds her heads, poked out and away from the terrible hollow. And there she fishes, peering all over the cliffside, looking for dolphins or dogfish to catch, or anything bigger. Some sea monster of whom Amphitrite keeps so many. Never can sailors boast aloud that their ship has passed her without any loss of men. For with each of her heads she snatches one man away and carries him off from the dark proud vessel. The other cliff is lower. You will see it, Odysseus. For they lie close together, and you could even cast with an arrow across. There is a great fig tree grows there, dense with foliage, and under this shining Sharbidus sucks down the black water. For three times a day she flows it up, and three times she sucks it down terribly. May you not be there when she sucks down water, for not even the earth shaker could rescue you out of that evil. But sailing your ship swiftly, drive her past and avoid her, and make for Scylla's rock instead, since it is far better to mourn six friends lost out of your ship than the whole company. So she spoke, but I in turn said to her in answer, Come then, goddess, answer me truthfully this. Is there some way for me to escape away from deadly Sherbidus and yet fight the other off, one off when she attacks my companions? So I spoke, and she, shining among goddesses, answered, Hardy man, your mind is full forever of fighting and battle worth. Will you not give way even to the immortals? She is no Im mortal thing but a mischief immortal, dangerous, difficult, and bloodthirsty, and there is no fighting against her nor any force of defense. It is best to run away from her, for if you arm for battle beside her rock and waste time there, I fear she will make another outrush and catch you with all her heads and snatch away once more the same number of men. Drive by as hard as you can, but invoke Crateus. She is the mother of Scylla and bore this mischief for mortals, and she will stay her from making another sally against you. Then you will reach the island of Thrinachia, where are pastured the cattle and fat sheep of the sun god Helios, seven herds of auction and as many beautiful sheep flocks, and fifty to each herd. There is no giving birth among them, nor do they ever die away. And their shepherdess are gods, nymphs with sweet hair, Limpetia and Phaethusa, whom shining Nair bore to Hyperion, the sun god. These, when their queenly mother had given them birth and reared them, she settled into the island Thrinachia, far away, to live there and guard their father's sheep and his horn-curved cattle. Then, if you keep your mind on homecoming and leave these unharmed, you might all make your way to Ithaca after much suffering. But if you do harm them, then I testify to the destruction of your ship and your companions. But if you yourself get clear, you will come home in bad case with the loss of all your companions. So she spoke, and dawn of the golden throne came on us. She, shining among the goddesses, went away up the island. Then, going back on board my ship, I told my companions also to go aboard and to cast off the stern cables, and quickly they went on board the ship and sat to the oarlocks. And sitting well in the order, dashed the oars in the gray sea. But fair-haired Circe, the dread goddess who talks with mortals, sent us an excellent companion, a following wind, filling the sails to carry from astern the ship with the dark prow. We ourselves, over all the ship, making fast the running gear, sat there and let the wind and the steersman hold her steady. Just then, sorrowful as I was, I spoke and told my companions, Friends, since it is not right for one or two of us only to know the divinations that Circe, right among goddesses, gave me, so I will tell you. And knowing all, we may either die or turn aside from death and escape destruction. First of all, she tells us to keep away from magical sirens and their singing and their flowery meadow. But only I, she said, was to listen to them. But you must tie me hard in hurtful bonds to hold me fast in position, upright against the mast, with the rope's ends fastened around it. But if I supplicate you and implore you to set me free, then you must tie me fast with even more lashings. So, as I was telling all the details to my companions, meanwhile the well-made ship was coming rapidly closer to the siren's isle, for the harmless wind was driving her onward. But immediately then the breeze dropped, and a windless calm fell there, and some divinity stilled the tossing waters. My companions stood up and took the sails down and stowed them away in the hollow hull and took their places for rowing, and with their planed oar-blades white into water. Then I, taking a great wheel of wax with the sharp bronze, cut a little piece off and rubbed it together in my heavy hands, 
and soon the wax grew softer under the powerful stress of the sun and the heat and the light of Harian's lordling. One after another I stopped the ears of all my companions, and they then bound me hand and foot in the fast ship, standing upright against the mast with the rope's ends lashed around it. And sitting then to row, they dashed their oars in the gray sea. But when we were as far from the land as a voice shouting carries, lightly plying the swift ship as it drew nearer, was seen by the sirens, and they directed their sweet song towards us. Come this way, honored Odysseus, great glory of the Caians, and stay your ships, that you can listen here to our singing, for no one else has ever sailed past this place in his black ship until he has listened to the honey-sweet voice that issues from our lips. Then goes on, well pleased, knowing more than ever he did, for we know everything that the Argives and the Trojans did, and suffered in wide Troy, through the gods' despite. Over all the generous earth we know everything that happens. So they sang in sweet utterance, and the heart within me desired to listen, and I signaled my companions to set me free, nodding with my brows. But they leaned on and rode hard, and Perimides and Eurylochus, rising up straightway, fastened me with even more lashings and squeezed me tighter. But when they had rode on past the sirens, and we could no longer hear their voices, and lost the sound of their singing, presently my eager companions took away their from their ears the beeswax with which I had stopped them. Then they set me free from my lashings. But after we had left the island behind, the next thing we saw was smoke and a heavy surf, and we heard it thundering. The men were terrified, and they let the oars fall out of their hands, and these banged all about in the wash. The ship stopped still, with the men no longer rowing to keep way on her. Then I, going up and down the ship, urged my companions, standing beside each man and speaking to him in evil and kind words, Dear friends, surely we are not unlearned in evils. This is no greater evil now than it was when Cyclops had us scooped in his hollow cage by force and violence. But even there, by my courage and counsel and my intelligence, we escaped away. I think that all this will be remembered some day, too. Then do as I say. Let us all be won over. Sit well, all of you, to your oarlocks, and dash your oars deep into the breaking surf of the water. So in that way Zeus might grant that we get clear of this danger and flee away from it. For you, steersmen, I have this order, so store it deeply in your mind, as you control the steering oar of this hollow ship. You must keep her clear from where the smoke and the breakers are, and make hard for the sea rock, lest, without your knowing, she might drift that way, and you bring all of us into disaster. So I spoke, and they quickly obeyed my words. I had not yet spoken of Scylla a plague that could not be dealt with, for fear my companions might be terrified and give over their rowing and take cover inside the ship. For my part, I let go from my mind the difficult instruction that Circe had given me, for she told me not to be armed for combat. But I put on my glorious armor, and taking up two long spears in my hand, I stood bestriding the vessel's foredeck at the prow, for I expected skill of the rocks to appear first from that direction, she who brought pain to my companions. I could not make her out anywhere, and my eyes grew weary from looking everywhere on the misty face of the sea rock. So we sailed up the narrow strait, lamenting. On the one side was Scylla, and on the other side was shining Charbidus, who made her terrible ebb and flow of the sea water. When she vomited it up like a cauldron over a strong fire, the whole sea would boil up in turbulence, and the foam flying spattered the pinnacles of the rocks in either direction. But when in turn, again, she sucked yeah. down the sea's salt water, the turbulence showed all the inner sea, and the rock around it groaned terribly, and the ground showed at the sea's bottom, black with sand, and green fear seized upon my companions. We, in fear of destruction, kept our eyes on Charbidus. But meanwhile, Scylla, out of the hollow vessel, snatched six of my companions, the best of them for strength and hands work. And when I turned to look at the ship with my other companions, I saw their feet and hands from below, already lifted high above me. And they cried out to me and called me by name, the last time they ever did it, in heart's sorrow, high above me, in heart sorrow. And as a fisherman with very long rod on a jutting rock will cast his treacherous bait for the little fishes and sink the horn of a field raging ox into the water, then hauls them up and throws them on the dry land, gasping and struggling. No. So they gasped and struggled as they were hoisted up the cliff. Right in her doorway, she ate them up. They were screaming and reaching out their hands to me in this horrid encounter. That was the most pitiful scene that these eyes have looked on in my suffering as I explored the routes over the waters. 
Now, when we had fled away from the rocks and dreaded Charybdis and Scylla, next we made our way to the excellent island of the god, where ranged the handsome, wide-browed oxen and many fat flocks of sheep belonging to the sun god Hyperion. While I was on the black ship, still out on the open water, I heard the lowing of the cattle as they were driven home, and the bleeding of sheep, and my mind was struck by the saying of the blind prophet, Tiresias the Theban, and also Aeon Cersei. Both had told me many times over to avoid the island of Helios, who brings joy to mortals. Then, sorrowful as I was, I spoke and told my companions, Listen to what I say, my companions, though you are suffering evils, while I tell you the prophecies of Tiresias and Aeon Circe. Both have told me many times over to avoid the island of Helios, who brings joy to mortals. For there they spoke of the most dreadful disaster that awaited for us. So drive the black ship onward and pass the island. So I spoke, and the inward heart in them was broken. At once Eurylochus answered me with a bitter saying, You are a hard man, Odysseus. Your force is greater, your limbs never wear out. You must be made all of iron. When you, you will not let your companions, worn with hard work and wanting sleep, set foot on this land, where if we did on the sea-girt island, we could once more make a, ready a greedy dinner. But you force us to blunder along, just as we are through the running night, driven from the island over the misty face of the water. In the nights, the hard storm winds arise, and they bring damage to ships. How could any of us escape sheer destruction if suddenly there rises the blast of a storm from the bitter blowing of the south wind or the west wind, who beyond others hammer a ship apart in despite of the gods our masters? But now let us give way to the black knight's persuasion. Let us make ready our evening meal, remaining close by our fast ship, and at dawn we will go aboard and put forth down to the wide sea. So spoke Eurylochus, and my other companions assented. I saw then what evil the divinity had in mind for us, and so I spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, Eurylochus, I am only one man, you force me to it, but come then, all of you, swear a strong oath to me, that if we come upon some herd of cattle or on some great flock of sheep, no one of you in evil and reckless action will slaughter any ox or sheep. No, rather than this, eat at your pleasure of the food immortal Circe provided. So I spoke, and they all swore me the oath that I asked them. But after they had sworn me the oath and made an end of it, we beached the well-made ship inside of the house, hollow harbor, close to the sweet water, and my companions disembarked also from the ship and expertly made the evening meal ready. But when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, they remembered and they cried for their beloved companions, whom Scylla had caught out of the hollow ship and eaten. And on their crying, a quiet sleep descended. But after the third part of the night had come, and the star changes, Zeus, the cloud gatherer, let loose on us a gale that blustered in a supernatural storm, and huddled under the cloud scuds, land alike, and the great water. Night sprang from heaven, but when the young dawn showed again with her rosy fingers, we birthed our ship, dragging her into a hollow sea cave, where the nymphs had their beautiful dancing places and sessions. Then I held an assembly and spoke my opinion before them. friends, since there is food and drink stored in the fast ship, let us then keep our hands off the cattle, for fear that something may befall us. These are the cattle and fat sheep of a dreaded god, Helios, who sees all things and listens to all things. So I spoke, and the proud heart in them was persuaded, but the south wind blew for a whole month long, nor did any other wind befall after that, but only the south and east wind, as long as they still had food to eat and red wine, the men kept their hands off the cattle, striving as they were for sustenance. Then, when all the provisions that had been in the ship had given out, they turned to hunting, forced to it, and went ranging after fish and birds, anything that they could lay hands on, and with curved hooks, for their hunger was exhausting their stomachs. Then I went away along the island in order to pray to the gods, if any of them might show me some course to sail on. But when crossing the isle I had left my companions behind, I washed my hands, where there was a place sheltered from the wind, and prayed to all the gods whose hold is Olympus. But what they did was to shed a sweet sleep on my eyelids, and Eurylochus put an evil counsel before his companions. Listen to what I say, my companions. Though you are suffering evils, all deaths are detestable for wretched mortals, but hungry is the sorriest way to die and encounter fate. Come then, let us cut out the best of Helios' cattle and sacrifice them to the immortals who hold wide heavens. And if we ever come back to Ithaca, land of our fathers, presently we will build a rich temple to the sun god Helios, Hyperion 
and store it with many dedications, many and good. But if in anger over his high-horned cattle he wishes to wreck our ship and the rest of the gods stand by him, I had far rather gulp the waves and lose my life in them once and for all than be pinched to death on this desolate island. So spoke Eurylochus, and the other companions assented at once, cutting out from near at hand the best of Helios' cattle, for the handsome, broad-faced, horn-curved oxen were pasturing there, not far from the dark-proud ship. Driving these, they stationed themselves around them and made their prayers to the gods, pulling tender leaves from a deep-leaved oak tree, for they had no white barley left on the strong beached vessel. When they had made their prayer and slaughtered the oxen and skinned them, they cut away the meat from the thighs and wrapped them in fat, making a double fold, and laid shreds of flesh upon them. And since they had no wine to pour on the burning offerings, they made a libation of water and roasted all of the entrails. But when they had burned the thigh pieces and tasted the vitals, they cut all the remainder into pieces and spitted them. At that time the quiet sleep was lost from my eyelids, and I went back down to my fast ship and the sand of the seashore. But on my way, as I was close to the oar-swept vessel, this pleasant savor of cooking meat came drifting around me, and I cried out my grief aloud to the gods immortal. Father Zeus, and you other everlasting and blessed gods, with a pitiless sleep you lulled me to my confusion, and my companions, staying here, dared a deed that was monstrous. Lampetia of the light robes ran swift with the message to Hyperion, the sun god, that we had killed his cattle, and angered at the heart, he spoke forth among the immortals. Father Zeus, and you other everlasting and blessed gods, punish the companions of Odysseus, son of Laertes, for they outrageously killed my cattle, in whom I always delighted, and on my way up into the starry heaven, or when I turn back again from the heaven towards earth. Unless these are made to give me just recompense for my cattle, I will go down to Hades and give my light to the dead men. And in turn Zeus, who gathers the clouds, answered him, Helios, shine on as you do among the immortals and mortal men all over the grain-giving earth. For my part, I will strike these men's fast ship midway to the open wine-blue sea with a shining bolt and dash it to pieces. All this I heard afterwards from fair-haired Calypso, and she told me she herself had heard it from the guide Hermes. But when I came back again to the ship and the seashore, they all stood about and blamed each other, but we were not able to find any remedy, for the oxen were already dead. The next thing was that the gods began to show forth portents before us. The skins crawled, and the meat that was stuck on the spits bellowed, both roast and raw, and the noise was like lowing of cattle. Six days thereafter, my own eager companions feasted on the cattle of Helios, the sun god, cutting the best ones out. But when Zeus, the son of Cronos, established the seventh day, then at last the wind ceased from its stormy blowing, and presently we went aboard and put forth on the wide sea, and set the mast upright, and hoisted the white sails on it. But after we had left the island, and there was no more land in sight, but only the sky and sea, then Crony and Zeus drew on a blue-black cloud and settled it over the hollow ship. And the open sea was darkened beneath it, and she ran on, but not for a very long time, as suddenly a screaming west wind came upon us, stormily blowing, and the blast of the storm wind snapped both the four stays that were holding the mast, and the mast went over backwards, and all the running gear collapsed in the wash, and at the stern of the ship, the mast pole crashed down on the steersman's head and pounded to pieces all the bones of his head, so that he, like a diver, dropped from the high deck, and the proud life left his bones there. Zeus, with thunder and lightning together, crashed on our vessel, and struck by the thunderbolt of Zeus, she spun in a circle, and all was full of brimstone. My men were thrown in the water, bobbing like sea crows. They were washed away on their running waves all around the black ship, and the god took away their homecoming. But I went on my way through the vessel to where the high seas had worked the keel free of, out of the hull, and the bare keel full, floated on the swell, which had broken the mast off at the keel. Yet still there was a backstay made out of ox hide fastened to it. With this I lashed together both keel and mast, then rode the two of them while the deadly storm winds carried me. After this the west wind ceased from its stormy blowing, and the south wind came swiftly on, bringing to my spirit grief that I must measure the whole way back to Shrivdis. All that night I was carried along, and with sun rising, I came to the sea rock of Scylla, the dreaded Charybdis. At this time, Charybdis sucked down the sea's salt water, but I reached high in the air above me to where the tall fig tree grew, and caught hold of it and clung like a bat. There was no place where I could firmly brace my feet or climb up it, for the roots of it were far above me, and the branches hung out far, big and long branches that overshadowed Charybdis. Inexorably, I hung on, waiting for her to vomit the keel and mast back up again. 
I longed for them, and they came late, at the time when the man leaves the law court for dinner, after judging the many disputes brought by brought him by litigious young men. That was the time it took the timbers to appear from Shribdis. Then I let go my hold with hands and feet, and dropped off, and came crashing down between and missing the two long timbers. But I mounted these, and with both hands I paddled my way out. But the father of gods and men did not let Scylla see me again, or would, could not have escaped from sheer destruction. From there I was carried along nine days, and on the tenth night the gods brought me to the island of Ogygia, the home of Calypso, who with the lovely hair and a dreaded goddess who talks with mortals. She befriended me and took care of me. Why tell the rest of the story again, since yesterday in your house I told it to you? and your majestic wife. It is hateful to me to tell a story over again when it has been well told.